Dividing Zero, Gemini Series Book 1, by Ty Patterson. Chapter 1. Daddy Hits Mommy. Megan froze when she heard the words. Beth, who was hurrying out of the kitchen with a plate full of cookies, stumbled. The words were spoken by a green-eyed girl, whose blonde hair was neatly styled over her head. She wore a pink dress, had matching shoes, and usually her eyes were smiling. They were sad now. Madison Maddie Cottrell, eight years old, was perched on a chair in front of Megan. The chair went up or down at the press or pull of a lever. She played with it, refused to meet Megan's eyes, darted an occasional glance to the sides. By her side were Liz McCallum, 14 years old, and Lizzie's sister Zoe, Peaches McCallum, 10 years old. Maddie, Lizzie and Peaches were tight. They were besties. They were BFFs. They grew up on the same street near Central Park, New York. They went to the same school. Maddie wasn't from the city, originally. She had come to the state when she was small. Her dad had a job in some company. Her mom worked somewhere else. Maddie didn't know all that. She didn't care. She cared that mommy cried every week. That the sound of daddy's blows terrified her. Even worse was that daddy had shouted at her a few times. She hadn't told anyone about the beatings. She carried it in her tiny heart. When she played with Lizzie and Peaches, she forgot everything. Grandma, with whom Lizzie and Peaches lived, they didn't have a daddy and mommy, made the world's best cookies. Maddie was in heaven when she bit into them. One day it became too much for Maddie. Her mouth was full of cookie. Her besties were with her. And yet somehow the tears started coming. Lizzie made a fuss. Peaches made a fuss. Grandma hugged her tight. Grandma smelled so nice that Maddie burst into more tears. It came out finally. She couldn't hold it in. Mommy had told her not to tell anyone. Daddy told her too. But these were her best friends. They were like family. Better than family. She told them of that one time, recently, when Mommy's shoulder broke because of Daddy. Mommy had to go to work in a sling. She had to apply makeup to cover the bruises around her eyes. It started only a year back, Maddie said through great gulping sobs. She would lie terrified in her room, hearing Mommy cry. Hearing those horrible smacks. Grandma became serious when she heard. Lizzie went white. Peaches started crying too. Silent tears. Maddie couldn't help it. She cried more. Something happened in the room that Maddie didn't understand. Grandma looked at Lizzie. Lizzie looked at Peaches. Grandma wiped Maddie's tears and told her to come the next day. They would go to the park. The park was great. Maddie could play for hours in it. She agreed. The next day they set out. Maddie and Peaches skipping ahead. Lizzie talking about something serious with Grandma. They played for a couple of hours. Then Grandma made Maddie sit on a bench and told her they would go and meet someone. Someone who was very dear to them. Someone who had helped them. Maddie would have to tell them everything. Maddie shook her head. She wouldn't tell. She started crying again. Daddy would go to jail. Mommy would cry. She didn't want that. She wished she had never told them anything. Grandma hugged her again. That nice smell enveloped her again. Hush, honey. Nothing bad will happen. We trust them with our lives. They will not tell anyone. Just talk to them. Grandma produced a cookie. Cookies were magic workers. They could unlock tongues and change minds. Maddie bit into the cookie and agreed. They set out again. Peaches told Maddie about the people they were meeting. They had an office close by. It was neat. It had a basketball hoop. A baseball bat. Ball gloves. It was better than their school playroom. Peaches wanted an office like that when she grew older. Who are they? Maddie tugged at Peaches' arm to slow her down. 
Beth and Megan. Twins. They are our friends. They can do anything. They can find anything. They found mom's killer, Lizzie added, when she overheard the conversation. Maddie's step slowed. She didn't want anything to be found. Nothing bad will happen, honey. They are good people. Just tell them everything like you told us, Grandma urged. Lizzie nodded. Peaches pressed her hand. Maddie agreed reluctantly. They carried on. Peaches told her about Beth and Megan. How wonderful they were. There was a man who helped them sometimes. He doesn't do much, Peaches said airily. She didn't know why the twins kept him around. They reached the office. It was a tall building. So much glass. The guards inside sprang to attention when Peaches entered, along with Maddie and the rest. One of them rushed to an elevator and pressed a button to summon it. Maddie looked around wide-eyed when she entered it. It had gleaming brass and polished wood paneling and smelled so nice. Its doors shut silently and it whooshed up and opened into an office. Maddie stopped. It was truly like what Peaches had described. Color. So much of it. So warm. Orange. Gold. Blue. Couches everywhere. Peaches squealed and ran and hugged a woman. She was brown-haired. Green-eyed. She whirled Peaches around and set her down. Another woman came. She too was brown-haired and green-eyed. Maddie was shy, however Peaches pulled her by the arm and introduced her. My best friend, she introduced Maddie. The first woman bent and shook her hand gravely. Beth Peterson, ma'am. Maddie giggled. No one called her ma'am. The other woman shook her hand. I'm Megan. Want some cookies? Beth asked. Lizzie and Maddie nodded their heads simultaneously. No one refused cookies. Megan looked behind Maddie. Maddie turned round. A brown-haired man was bringing more chairs. He's the helper, Peaches whispered. Maddie looked at him, then at Lizzie. Lizzie's face had turned red. Grandma seemed to be smiling. Peaches didn't care. She bit into the cookies Beth brought. Maddie followed suit. They were delicious. As good as the ones Grandma made. Maddie didn't know it. Grandma sent a batch over to the twins whenever she baked. The cookies disappeared as if by magic, and when Beth returned after refilling the plate, Peaches nudged Maddie. Maddie didn't say anything. Peaches nudged her harder. They are friends. You can tell them anything. Maddie nodded. Tears were in her eyes. Daddy hits mommy. Chapter 2 Megan froze when she heard those words. She looked at Regina Hunnaker, Grandma, who nodded imperceptibly. Lizzie and Peaches were seated beside Maddie, forming a protective ring around her. Beth recovered after stumbling and took her time placing the warm batch of cookies in front of the girls. Tiny hands reached out and grabbed them. Mouths were stuffed, and for a while the only sounds were those of munching on the world's best cookies. The outside world intruded faintly. Traffic roared outside their office on Columbus Avenue, its rage dimmed by thick windows. Those windows were armored and could stop heavy-caliber bullets, but they couldn't fully keep out the noise of the city. Tell Beth and Megan about it, honey, Grandma told Maddie softly. Maddie looked at her, scared, and shook her head. Grandma cupped her cheeks with a warm hand. They are our friends. We trust them. They won't tell Daddy or Mommy. Nothing will happen to you or to them. Peaches nodded vigorously, her eyes wide and trusting. I would live with them, like forever if Grandma allowed. That sealed it for Maddie. She often had sleepovers with Lizzie and Peaches and would live with them in a heartbeat. Their home was wonderful. Grandma was wonderful. If Peaches wanted to live with Beth and Megan, then they too must be wonderful. She swallowed her cookie, drank from a glass of hot chocolate that had magically appeared, and told them. Haltingly initially, and then with more confidence, 
as she saw nothing but understanding and acceptance in the eyes of the twins. It had started about a year back. She shook her head when Megan asked if she knew when exactly. All she remembered was waking one night in her comfy bed and hearing the faint sound of murmuring. Daddy and Mommy never murmured. They spoke normally. They laughed. Sometimes they fought but made up soon after. She got out of her bed and crept out of the room and went to their room. It was empty. She thought about calling out, but something stopped her. It was then that she heard it. A sharp sound. Like when flesh hit flesh. When a hand hit a face or other parts of the body. Maddie knew that sound. She heard it every day in school when the girls played and someone ran into someone else or play became rough. The sound was followed by a low voice and then another voice. The second voice seemed to be crying. Maddie's heart was racing. She went down the stairs and in her haste slipped. She froze at the loud sound she made. A voice called out immediately. Honey, is that you? Maddie's breath caught in her throat. She couldn't answer for a moment. Mommy came at the bottom of the stairs and looked up at her. Mommy was beaming, her face bathed in love. She ran up and hugged Maddie tight. Naughty girl, you should be sleeping. You have school tomorrow. Maddie clasped her hands tight around Mommy's neck and breathed in her scent. I heard something, her voice was muffled. Daddy and I were talking, honey. We didn't want to wake you, and so we went downstairs. Mommy rubbed her back soothingly and laid her on bed, and sat with her till her eyes got droopy and heavy. All was right in her world. That sound and crying she had heard, maybe it was something else. Maddie stopped and wiped a tear away furiously. She didn't want to cry in front of the twins, even though they were kind. Grandma rose and lifted Maddie and sat in her place and made Maddie sit on her lap. Maddie was embarrassed at first. She was eight years old. She didn't sit in anyone's lap any longer. But Grandma felt so good and warm and comforting. Her hand on her head was calming and protective. Did you hear that again, Maddie? Beth asked. Maddie nodded. She heard the sound maybe a month later. This time she didn't crawl down. She burrowed deeper in her soft bed, drew the blanket around her and tried to drown the sound out. The sounds and what felt like mommy's crying became regular. Once she heard daddy shout. She ran out of her room and called out to him. He came up immediately and hugged her and told her everything was all right and put her to bed. Once she was woken up from her sleep by the sounds coming repeatedly. Short. Sharp. Like smacking. There was silence and then even through the walls of her room and through the floor she could hear weeping. Mommy was crying. Maddie was terrified. She hurled herself out of the bed and ran down the stairs, heedless of what Daddy or Mommy would say. She burst into the kitchen and stopped short as Mommy turned around and smiled at her. Couldn't sleep again, honey. Maddie searched her face. Were Mommy's eyes red? Were her cheeks wet? She couldn't be sure. She turned to Daddy, who looked up at her from the newspaper he was reading. He held out his hands to her. For some reason, Maddie didn't go into his hug. She let Mommy carry her and take her to bed. This time sleep came harder. This time she was sure Daddy was smacking Mommy. Maddie stopped talking and eyed the few cookies remaining on the plate. Peaches grabbed one. Lizzie took another, and Grandma handed the remaining one to Maddie. Peaches wriggled on her seat and looked at the hoop. Maddie followed her glance. The hoop was so tempting. Run along and play, Grandma chuckled. Peaches squealed and ran. Maddie followed her. Lizzie walked sedately. She was older. She was almost an adult. Beth watched them play while Megan cleared the table, refilled the plate, and brought a jar of water and plastic cups. Her mind was whirling and one glance at her twin showed she was shocked too. Grandma alone looked composed but then she always did. Nothing seemed to ruffle her. Grandma had seen her daughter, Mary McCallum, murdered. 
she had seen her son-in-law die slowly in grief. She had taken charge of her granddaughters and raised them single-handedly. Grandma was a force of nature who blew anything and anyone away who stood in the way of her baby's happiness. She took the mug of Jamaican Blue Mountain that Megan brewed and sipped it. It's true. All of it and there's more. Maddie told us of more incidents. He even broke her shoulder once. Beth blanched and searched for words. How long have they been married, ma'am? At least fourteen years, I would reckon. I know they were married when Lizzie was born. Amy, their mom, showed me their family photographs once. You know them well, ma'am? I have met Amy and Josh a few times. Since the kids are very close besties, Grandma's lips twitched, I speak often with Amy. We invited them for dinner on a couple of occasions and meet them at school events. Megan was playing with a sheet of paper, unconsciously folding and shaping it into a plane. She let it fly toward the girls and smiled when they shouted in delight. She didn't see the beatings, did she? She heard them. She saw her mom afterwards. Children know these things. They can sense fear, anger, and violence in their folks. I have no reason to doubt her. She swung around at a shout and relaxed when Lizzie waved a hand. Just playing. Grandma turned back to the twins. Where's Carter? Beth smiled for the first time since Grandma had walked into their office, kids in tow. He left, ma'am. He figured Maddie would open up in his absence. Grandma nodded, her gray eyes resting on the twins. She knew their office, a security consulting firm, was cover for a deep black national agency. It undertook missions which never came to light. Zeb Carter was its lead agent, the twins and a bunch of other folks worked with him. The twins were in their late twenties, Megan, the older of the two by a few seconds. Zeb was elder to them by several years. Grandma knew the age difference didn't matter a whit. The twins, Zeb, and some of the other agents that Grandma had met were like family. Grandma was deeply indebted to Carter, she never called him Zeb and had dropped the Mr. reluctantly, and the twins for finding her daughter's killer and bringing closure. Knowing that the debt could never be repaid, and that the twins or Zeb never saw it as such, Grandma made the twins her family. She treated them as her daughters, and the twins reciprocated. Carter had the air of a loner but Grandma knew what lay beneath him, what he had been through, and he became part of her brood whether he wanted it or not. You will find out what exactly is going on. It was a statement, an order. Beth's eyes widened. Ma'am, this isn't what we do. This is something the police should investigate. I don't even know if there's enough for them to look into. Grandma brushed aside the idea of involving the NYPD with an imperious hand. She had enough dealings with them when they were investigating her daughter's killer. She didn't rate them. Do it. Her voice hardened and the steel in her showed. If he's a wife beater and I believe Maddie, I want him stopped. She rose, silencing any more objections, and with a flick of her hands drew her wards together. She shepherded the girls to the elevators and held the door open for Beth and Megan to join them. The silence in the elevator was broken by Maddie, who looked shyly at Megan and asked, Can we come again? Grandma's stern visage softened, became warm and she answered before Megan could. Of course, honey. Whenever you want. They are our friends. Beth hailed a cab when they were outside, and when it arrived, helped Grandma in. Megan went to the other door and got Lizzie and Peaches seated. Beth was helping Maddie inside when she felt the blur approaching behind her right shoulder. Maddie got a foot inside. Beth turned her head slightly when the blur shouted. Maddie got another foot in and was ducking her head under the roof when Beth's eyes focused on the blur. It resolved into a man wearing a hoodie. Running towards her. Red-faced. He shouted something unintelligible. Beth opened her mouth to say something to stop him, but before she could do so, he rammed into her. Her breath left her in a gasp as she lost her grip on Maddie and fell. Her head bounced on the sidewalk to the accompaniment of a thin scream from somewhere. An angry roar sounded. 
A hard boot landed next to her, lifted and swung. Beth had a last thought as darkness descended on her. Maddie has been kidnapped. Chapter 3 Beth was lying on her bed in her apartment when she came to, and the first thing she saw was Megan's strained face hovering over her. Megan relaxed when their eyes met and made a big deal of looking heavenward. You have been out for nearly an hour. She helped Beth sit upright and handed her a glass of water. How did I get here? Zeb. He brought you here. Megan jerked her head at the other occupant in the room. Beth emptied the glass and looked beyond Megan's shoulder. Zeb was leaning against a wall, still, emotionless. His brown hair was neatly cut short, his white shirt was tucked into khaki chinos, and a leather belt around his lean waist completed his attire. Beth knew that still posture was deceptive. He could flow from repose to action in the blink of an eye. It was just a fall, Zeb. No need to go kill anyone. Zeb didn't move. His brown eyes didn't change expression. How are you feeling? Like I have been hit by a truck. My head hurts, my shoulder is aching, but the rest of me seems to be fine. She made a face when her sister held two fingers in front of her. I said I am fine but for a couple of aches. She took the pills Megan offered, gulped them, downed another glass of water and rose from the bed. She waved away Megan's hands of support. Jesus, I was unconscious for a few moments. Nothing is wrong with me. Realization of the events flooded her suddenly, and her eyes widened and her voice quickened. Where is Grandma? The kids? What about Maddie? Who was that dude? Megan countered in answer. Did you get a look at that man? Would you recognize him? Beth shook her head and then grimaced as the motion worsened her headache. No. He was moving too fast, and I wasn't paying attention since Maddie was saying something to me. Besides, he had a hoodie. It shadowed his face. Megan avoided her eyes. Zeb returned when you were knocked out. Grandma insisted he and I bring you up and tend to you. Beth's face turned white as she read the worst in Megan's evasion. Sis, where's Maddie? The man grabbed her. She's missing. What about Grandma and Lizzie? Megan shook her head in frustration. Couldn't speak to Grandma earlier, her phone was turned off. She sent a message a few minutes back. She's asked us to meet her at her home. Beth was moving the moment Megan finished. She grabbed her jacket, her handbag, and by the time she was ready, Megan and Zeb were with her. Any thoughts and concerns they had about her head could wait. Finding Maddie couldn't. They were in Grandma's townhouse on East 112th Street two hours later, after a couple of cops stopped them in the lobby and took the twin statements. Peaches opened the door and burst out, Maddie's dad took her and ran. Her face was tear-streaked and her body was trembling when she hugged Beth. Beth quieted her as best as she could and looked imploringly at Lizzie. The elder girl pale-faced herself, read her glance and led Peaches out, leaving Grandma with the twins and Zeb. Grandma sat on a couch with a sigh and gestured at her guests to seat themselves. She held her head in her hands for a moment and then straightened and her stern face came on. She recounted the events that had occurred when Megan and Zeb had carried Beth inside their office. A few passers-by had yelled out at the man and one had given chase, but the man, with Maddie in one arm, had disappeared in the vastness of the city. The police had turned up and had started making inquiries. A cruiser took Grandma and the kids to the Cottrell home, and on hearing the news, Amy Cottrell had sagged. She called her husband. He didn't reply. She called his office. He wasn't there. No one knew where he was. The police had briefed the media and had handed out Maddie's pictures. They were interviewing possible witnesses at the grab site. A silence fell when Grandma finished her narration. Peaches peeked through the door and despite Grandma's iron face, asked, Will Maddie be okay, Grandma? The iron visage cracked. Grandma's arms opened, and Peaches dove into their warm sanctuary. Of course she will be, honey. Beth and Megan will find her. You will find her. 
Zeb queried, looking at Beth, then at Megan. He had left Grandma's home and had returned with their SUV which he was now driving. Megan was in her usual seat, in the front by his side. Beth was in the rear and had just finished briefing him on the discussion with Grandma. We were going to, in any case. Grandma's request has now given us official standing. Zeb nodded and looked out at the city ahead of him, as if he could find Maddie just by looking. He didn't know his fingers had tightened on the wheel till Megan touched his shoulder softly. We will find her. He nodded again. It could be some other man, not the dad. He's missing too, but that could be coincidence. Yeah, we know. We have done this before a few times, in case you are forgetting. Beth retorted. Attacked and kicked by a stranger, knocked out for an hour, a missing child, none of those were reasons to hold back from ribbing Zeb. Zeb drove silently, his eyes moving between mirrors and the stream of traffic ahead. Every so often they dwelled on young children on the sidewalk, on girls of Maddie's size. They were in between agency missions and during downtime, they were free to take on any other projects. Claire never interfered in their work, she trusted Zeb and his team implicitly. Heck, she would ask us to find Maddie even if we were on an agency mission. Claire had formed the agency to accommodate the president's need to have a small, self-contained deep black unit that had none of the bureaucracy of other such agencies. The agency took on missions that were a threat to national security, terrorists, recovering stolen weapons of mass destruction, international criminal gangs, among many others. On joining the agency, Zeb had recruited Broker, the oldest of them all. Broker had been a ranger and an intelligence analyst at the NSA. On quitting the army, he had set up his intelligence business that serviced the commercial sector. He was the finest analyst Zeb had come across, though the twins were catching on fast. Broker and the twins ran the agency's intel network, at the heart of which was Werner, a supercomputer that sat in their office on Columbus Avenue. The twins also managed the agency's logistics. Bawana, Roger, Chloe and Bear, who were a couple, comprised the rest of the agency's personnel. The first two and Bear were ex-special forces like Zeb, while Chloe was from the 82nd Airborne. Zeb reported to Claire, the director of the agency, who in turn reported only to the president. She lived in Washington, D.C., and had a nebulous title that no one in the rarefied political circles questioned. The eight of them were a compact team that worked like a well-oiled machine and had never failed on a mission. He circled Central Park a few times, entered East 112th Street and drove down toward Thomas Jefferson Park. He found a vacant parking spot and eased into it, following the twins' gaze. There were no more cruisers outside the Cottrell townhouse. It looked empty and forlorn. Megan sprang out and Beth followed her. Wait for us, Megan tossed behind her shoulder. Yes, ma'am. Zeb stretched his legs out, pushed back and closed his eyes. There weren't many special forces operatives who worked as chauffeurs in their downtime. He was one of them. I don't know what else I can tell you, Amy Cottrell said. The cops just left and I told them everything that I know. Which isn't much. She tried to smile and failed. They were in the living room. Beth and Megan on one soft couch, the distraught mother on another across from them. The room was decorated in warm colors, and family pictures adorned the wall and the mantelpiece. In one, a man was holding Maddie high above his head while Amy was snuggling into him. The man had average looks. Dark hair. Dark eyes. Clean shaven. Nothing that would stand out in a crowd. Nothing that would stay in memory. Amy Cottrell noticed Megan's gaze. That was last year, when we were on vacation in Florida. Her hands twisted nervously, and her eyes darted to the twins. I can't believe Josh would kidnap her. I am sure there's some mistake. It must be some other man. I can't imagine why anyone would want to take Maddie, though. The cops said they would investigate and find her soon. And Josh, too. Her voice broke for a moment. She bent her head down, took a deep breath and consciously stilled her fingers. Her eyes were steady when she raised them. There is no reason to doubt the police, 
is there? Why are you here asking me these questions? We feel responsible, ma'am, Megan responded to Amy Cottrell's unasked question. It won't hurt if we do some digging too. We have some experience in these matters. We work in a security consulting firm. Megan gave her the spiel which was on their firm's website, and the words seemed to calm Amy Cottrell down. Beth took up the questioning. Maddie said you came to New York five years back? Maddie must have told you our life stories. She can't stop once she starts. The mother's face softened for a moment. Yeah, we are originally from Babish, Alabama. Josh was working in a law firm there. That firm gave him an opening in the New York office. She saw the twins trying to place the city. It's not a large city. With a population of about 5,000, it barely exists on the map. It's in Jefferson County, 50 miles south of Birmingham. It's a city of transients. There are a couple of defense contractors out there, and a lot of floating population. I was a realtor. I could do that job in any city. Maddie was very young then and would adapt to the move. It was an opportunity we couldn't pass. Babish was where you grew up, ma'am? She smiled for the first time. Yeah. Born educated, lived there most of our lives. We went to the University of Alabama and returned. We were high school sweethearts. That entire schmaltzy story, that's us. New York was our first move. From a city that barely exists on a map, to the largest city in the world. The smile faded, the hand started twisting again as if to say, and look what happened. They asked her more questions, about their marriage, her job, Josh Cottrell's job, Maddie's school, and her friends. Peaches and Lizzie are her closest friends. She has a few more but none who are as close. And what about the two of you, ma'am? Any friends? Amy Cottrell shrugged helplessly. Not really. When we came to this city, we knew no one. That hasn't changed much. Sure we have work friends and we know a few parents from Maddie's school. Josh has a busy job and travels a lot. I'm busy too. We hardly get any time to socialize. Beth rose and looked at the photographs on the wall. You look very much in love. We are. We have a great marriage. I can't think why he would. No, he didn't. It must be someone else. Amy Cottrell broke down and started weeping. Anything? Zeb asked when they returned. Nothing. Beth tossed her handbag inside the vehicle and fastened her seatbelt. Perfect marriage. Great jobs. He's a lawyer in a big firm, an outfit called Mayo and Kane. I've seen their ads. They're well known. She's a realtor with a big outfit. You see their billboards all over the city. She's no ordinary realtor either. She sells luxury homes to the super rich. Makes big bucks. Lovely daughter. No reason for dad to suddenly run away with Maddie. We didn't tell her about Maddie's story. It wasn't the right time. Megan broke the silence in the vehicle. She doesn't believe he kidnapped her in any case. That's the wife talking, Beth replied. No one got a good look at that man. He could be anyone. He could be the dad too. Megan gestured at Zeb to pull out and drive. I bet he's the NYPD's prime suspect, and there's always a reason. She might not know it. Or she isn't telling. Chapter 4 Zeb turned on his flasher, waited for a break in the metallic river, and headed out. Where to, ladies? Downtown, Megan replied, her serious look changing to one of mirth for a moment. To see two of your favorite people in the world. Pazaka and Chong. Pazaka and Chong were first grade detectives who headed a major K squad in the NYPD. Zeb and his team had come across the two cops when bringing down serial killers and terrorists in the city. Given the clandestine nature of their agency, Zeb and his crew's involvement was known to only the commissioner and Pazaka and Chong. The two cops were the leads on those cases and got credit for the closures. 
Their careers received major boosts from the media fallout, rapid promotions followed and the two became celebrities in their own right. Pazaka had published a couple of books, had a rapidly growing public profile, and was actively seeking movie deals. Chong was more low profile and was content for his partner to hog the limelight. The two presented themselves differently, Pazaka dressed sharply, his black hair perfectly groomed, while Chong wore a perennial sleepy rumpled look. Despite their appearances and differing appetite for publicity, the two worked well together and were two of the best detectives in the NYPD. Why then? Zeb flicked a glance sideways at Megan. They are on the case. Regina called the commissioner when Beth was attacked. The commissioner didn't have anyone else? Beth groaned from behind. They are good cops. Zeb replied mildly as he steered their ride to one police plaza, the NYPD headquarters, and headed to the parking lot. He exited and tossed the keys in a silvery arc to Megan. She caught them one-handed and frowned at him. You aren't joining us? Nope. I'll get in the way. I will be at the VA. She nodded in understanding. Pazaka didn't like Zeb, in fact he didn't like any of them. He regarded them as vigilantes, however it was Zeb for who he reserved his biting sarcasm. That Zeb didn't respond riled him even more. Chong met them, looking as if he had just woken up and had tossed on a wrinkled cream-colored suit. His short hair bristled and he walked languidly till he met the twins. Then he burst into a trot, a wide smile on his face and hugged the twins tight. You ladies are becoming strangers. You don't need us anymore, Chong. You're getting better at your job, Megan deadpanned. Chong led them up an elevator and then to an office in which a well-dressed man awaited. Dressed in a tan suit whose edges could slice through butter shades that reflected light, hair perfectly groomed, Pazaka looked a model. Or a Hollywood star. Pazaka nodded at them and didn't offer to shake hands. He looked behind the twins' shoulders. Zeb isn't coming. He said you intimidate him, Megan read his glance. Chong sighed when Pazaka continued looking behind them. Where are the others? You know how he is. He likes to know who else he has to work with. Bear and Chloe are in Indonesia, on vacation. Bawana and Roger are somewhere in Chile. They are on vacation too. Broker is with his girlfriend, in Washington, D.C. Carter isn't on vacation? Pazaka spoke for the first time. The last time he took a vacation, he came across us. That was enough for him, Beth cracked, drawing a chuckle from Chong. Pazaka's face didn't change. Humor was for lesser mortals. Besides smiling wrinkled one's face. There were interviews to give, talk shows to go on, wrinkles weren't good. Why are you here? You know why, Pazaka. Regina Honecker. Close friend of the commissioner's wife. Rings a bell? Chong cut his tired eyes to his partner. Can we cut through this? They're here as Honecker's liaison. So what if they investigate on their own? Finding the girl is important. Pazaka straightened at his partner's rebuke, went through the events outside the Columbus Avenue office and cut himself short when Megan waved him on. They knew the events. We interviewed Amy Cottrell. Didn't get much there. Usual stuff about good marriage. No enemies. No reason for husband to kidnap daughter. We talked to Ms. Honecker too and the kids. She told us to stop wasting time and start investigating. A team is interviewing passers-by, other offices, doormen. So far not one witness has come forward. Chong bent down to straighten a trouser leg, it stubbornly remained wrinkled. He gave up with a sigh. Another team is looking at CCTV cameras. There aren't many in that area. All airports, train stations, bus stations have been alerted. Posters and flyers will go up in public places. We have a few in front of our office, Megan corrected him. We'll check the feed as soon as we get back. Pazaka pulled out a single sheet of paper from a slim folder and handed it to them. Josh Cottrell from his employer. As you can imagine, he's our prime suspect. 
Beth skimmed through the sheet quickly and passed it to Megan. There wasn't much on the sheet. A single sentence on Cottrell and an entire paragraph on the firm. No photograph. Cottrell was a partner in the law firm, in a division called Settlements. Nothing on the sheet revealed what the division did. The law firm was the fifth largest in the country, had over 2,000 employees and worked with large corporations, most of them defense contractors. Megan handed the sheet back and with her next words, sucked the air out of the room. Josh Cottrell has a history of hitting his wife. Chapter 5 Beth filled in the shocked silence that followed Megan's revelation as she briefed the two cops on what Maddie had told them. Ms. Honecker knew about this all along? Pazaka asked, his face white. Yeah. She brought Maddie to us today to get her to tell us. Chong exchanged a silent look with his partner, excused himself and left the room. No one broke the silence in his absence, and when he returned fifteen minutes later, his sleepy look had left him. No complaints were filed by Amy Cottrell in the last five years. A couple of cops are calling the babish PD. We will know soon enough. What about hospitals? His partner reminded. I have that covered. Another couple of cops are calling hospitals and clinics in the city. If Mrs. Cottrell was hurt or injured, Chong didn't complete his sentence. He went to a water cooler in the room, filled plastic cups and handed them around. That child. Carrying that within herself. No one to speak to. He lowered himself heavily in a chair. We have requested a meeting with Mayo and Kane. Will you ladies wish to come along? Megan nodded, but before she could reply, Pazaka cut in. The girl didn't see anything. She just heard stuff. She could be mistaken. Megan placed a calming hand on Beth's shoulder before her sister could flare. Yeah. That doesn't mean we should discount it. No one is discounting anything. Chang's soft voice was calming. We will investigate it. If it's true, there could be a motive for the husband to run away with his daughter. Right now, all we know for sure is that the daughter has been kidnapped and the husband is missing. Megan turned her head and watched Beth for a long moment when Zeb, who had returned just as they exited 1PP, was driving them back. Her sister was watching the traffic silently, stony-faced, her fists balled. She was still fuming at Pazaka's insinuation. Nothing more had been discussed with the cops. Chong had promised to get back to them as soon as he heard from the law firm. The twins, in turn, would share their CCTV feed with the NYPD. Pazaka said he would look into how Maddie's claim could be investigated. Beth. Beth, she called louder when her sister didn't look at her. We will talk to Amy Cottrell, okay? Beth nodded, still not meeting her eyes, and resumed her silent watch on the city as it blurred past. It was evening. Traffic was thick, loud and angry. People were in a hurry to get to wherever they were headed. Cars cut in and out. Traffic snarled. Lights winked and high-rises lit up. Maddie could be anywhere. Beth's eyes were bright with unshed tears when she finally looked at Megan. What must be her mom going through? Megan was in the office early the next day. A coffee to start the day right, a tap on the keyboard to bring her screen to life, and the hunt started. She glanced once at the clock on the wall. It had Mickey Mouse on its face, it was the one item Beth and she had brought from their home in Wyoming. Not quite 24 hours, but close enough. Still no clue where she is or who has taken her. She was querying the CCTV feed when Beth wandered in an hour later. Her sister mumbled a greeting, she returned it without raising her head. There were four cameras at the front of the building, which caught the street from various angles. There was a fifth camera mounted discreetly on a lamp pole on the opposite side. There were several cameras inside the lobby and a couple inside the elevators. Beth joined her and they watched the feeds in silence. Relentless traffic. Then a figure emerging from the building. Beth. More figures. The rest of them. The first figure raised a hand. A vehicle arrived, a cab. 
People clambered in. At the edge of the screen, a figure appeared. Grew larger. Became a man. He hurled Beth aside, grabbed Maddie and ran. For a microsecond, nothing happened. Then figures emerged from the opposite end of the cab. Tiny figures clambered out from inside. Another figure joined them. Zeb. There was pointing, gesticulating, and then Zeb bent and lifted Beth easily and carried her inside. Grandma made calls, the cops arrived, and at that point Megan froze the feed. She ran it a few more times, checked the other cameras, but realized with a sinking feeling that none of them had caught the assailant. All they could see was a gray sweatshirt, a hoodie, gray track pants, and white sneakers. The man's face was indistinguishable. They could make out he was white, but that was the only feature they could spot. Megan rose, brewed herself another cup of coffee while Beth typed furiously. She returned, stood over Beth's shoulder and watched as her sister commanded Werner to trace any Maddie-related chatter on the internet. She attached several pictures of the girl to her commands. Werner would sniff out social media posts and blogs. It would go to chat programs and look into emails. It talked to hundreds of databases all over the world. Secret databases guarded zealously by government agencies and public repositories. Werner had access to them all. Beth slid her chair back, rose and stretched. What now, sis? Let's talk to Amy Cottrell. Megan replied, and when she turned to head out of the office, Zeb was there. He led them out silently, down the elevator, to the SUV which roared and lunged forward as if it too could join the search. Amy Cottrell wasn't alone. Grandma was with her, and the two women were sitting in silence when Megan and Beth entered the Cottrell home. Megan didn't wait for pleasantries. She caught Grandma's eyes and signaled her to stay quiet, and then pounced. Maddie told us. About your husband hitting you. Chapter 6 Amy Cottrell reared back as if stung. Her wan face tightened and her skin suddenly looked like parchment. Her mouth opened soundlessly and she didn't seem to breathe. What? What did you say? What did Maddie say? Her voice trembled. Maddie revealed everything. How your husband used to beat you. That one time he broke your shoulder. The mother shuddered, her eyes wide, her hands doing the twisting motion. Grandma rose and brought her a glass of water. She grabbed it and drank it, heedless of the drops that spilled and ran down her chin. It's not true. Maddie doesn't know anything. Her voice rose in a shout, and she slammed the glass on a table. Ma'am, why would your daughter lie? She didn't. My girl never lied about anything. She misinterpreted. Josh never raised a hand to me. We were in. Oh my God. A hand cupped her mouth. You think Josh took her because of that, don't you? Her eyes looked accusingly at Megan, then at Beth, and lastly at Grandma. None of them responded. Amy Cottrell took a deep breath. She rose, walked to the door and held it open. Get out. Get out of my house. The twins were in Grandma's home half an hour later. They hadn't spoken on the drive back, and when Grandma ushered them in, Lizzie and Peaches had run up to them, questioning looks in their eyes. We are searching, honey. The cops, us, everyone in the city are hunting for Maddie. We will find her. Megan hugged Peaches tightly and released her when Grandma approached from the kitchen. She was carrying steaming mugs of coffee and a batch of freshly baked cookies on a tray. Beth bit into a cookie, savored it for a moment. The world could be ending however there was always time for a cookie and looked at grandma. We should have warned you ma'am. We felt a shock tactic would work best. Grandma waved her apology away. You think that might be the reason? We don't know ma'am. Megan confessed. If he was abusive toward her, she raised a calming hand at Beth's protest. I'm not saying he wasn't. However, we have to look at all possibilities. She returned to Grandma, if all that's true, then their marriage might be in trouble. Cottrell snapped for some reason and made away with his daughter. Something about the distraught mother's behavior struck her. Ma'am, 
You must have spoken to her several times since yesterday. Met her as well. How was she with you? Grandma was puzzled. Her brow furrowed and she replied slowly, thinking. Upset. A slight smile crept on her face. That's an understatement. In shock. Falling to pieces. Unable to think or act. Beth got where Megan was heading to. She wasn't furious with you? Grandma frowned. No. Why would she be? Most moms would feel anger. They would feel betrayed if their child was kidnapped while in someone else's care. They would be accusatory. We have seen friends turn on friends. Families split apart. An understanding light came in Grandma's eyes. Dear God, what was going on in that home? Neither of the twins felt like having lunch, however Zeb made them stop at a cafe near their office and grab a bite. Megan and Beth took the opportunity to speak to the stores, restaurants and coffee shops in the neighborhood. They handed out Maddie's photographs, which they had gotten from the police. They spoke to baristas and the regulars. They turned up empty-handed. In a city of eight million, no one saw anything. People lived in their private bubbles, and thousands of them never broke out of theirs. Their quiet desperation was broken once by Beth when she said she would get a bullhorn and ride around the city calling out Maddie's name. Megan rolled her eyes at that and shoved her in the direction of the next store. It was late afternoon by the time they had finished canvassing stores and were climbing into their ride when Megan's phone rang. Chong, she mouthed when she saw the number. Yeah, super cop. Give me some good news. She listened and ended the call with a we'll be there. We have a meeting with Mayo and Kane. We left several messages for them and at last one of their partners returned our call, Chong told them when he and Pazaka greeted them outside the law firm's offices. The firm was housed in a modern 40-floor high-rise in downtown Manhattan, a block away from Freedom Tower. Chong had made an effort for the meeting. His jacket had fewer wrinkles. Pazaka looked as if he was going for a modeling shoot. Chong led the way inside a cavernous lobby, past smiling security guards, and toward an elevator bank. A well-dressed woman greeted them and took them to the 17th floor. They waited for a few moments in a reception area, and presently a tall man approached them. He had a red tie over a crisp white shirt. The shirt was tucked into trousers whose edges rivaled Pazaka's. His smile was white, his blonde hair was smartly cut and his body language said, trust me. I'm here to help you. At five grand an hour. He shook their hands with a firm grip and introduced himself. I am Josh Cottrell. Chapter 7 Megan stared at him in shock. She was dimly aware that her mouth was hanging open and her companions were in a similar state of disbelief. Chong was the first to recover. You can't be. A frown appeared and swiftly disappeared on the man's face. I most assuredly am, sir. Chong looked at Pazaka and then at the twins. Maybe we should discuss this someplace else? The man pivoted on his heel and walked down a hallway toward his office. A few people greeted him on the way, and looked curiously at those with him. They call him Josh. The man calling himself Josh Cottrell pushed open the door to his office and ushered them into a room that was half the size of a tennis court. A large wooden desk, burnished and polished to a rich shine, was at one end. Floor-to-ceiling picture windows brought the city inside the office. The man gestured at several chairs, went to a side table, and brought a silver salver on which was a carafe filled with coffee, and several cups. Megan took the seat opposite him, declined the offering, and watched him seat himself. The man crossed his fingers, steepled them, and a helpful expression came across his face. What's this about? Megan told him. He listened silently, his face expressionless but for a well-shaped eyebrow lifting. That's one heck of a story, he exclaimed when she had finished. He turned to the cops. Presumably you are investigating. It's why we are here, Chong said baldly. Where were you yesterday? You didn't get our messages? 
I was out of the country. Just got back this morning. The wide smile flashed again. Detective Chong, I hope you aren't suggesting I am involved in any way. Pazaka's shades trained on Cottrell. No suggestions, Mr. Cottrell. Josh Cottrell is the missing dad. He works here. That's why we are here. The man chuckled. I can assure you I am the only Josh Cottrell in this firm. You can confirm for yourself if you wish. He lifted a phone, spoke quietly in it, and after a short while there was a discreet knock on the door and an elderly woman entered. She was dressed in a cream-colored suit and was carrying a folder. Helen Limbaugh. She heads our HR, Cottrell introduced her. Helen, these folks are from the NYPD. Can you tell them how many people we employ? Limbaugh looked at him for a moment. It's all right, Helen. They are investigating a missing person who is apparently connected to our firm. Mayo and Kane has 2,850 staff all over the country. 300 are partners. Over 1,500 are lawyers. Mr. Cottrell is partner of our settlements division. Limbaugh's voice was dry and precise as she recited the figures while looking at Megan. It must be in her contract. No emotion to be shown. And how many Josh Cottrells do we have, Helen? Cottrell grinned. Just you. Limbaugh smiled slightly. Smiles are allowed. Small ones. Except when you make partner. Then, large ones are mandatory. They spent an hour more at the law firm and got nothing useful out but for the fact that Amy Cottrell's husband didn't work there. They showed photographs of the husband. No one in the law firm recognized him. The number that the mother and Pazaka and Chong had rung belonged to the firm. Cottrell had no explanation for that. The mobile number for the missing father wasn't the firm's. Something you should be looking into, detectives. Cottrell was amused. He seemed to be enjoying himself and at one point nearly rubbed his hands together. Probably a change from advising stuffy corporate types, Megan thought. Beth looked at her sideways. She had the same thought. What's the settlements division? Megan asked him and braced herself mentally for a lengthy reply. The partner didn't disappoint her. The firm worked with defense outfits, he explained. Many of them supplied military contractors to the army. Mercenaries, Beth interjected. Not at all, Cottrell refuted smoothly. That word doesn't do justice to the people our clients provide. Their contractors are professionals, ex-military, highly trained and disciplined. Not the picture that Hollywood paints. Unfortunately, some of these contractors get injured or killed when deployed. My division makes sure their families get all the benefits due to them. In many cases, family members had to be traced, dependents had to be identified, before benefit payments could be made. I was in the army myself. Three tours of Afghanistan. Got a law degree when I left, worked my butt off, and here I am. I know what families go through when their men or women are away or don't return. He glanced at a family picture on his desk with a somber expression. He did righteous work even if he charged a fortune for it. He answered a few more questions and then flicked a cuff back to reveal an expensive wristwatch. He rose. Non-chargeable time was over. Your man never worked here. Chapter 8 We have a John Doe? Megan asked the two cops. Pazaka's shades inclined silently while Chong sighed and ran a hand through his unruly hair. This couldn't get any worse, Chong replied morosely. Beth was silent as she slurped at her juice. They were in a coffee shop, filling up with liquids, regrouping after the whammy the law firm had delivered. A girl walked past them, tugging on her mom's arm, pointing excitedly at muffins on the counter. Beth's gaze rested on her and then she rose suddenly. Let's ask the mom. Whoa. Hold up, sis. Megan put out a hand and pulled her down. She's coming apart. I don't think she can handle this blow. Maybe she knows, Pazaka dabbed his lips with a paper towel. 
And maybe she doesn't. Megan shot back. Why don't we find out who the missing dad is, before asking her? We're on that too. Chong left a few bills on the table, rose and slipped into his jacket. A couple of female officers interviewed Amy Cottrell earlier today. Asked her about his usual haunts, their friends. He stopped, one hand inside his jacket, one hand outside. Here's the funny thing. He doesn't have any usual haunts. He went to work. Came back home. No visits to the bar with friends. Weekends were spent at home or in the park. He slid the other hand into his jacket. They have a few friends, we're following up on those. He waved at the twins and turned to join Pazaka, who was waiting impatiently. Anything from the hotline? Beth stopped him, referring to the number the NYPD had set up for Maddie. Usual crank calls. Wrong or false sightings. No gold dust. Megan glanced involuntarily at Mickey Mouse when she and her sister entered their office. Thirty hours since Maddie's kidnapping. They went to work on their computers. Megan would track down the missing father's records, while Beth would go after his social media presence. They didn't take long to complete their search. No DMV record. No bank account, at least none that we can find. Megan exhaled slowly. Beth's head rose sharply. He doesn't have a driver's license? Nope. No record, at least. I think Amy Cottrell said something about that, that he didn't like driving. Late afternoon became early evening. Shadows elongated and became dark and then disappeared. The twins didn't stop working. He's not on the internet either. Probably the only male of his age that isn't on social media. Beth pushed off from her desk finally, stretched and paced their office, a squeeze ball in her hand. Let me try facial recog. Megan connected to Werner, and after scanning the father's picture, commanded it to search for the father's likeness. Werner had sophisticated algorithms that compared images based on several nodal points on a person's facial structure, with the numerous databases it had access to. Werner didn't get any hits for Maddie. I bet Dad won't turn up either. Megan ignored her sister and clicked furiously. She called Chong when she had finished and had a short discussion. They are running similar searches at their end. A thought struck her. Let me check for records in Babish. Nothing came up in Babish. Werner didn't return any facial recog hits. They went for a run in Central Park when it became dark, alternating between slow and fast sprints. They slowed and stopped when perspiration matted their hair and streamed down their faces. They launched into a routine Zeb had taught them. A mix of martial arts and Tai Chi. A cyclist slowed to watch them. They ignored him. A bunch of runners split around them. They didn't let up. It was as if fury was driving them. Killing yourself won't find her, a quiet voice spoke from behind. Megan whirled around, ready to do combat. She relaxed when she saw it was Zeb. She grabbed a towel, gave one to Beth, and followed Zeb out of the park. Let's ask the mom. Beth called Chong while Zeb was driving and argued with him. We're going to question her regardless of your presence. Megan craned her head back and looked at her, taking in her pinched face and hollow eyes. She didn't comment on her sister's appearance. They're coming? Beth nodded. Zeb drove through flashes of red and orange, cutting in and out, vehicles parting as if sensing the force field inside their SUV. Chong and Pazaka were waiting for them when they arrived. Magic of light bars, Chong replied smugly at Megan's asking glance. He waved a hand. Lead the way. Amy Cottrell opened the door when Megan rang the buzzer. She hadn't changed since they had met her earlier in the day. A faded sweatshirt over jeans, hair pulled back loosely and held by a band. Her face was listless and seemed to have aged in a day. You again, she said by way of greeting. Her eyes flicked over Megan's shoulder, past Beth and Zeb, and took in the two cops. Her eyes widened. She stumbled backward. A hand went to her mouth, and she sagged against a wall. No.
Chapter 9 Megan lunged forward and caught her before she fell. It's not like that ma'am. Nothing like that. She kept repeating till the mother listened, got her strength back in her legs and stood upright. Megan held her and walked her to the living room. She glanced at her sister, Beth disappeared into the kitchen and returned with a glass of water. Amy Cottrell emptied it, wiped her mouth with the paper towel Beth gave her and lifted a hand limply. Thank you. Sorry I thought, she shook her head. I don't know what to think. I hear a knock or the phone rings, I hope for the best and fear the worst. She raised her eyes at Megan when no one replied. You must have something to ask. That's why you are here. There's no easy way to frame this. Ma'am, we went to Mayo and Kane today. They said your husband doesn't work there. Amy Cottrell sat blankly for a moment and then sat upright on the couch. How's that possible? Josh worked there all his life. There is a Josh Cottrell there, ma'am. We met him. But he isn't your husband. The house fell silent. Kitchen appliances clicked on and off softly, and in the distance a siren wailed. The mother sat for long minutes as if she was punched in her stomach, and then she rose. He has his employment papers. I'll get them. She disappeared in the depths of the house, and they heard movement from one of the bedrooms. Drawers opened and closed. Wardrobe doors opened and shut. Footsteps sounded, but she didn't return to the living room. Sounds came from a second bedroom, and then from the furthest end of the house. Her face was white, and her hands were shaking when she returned. His papers. They are missing. His clothing is missing. None of his stuff is where it should be. The papers were stored in a safe and a wardrobe, in a plastic wallet. They contained his employment contract, letters of commendation, various correspondences related to his job. The wallet was missing. His wardrobe was empty. The shoe rack didn't have his footwear. I didn't open his wardrobe. Didn't pay attention to the shoe rack. She struggled to get words out and drank gratefully from a glass of water that Beth brought for her. She placed the glass on a side table and looked around the house as if seeing it for the first time. She left the room abruptly and they heard more doors slamming inside the house. She went upstairs and when she returned her face was flushed. His toiletries are missing. They're usually stored in a cabinet. Nothing there. The house looks like it's been vacuumed. Her shock was reflected in Beth's face. Nothing of his is left behind? Nothing. Pazaka made a show of removing his shades and pocketing them. Ma'am, he asked gravely. We'll need to get a forensic team in here. She gestured with a limp hand. Do whatever you have to. A single tear ran down her cheek, she made no attempt at wiping it. What about his salary? It must be credited to some bank account? Chong asked in a neutral tone. She shook her head. The account details were in the wallet too. She didn't remember them, nor did she remember the bank's name. I earn more than enough. The mortgage payments go out of my account. His account was of no interest to me. His salary was our play money. A muscle twitched on her cheek. She raised a hand and covered it, as if to silence it. Did you visit his office any time, ma'am? No. Amy Cottrell had never visited her husband's office. There was no reason to. She wasn't the kind to take pride in her husband's office. She knew who the employer was, that was enough. She kept shaking her head at the questions the cops asked, seeming to shrink in the couch as the weight of the revelation set in. What does it all mean, she asked once. They had no answer. Her sobbing stayed in their minds as they left her house and headed to their vehicles. Zeb had barely rolled their SUV a few feet when he stopped after spotting Chang's wave in his mirror. The cop ran toward them, his phone in his hand. I got a message from Josh Cottrell, he gasped breathlessly. He wants to meet us tomorrow. Forty-eight hours from Maddie's kidnap, they met Josh Cottrell for the second time. The smile was the same, the smart grooming hadn't changed. 
Along with the smile there was something in his eyes, a strange light. He waited for them to sit, and when they were settled, he looked at Pazaka and Chong. Any progress on finding the little girl? The search is still on, Pazaka replied blandly. He hadn't removed his shades and his tan jacket was flawless. Cottrell wasn't going to upstage him in the grooming department. The lawyer toyed with a file on his desk when they had fallen silent. I was wrong yesterday. He smiled when Megan leaned forward in interest. I made some inquiries when you had left. Reached out to our various offices in the country. I got a bite from one. I wasn't the only Josh Cottrell in this firm. Wasn't. Megan tamped down on a flicker of excitement and inched further. Cottrell chuckled. You heard right. A Josh Cottrell worked in our babish office in Alabama, in our stakeholder affairs department. That was what settlements was called before I took charge. Josh Cottrell was the family liaison for contractors' families in the Southwest. We have such liaisons all over the country. How come you didn't remember him yesterday? Megan challenged him. He wasn't with Mayo and Kane when I took over. Where is he now? A somber expression replaced the smile on his face. He's dead. Chapter 10 Megan's jaw dropped open for the second time in as many days. Come again. She surged forward as if she could squeeze the answers out of Cottrell, who rocked back in his chair defensively. The lawyer opened the file in front of him, withdrew a photograph, and slid it across the table to them. Is that your missing man? Megan snatched it, confirmed it with one glance, and passed it to her sister who relayed it to the cops. Yeah, that's him. The missing father. The lawyer extracted another sheet and read from it. The second Josh Cottrell worked with Mayo and Kane ever since he graduated. He worked as an intern, got offered a permanent job, and like I said, was the family liaison in his last role. You know anything of Babish? Beth glanced at the cops. Chong made a be-my-guest gesture with his shoulder. Defense contractor town. A couple of large firms have their facilities around which the town is built. One of them builds missile guidance systems, the other aircraft parts. That's right, Ms. Peterson. You have done your homework. Cottrell's boss retired a year before Cottrell died, and at that point the head office decided to move that role and Cottrell to New York. He would have worked with me if he had survived that accident. How and when did he die? Megan burst out, unable to contain herself any longer. Road accident. He was driving back from Georgia after meeting a family. A semi's wheels came off and the truck veered into him. It crushed him, killing him instantly. The semi's driver died too. He looked at the sheet in his hand. February, five years back. He mentioned a date. Megan remembered Amy Cottrell's words. She said they moved in November of that year. Worth checking one more fact with Mr. Fancy Lawyer. He had any family then? Yes. A wife and a three-year-old daughter. Amy and Madison Cottrell. Any brothers? Not that I know of. Here, this is a copy of his personnel record. He slid the folder across to Megan, spoke in a phone, and his exec turned up with more copies for Beth and the cops. Check out the third sheet inside the folder, he directed. Megan opened the folder, as did the others, and brought out a letter and read it. She read it a second time, aware that Beth had gasped. It was a letter from Mayo and Kane to Amy Cottrell and stated in dry, precise language that insurance death benefits had been credited to her bank account. It had a single line of praise for Josh Cottrell and offered condolences to the wife. Silence fell in the office as the twins and the cops read and reread every document in the folder. Megan looked out of the window when she had finished. Bright sunshine bathed the city and yellow cabs weaved in and out far below. A ferry was making its slow way to Ellis Island which once had been the first stop for millions of immigrants, who then had made a life for themselves in the city. This gets better and better, doesn't it? The lawyer's amused tone got her attention. 
Your missing father looks like the dead man. But he isn't, is he? Megan waited till the four of them were back on the street, after spending another hour with the lawyer in which nothing useful had been revealed. Just who was that guy living with her for five years? He looked like the dead Cottrell. Has she been stringing us all along? Beth angrily kicked a paper cup on the sidewalk and then picked it up and dropped it in the nearest trash can. Her face was stormy, her eyes narrowed to pinpoints of light, however she didn't reply. Chong looked moodily across the busy street to where an SUV was parked, a tall, lean man lounging against it. Zeb. Pazaka removed his shades, polished them, blew on them gently, wiped them again and wore them. We have more bad news. Our crime scene unit went to Amy Cottrell's house last night. A wailing ambulance cut him off, and when its siren receded, he resumed. They found nothing of the man. Said they had never come across a site so thoroughly sanitized. So we have no way of identifying him? Beth's face was red, a nerve pulsing rapidly on her temple. He could be a family member. A cousin. Or someone who looked like the dead man. We'll investigate, Pazaka replied. He straightened and addressed the twins. The two of us are the best cops in the city. You both are the finest investigators I have seen. Let's find out who the abductor is. Let's find Madison Cottrell. He turned and walked away without a further word, Chong following him. Megan gaped at their departing backs and then looked at Beth. Did he just compliment us? Zeb listened silently as Megan briefed him, his eyes flicking occasionally to the silent twin in the rear. He knew how Beth felt. Beth had been shot in the head several years back when gunmen had gone on a shooting rampage at her university. She had recovered from that near-fatal injury, but it had left a permanent hole in her memory. Life had begun for her only from the time she had woken up in the hospital. Her elder sister had nurtured her back, had filled in the gaps for her, and had continually been there for her. However, there were still times when she felt lost, didn't know herself. Beth knows that's how Maddie must be feeling. Without any bearings. He drove through the streets, the hundreds of horses under the hood straining to break free. He contained them and navigated them through the controlled chaos that the traffic was. He looked sideways and in the mirror. Find out who exactly died in February, all those years back. Find out if the mother dated men who looked like her husband. His mild voice got Megan's attention and stopped her mind from wandering. Zeb raised his voice only in combat, and only when the situation warranted. She turned back to see Beth was listening too. Let Pazaka and Chong find that. They can go through the records and more importantly the babish PD, quicker than us, Megan replied. We'll piece together Amy Cottrell's life for the last five years. Maddie's too. And Josh Cottrell, the lawyer. I want to check him out, Beth broke her silence. Because he's smooth? Megan queried. Nah. Roger is smooth. Broker is smooth. Heck Zeb can be smooth when he makes the effort, a spark of humor came to life in Beth. Not because he's smooth, but because it was too easy. One day there's no Josh Cottrell, the next day there are two and one of them is dead. And because he's a lawyer, Megan smiled. That too, Beth nodded. You're missing something, Zeb said. Megan frowned at Zeb's words. What? Get the dogs. Chapter 11 72 hours after Madison Cottrell was grabbed, a pair of sniffer dogs clambered out of a van and trotted toward Beth and Megan, accompanied by their handlers. The NYPD's K-9 division had searched for a trail in the immediate hours following Maddie's disappearance. They had found one that had ended at a parking space. The dogs, owned by a former NYPD forensic investigator, were well known in the city. They were former police K-9s who were hired out to private investigators and had developed a reputation for picking up trails where the police dogs couldn't. Zeb had used them successfully in several agency missions. Earlier in the day, Megan had collected Maddie's clothing from Chong and had silently endured Pazaka's sneer when she said they were getting the dogs in. 
They didn't have anything of John Doe for the dogs to scent. John Doe. That was what they called him since no record or trail of his seemed to exist. They hadn't told the mother about the latest revelation. John Doe and the dead Josh Cottrell needed more investigation. It'll be difficult, one of the handlers told the twins. Three days isn't a long time, however, this is a high traffic density area. Scents get overlaid. They can disappear if a getaway vehicle was involved. He removed his ball cap, scratched his head, and replaced it. The NYPD's K-9s are good, ma'am. If they didn't find much, his voice trailed away. Don't expect miracles were his inspoken words. Megan nodded in acceptance. They had to try, nevertheless. The dogs were exceptionally trained and surged against their leashes when the handlers made them smell the clothing. They sniffed the air, wiggled their noses, bent to the sidewalk, walked around, before one of the dogs uttered a short woof and set off in the direction the assailant had run. Megan's excitement died when the dog stopped and sniffed the pavement a hundred yards away. The pavement gave way to a row of parking spaces. The NYPD's K-9s had lost the trail at the edge of the pavement. The investigator's dogs stopped at the same edge and looked up at their handlers. They went back to the hunt when the men urged them, but it was obvious there wasn't a trail for them to pick up on. This is as far as we can get, the handler shouted at them after several hours. The assailant probably had a car parked here. That's the same theory the NYPD have, Megan thought. She went over to handlers, thanked them, and then joined the sidewalk conference Beth was having with Pazaka and Chong, who had arrived a few moments earlier. Josh Cottrell did die in Babish on the date the lawyer gave us, Pazaka held a finger up on his hand. He had a smirk on his face as if to say, your dogs didn't do any better than ours, did they? We got confirmation from Babish PD. They also confirmed he had no brothers. He was the only son. His parents died several years back. We'll trace the Cottrell family line. See if there are any cousins who look like the dead man, Chong added. His tone wasn't hopeful. Do any of the cops remember the accident? Beth asked, still looking in the direction of the dogs who were now climbing into their ride. Nada, Chong replied. The police chief is new and most of the cops from that year have retired. Or have died. It's a very small department in a low-crime city and is staffed with older cops. A second finger went up on Pazaka's hand when his partner had stopped speaking. There is a paragraph on the accident in the Babish Daily Times edition of that day. Chong is trying to get hold of the reporter. A third finger went up. Finally, there's the coroner's report confirming the death. He waited for the twins to speak, and when they didn't, he buttoned his jacket. Josh Cottrell, Mayo and Kane's family liaison, husband to Amy Cottrell, is dead. We're taking a closer look at Amy Cottrell. We have to, Chong was almost apologetic. Who was the guy living with her? Her husband is dead. Why would she lie about him? Josh Cottrell is from Burlington, Vermont. He went to University of Vermont, joined the ROTC program, and went straight into the army. Beth read out loud from the law firm partner's bio, while her sister commanded Werner to dig into the law firm. They had returned to their office after their meeting with the cops. Pazaka and Chong would investigate John Doe and Amy Cottrell. The twins would focus on the lawyer and his employer. They would also verify the mother's backstory even if it duplicated the cop's investigation. Afghanistan is right, he mentioned that. Left the army 12 years back, went to Syracuse University. Got a law degree. Worked in three law firms, before he got his break in Mayo and Kane. Seven years there, two years initially in California, and then came to New York. Married. Two daughters in middle school. Wife's active in charity. Werners found no dirt on him. Megan raised her head and looked at her when she stopped reading. What? He was in the Special Forces, in the 7th Special Forces Group. Isn't that an airborne group based out of Florida? Megan recalled a discussion they had with Bear and Bawana a long while back. Yeah. 
Megan twirled a pencil in her fingers and leaned back in her chair. Most of the partners in the firm are ex-military. It seems to be almost a requirement, given that they work with all the major defense contractors. Beth arched an eyebrow. All? All, confirmed Megan, and read out the names of corporations that were a who's who of the defense industry. They turned at a sound and saw Zeb enter the office, his face bathed in sweat from the run he'd been on. He disappeared into the shower and emerged, dressed in a blue shirt and jeans. He paused at the expression on their faces. You got something? Josh Cottrell was in the Special Forces, the 7th Special Forces Group, Beth exclaimed. Zeb nodded as if it confirmed something. Doesn't surprise me. The armed forces lose several people to the private sector. Better pay. Better life. He was turning away when the look on Megan's face stopped him. Now what? Call someone. Check him out, she said impatiently. Do we have to lay it out for you? His lips twitched and he jerked his head to the bubble, a high-sec room in their office that was impervious to counter-surveillance. He punched numbers on a speakerphone, crossed his arms and waited. He knew the protocol. It would ring three times, and midway on the fourth ring it would be answered. Who are you calling? Megan broke off from her pacing to ask him. The National Security Advisor. Chapter 12 I heard you were back, General Daniel Klaus growled through the speakerphone. The National Security Advisor was one of a handful of people who knew of the agency's existence. He knew of every mission and helped in the planning whenever he could. Zeb's last mission had been to South Asia, where a new terrorist training camp had been established in the deep jungles of Indonesia. Zeb had entered the country as an aid worker, a cover that gave him license to travel in the country. The camp and its commanders didn't exist by the time he returned to the U.S. General Klaus was a staunch supporter of the agency and regarded Claire's work as vital to the country's security. It helped that Claire and he were close friends and that he was fond of Zeb. He was a rare animal in the capital. He was completely apolitical, which was one reason the president had appointed him. He was single, had never married, had no family, lived for serving his country, and seemed to never sleep. He had met Zeb's team several times and liked them, an emotion that wasn't apparent in his fierce demeanor. Yes, sir. Zeb didn't elaborate and neither did the general probe for details. The jungles of Indonesia were cleared. Nothing else mattered. The National Security Advisor listened without interruption when Zeb outlined his request. Why come to me, Zeb? You know enough generals in the Pentagon. Sir, my asking might get back to Mayo and Kane. Very well. Leave it with me. The girls are with you? Yes, sir, Megan leaned forward. General Klaus's voice warmed and relaxed. The twins were the daughters he never had. He is improving Meg, Beth. Well done. Beth laughed and crossed her eyes to Zeb. The general had challenged them to get Zeb to open up, speak more. It's hard work, sir, however he is stringing words together now. Werner was playing Go with a Swiss supercomputer when it got the first alert. The Swiss Miss and Werner were going steady, and Werner had introduced her to Go, an ancient Chinese strategy board game which was infinitely more complex than chess. Werner made its move on the board, looked at the alert, stroked its chin thoughtfully, and allocated some processing power to investigating. The Swiss computer sensed Werner's distraction and raised a questioning eyebrow. The twins are being criticized on social media, replied Werner. The internet was flooded with messages from users who seemed to be using anonymous or fake ids. They slammed the twins for letting Maddie get kidnapped. The comments were harsh, rude, and several of them were downright hostile. Megan joined Beth and silently read some of the messages. You're okay. Yeah. This is nothing, we have been through worse. However, Werner is tracking down some of the IP addresses. The good thing is, it'll help focus attention on Maddie. With that, Beth cast it out of her mind and brought up the reports Werner had collated on Mayo and Kane. 
200-year-old firm founded by Mayo and Kane. Their heirs are still with the firm as partners, she read aloud under her breath, while Megan read the reports on the various partners. Two hours later, they were no closer to finding anything suspicious on the firm. Mayo and Kane had a good reputation. A few calls from Zeb to his friends in the Pentagon reinforced that view. The firm didn't always work for defense contractors. It had once filed a class action suit against a contractor, on behalf of a group of its employees. It had won a generous settlement for the staff, and had earned more plaudits. The partners had impeccable references. Werner hadn't been able to find anything shady in their past, other than the odd parking fine. Beth's face grew darker with every report, and finally she snapped. Maddie is out there Lord knows where with some dude while we waste time on this bunch of guys. She rounded on her sister angrily. Beth? Beth cut her short. Why are we even doing this? Pazaka and Chong can investigate this. We should be outside, she pointed a finger at a window, looking for Maddie. Are you done? Megan asked quietly. She knew Beth was venting. She knew that Beth also knew that short of a stroke of luck, the only way to find Maddie was to find out who Daddy really was, where he was from, get insights into his life. That meant looking at the law firm, even if it led nowhere. They would also have to similarly investigate Amy Cottrell. Investigation took time. She knew Beth was conscious of the time, the more time elapsed, the further away Maddie could be. Beth wasn't willing to listen, however. She wiped her eyes, grabbed her jacket and stormed out without looking back. She took the elevator and barged out of their building in the direction of the nearest coffee shop. In her rage, she didn't see the three men on the sidewalk and bumped into one of them. Sorry, she apologized and skirted him. She took another step when the man called out. Hey, hold up. She turned around and looked at the man. He was red-faced, his eyes were small and his bald head gleamed with perspiration. His companions stood alongside, one lean and wiry, the other average-looking. Yeah? Baldy looked her up and down. Aren't you the one who got that girl kidnapped? Chapter 13 Beth gave him a cold stare and turned her back on him and walked away. A beefy hand grabbed her by the shoulder. Hey, I'm talking to. Her frustration exploded, she spun on her heel and slapped his hand away. Don't touch me. She glared at him and when he didn't respond, walked away. Big mistake. The thought came into her mind and fled just as quickly when Baldy charged at her with an angry yell, and there was no more time for thinking. She turned her body sideways, presenting a smaller target to Baldy, and waited for him to come near. He approached rapidly, his mouth opened wide, snarls escaping him, his eyes narrow pinpoints of rage. Beefy hands reached out to grab her and crush her. She waited till the last moment, and just as a hand came close to her face, she took a half step back, grabbed it and swiveled. Baldy rocked forward and when he got closer, she shot a leg out and swept his feet away from underneath him. Baldy went flying. He crashed into a garbage bin, tipped it over and sprawled on the sidewalk. He lay motionless for a few moments and then struggled to his feet, swung his head slowly till he spotted Beth. Bitch, he shouted and lumbered into a run towards her. She bent beneath the outstretched arms, braced herself for impact, and jabbed a sharp elbow in Baldy's midriff. Baldy collapsed on top of her, and his breath left him in a loud grunt. She twisted sinuously before he could recover, applied a hold over his neck and brought him face down on the concrete. She planted a knee on his back, twisted his left hand behind and rendered him immobile. She looked at Baldy's companions. Lean and wiry was similarly sprawled face down, Megan's knee on his back. Zeb was facing average, standing relaxed, his hair ruffling in a light breeze. Her frustration vanished in an instant, and a grin lightened her face when she heard Zeb address the third man. I haven't hurt anyone today. You want to be the first? An embarrassed Baldy and his companions disappeared into the depths of the city 45 minutes later, after profuse apologies. They had been in a bar pouring through their social media feeds and had spotted the kidnapping comments.
alcohol, heat, and the coincidental appearance of Beth had led to an ill-thought act. The excuses tripped off their tongues when Beth and Megan questioned them and threatened them with calling the cops. Beth held a hand up, stalling them when she had heard enough and watched them leave. She felt Megan's eyes on her and turned to meet them. Sorry, she said and made everything good between them. They were in Babish the next day, 96 hours after Maddie's disappearance, to verify Amy Cottrell's story. Beth had given Werner a task before they departed, to track Amy Cottrell's internet and social media profile, to check into various dating sites and see if she had used them. Over the years, Zeb had done several favors for a Middle Eastern royal family. In one, he had rescued the royal's daughter who had been kidnapped. In another, he had found the killer of another royal family member. The royal had presented a check with several zeros in it to Claire in gratitude for the first favor. Claire had turned the check over to Zeb and had insisted that he take it. Zeb and his crew had bought the entire building on Columbus Avenue with the reward and had made shrewd investments with the remaining funds. The royal had gifted Zeb with a Gulfstream for the second favor and refused to take no for an answer. The Gulfstream was now at the disposal of the team, and its pilots and maintenance were funded by the investments. The twins took the aircraft to Babish and on landing, rented a vehicle at the small airport that serviced the local region. Megan got into the driver's seat of the Escalade, donned her shades, and when Beth gave her thumbs up, set off to the Civic Center. Babish was similar to thousands of small towns across the country. Main Street housed businesses, stores, restaurants, and several civic offices. Several streets branched off from the heart of the city and led to parks, schools, hospitals, and residences. Megan headed to a small street that paralleled Main Street and parked in front of a red-bricked building. It looked like a large residence but for the sign in front of it. Babish Police Department Chief Leroy Altoff was waiting for them when they arrived at the entrance. Altoff cut a reassuring figure in his uniform and spit-polished shoes. His blonde hair and mustache were trimmed and his tanned face looked strong. The twins were tall at 5 feet 10 inches, however the chief had a few inches over them. He gripped their hands in a warm handshake and a smile split his face. Reliable was the impression one got on meeting Chief Altoff. Megan knew from their research that he was nearing retirement. However, age didn't seem to slow him as he walked them through his department offices. The department had 25 officers and a support staff that looked after the small town's policing needs. Altoff introduced them to various key staff, outlined the various divisions, and missed the silent glance the twins exchanged. He's killing time. Their fears came true when he took them to his office, seated himself, clasped his hands, and looked at them. You have wasted your time. Chapter 14 I told the New York cops all that we had. Josh Cottrell died in a traffic accident. He widened his hands as if apologizing for a wasted trip. There was nothing suspicious about his death. We investigated it, not that there was much to investigate. Traffic pileups happen. It was well covered by the local media at the time. I hunted out the reports for you. He pushed a file towards Megan and handed Beth copies. The coroner's report is in there too. They skimmed through the accident scene reports, witness statements, various other papers that made the file. Most of the material was familiar to them, as Chong had already shared it with them. Any of these cops still around, sir? Beth asked, knowing the answer. He shook his head. Nope. As you can see, we are a department full of old-timers, a smile spread on his face. We come to Babish when we are nearing retirement. Bob Glines and Vern Maybe were the lead officers. They were first on the scene, too. Bob died of a heart attack three years back. Vern is somewhere in Mexico. He rummaged through a drawer, brought out a pad of sticky notes, and scribbled a number from memory. That's Vern's cell phone. He hasn't changed it since time began. I tried calling him but didn't get through. He lives there, sir? Beth took the note, memorized the number, and passed it to Megan. Altoff laughed, a deep belly laugh that reverberated in the room. 
Even the laugh was reassuring. You could say that. He loves sailing and has his own boat. He spends a lot of time in the Gulf, with Tampico as his base. A knock sounded on his door, and an officer poked his head through. The chief waved him inside, signed a few papers, and when he left, glanced discreetly at his watch. The twins got the message. It may be a small town, but there's still work to be done. They asked him a few more questions, and then rose and followed him out of the office. It was while he was shaking their hands that he surprised them. You knew all this. You came to Babish for some other reason, didn't you? His face had a shrewd look as he assessed them. Maybe to check the town out? Get a feel for it? The belly laugh sounded again when he saw the sheepish looks on their faces. I may be nearing retirement, ladies, but I still have it. Beth watched him grow smaller in the mirror and then disappear as Megan turned onto the street. He's good. He would be, her sister replied. He spent 20 years in Miami PD. His daughter works here at one of the defense contractors. Chong said he and his wife wanted to be closer to their grandkids, and that's why he took this job. You realize both the defense firms here are Mayo and Kane's clients. Yeah. Beth stifled a yawn and leaned her head against the window. Where to now? The Babish Daily Times. The newspaper's office was on Main Street, above a bar whose signboard displayed a long iron bar. No confusion there, Megan chuckled, and climbed a short flight of stairs and pressed the buzzer in front of a glass door that had the newspaper's logo. A short, lean man approached the door and opened it. His narrow face took them in and burst into a smile. You must be the Peterson twins. I'm Mitch Reeves, editor. Welcome to the Babish Daily Times, the largest newspaper in town. It so happens, it's the only one, he whispered and chuckled at his own joke. He led them past the small office which had people bent over desks, some on phones, some others huddled in cabins, and took them to a glass-encased office. Great location, Megan complimented him. Having the bar downstairs is handy, Reeves agreed. We just stamp our feet on the floor when we're hungry, and they deliver food. He clasped his hands behind his head, and leaned back in his chair when pleasantries had been exchanged. Why the sudden interest in Josh Cottrell? That was a long time back. Not many people remember him. What did the NYPD tell you, sir? Megan deflected him. That his daughter has gone missing. They didn't reveal any more. Megan nodded. She was kidnapped three days back when she was visiting us. We're looking into motives, various threads. The family left our town five years back, ma'am. I'm not sure there's any connection to this town. His gray eyes rested unwaveringly on them, conveying a clear message. I might be a small town editor, however I am not dumb. Mr. Reeves, can you keep something confidential? No, ma'am. I'm a newspaper editor. We print secrets. We don't keep them. He smiled at the astonishment on their faces. There's something larger behind the kidnapping, isn't there? Megan nodded. Can I get the story direct from you ladies if I help you, and the child is found? I know the NYPD won't be of much help. Of course, sir. He told them everything that he knew, which again, wasn't new to the twins. He confirmed that Josh Cottrell was an only child. He also confirmed that the Cottrell family line was scattered all over the country. They weren't especially close. He gave them the reporter's details, the one who had covered the accident and had interviewed the witnesses. Doug's traveling in Southeast Asia. I've left several messages for him. He broke off suddenly and looked away, a faraway expression on his face. I should have thought of her, he said to himself. Who, sir? Why, Julie Peltier, of course. She taught in the local school. He smiled at the blank looks on their faces. She was their longtime neighbor. Chapter 15 Let's go to his old office first. Beth suggested when they left Reeves. It was a bright sunny day, blue skies smiled down at them, and normally the twins would have wandered on Main Street. They loved small towns, 
and browse through antique stores and boutiques in such towns whenever they got the opportunity. Maddie, and the sense that they might find some answers, chased away any inclination to dawdle. Mayo and Kane's babish office was less than a mile away from the newspapers. Megan had called ahead, and when they reached it, a man in a blue suit was waiting for them. Zach Huam, he introduced himself. I am the partner for the Southwest region. Josh Cottrell, the New York one, said you were looking into the other Cottrell's death. The babish office was small, most of their work came from the two contractors in town. Those two firms came to Babish about eight years back and changed the face of the town, he explained. They set up their facilities and brought jobs into the local economy. Along with their arrival came a heck of a lot of outsiders. Yeah, he smiled ruefully as he gestured at a couple of seats. I'm an outsider myself, originally from California. Several of the permanent residents of the town benefited from the influx. Some of them sold their homes to the newcomers, many of them rented their houses. We lived in Jackson, Wyoming, Megan explained in reply. You know how it is then. The twins did. Jackson's population swelled and ebbed with the influx and outflow of tourists. Its economy and its residents benefited from the visitors. Did anyone here know Josh Cottrell? Beth ended the pleasantries. Quam frowned, and stood up to survey the few people in the office outside his cabin. We have ten staff here, and all of them arrived after Cottrell. I myself took on this role after he died. He stuck his head out and called out to a co-worker, Jerry, anyone knew Josh Cottrell? She heard an indistinct reply. No, the Cottrell who died. Quam thanked the man, shut the door and shook his head regretfully. Nope, no one here who knows him. There was one lawyer, but he retired earlier this year and left the state. Can we have his details? Sure. Give me a second. He went out and returned with a name and a number scrawled on it. Ken Pellet. He was our senior litigation lawyer and now lives in Chicago. I will email him and tell him you might call. They thanked him and left after another half hour of learning nothing new. They were climbing inside their escalade when a shout stopped them. Quam came running and thrust another piece of paper in Beth's hand. Cottrell's manager, the one who retired. He lives in Birmingham. He knew Cottrell and his family well. He's your best bet. Cottrell's manager, Chuck Kaiser, wasn't at home when Megan called. She left a message and set out for the Cottrell's old home. The old home was behind a church and had a for sale sign on it. Megan stopped in front of the sign for Beth to note the realtor's number. Didn't Altoff say the house was now owned by another family? He did. Looks like they're selling. Megan drove 200 yards away and parked on the street, just outside the driveway of the neighboring house. It was nearly identical to the previous house and looked equally uninhabited. She walked up the drive, pressed a buzzer and waited. Beth pointed at the stack of newspapers and flyers lying on the entrance porch and mouthed silently, Peltier isn't here? Maybe she's at school, Megan whispered back. Nope. Reeves said she's retired and lives alone. They waited for a few more minutes and when the door remained stubbornly shut, circled the house. Megan tried to peer through a couple of windows, but they were too high. They were grimy and looked like they hadn't been washed in a while. Beth went to the rear of the house, which had a glass-fronted door that opened into a garden. The garden turned into lawns at each side, lawns that were shared with the neighbors. A thicket separated the neighboring house on the left, a hedge from the one on its right. She climbed a couple of steps and was preparing to knock when a dog barked. They turned at the patter of feet and presently a small dog trotted into view. It was white with black splotches on its face and was trailing a leash. It stopped a few feet away and cocked its head at Megan and then at Beth. Its tail wagged and when they didn't move it barked. Does she have a dog? Megan wondered aloud. What part of she lives alone, didn't you get? Beth snorted. Bruno? A female voice called out before Megan could reply. Bruno turned his head, barked once and turned back to the twins. 
A woman came round the thicket, spotted Bruno and chided him. There you are, you naughty boy. She spotted the twins, came to a stop and planted her hands on her hips. Who the heck are you? We came looking for Julie Peltier, ma'am, Megan replied calmly, aware that Bruno had picked up on the woman's voice and was growling softly. Julie doesn't live here anymore. Chapter 16 Megan's heart sank when she heard the woman's words. Nonetheless, she put on a smile and introduced herself and her sister. We wish to talk to her about her neighbors, the Cottrells. They've been gone a long time, the woman answered. Get back, Bruno. Bruno reluctantly turned back from sniffing their shoes and wagged his tail and looked up at her. Don't make those eyes at me. You have been very naughty. I am very angry with you. The tail wagged harder, at which the woman melted, picked him up, kissed him, and set him down. The dog barked happily and darted away in search of new distractions. Sorry, Bruno can be a handful. He is not fully trained yet. She was friendlier now, and her brown eyes beneath dark hair sized them up. What happened to the Cottrells? Their daughter has been kidnapped. There was stunned silence for a second, and then the woman's eyes widened. Bruno, she yelled, get back now. She caught Bruno's leash when he returned, and beckoned to the twins. Let's go to my house. Heidi Coat, Julie Peltier's neighbor, listened to them without interruption as she moved in her kitchen and poured them tall glasses of lemonade. Her refrigerator was adorned with pictures of her family, husband, a daughter and herself in various poses. Jake's an engineer in a defense firm, she mentioned the company's name as she followed Megan's eyes. Millie is at school. She's the same age as Maddie. We're from Little Rock, came here three years back when Jake was offered a job here. We moved in after the Cottrells had already left. Never knew them. Heidi Coat was never still, she bustled about her kitchen, setting plates right, wiping mugs, making sure everything was in its right place. She talked as she moved, told the twins their backstory, never once commenting on the Cottrell story she had just heard. Avoiding it, probably because her daughter is the same age, Megan thought. Where's Julie Peltier, ma'am? she asked, when they had heard enough of the coat story. Heidi, Heidi Coat smiled brightly. Where's your neighbor, Heidi? We would like to talk to her. Julie's in Peru. She is working with some aid organization there, building villages, providing sanitation. That kind of work. No one from that time seems to be around. Megan ran a nail around the rim of her glass and voiced her thought. I can see why you got that idea, Heidi laughed. Julie had a larger home several years back. She sold it for a nice sum when the defense companies arrived and bought the neighboring one, which was smaller. She was left with a large pot of money. It gave her freedom, and off she went to Peru. Her husband had died a long time back, her daughter was married and had moved away. There was nothing left to hold her back. That's pretty much what Quam told us about many other residents. She never returns, Heidi. We would love to talk to her. Heidi Coates slapped her forehead dramatically. There's a number for her. I forgot about it completely. She went to her refrigerator door, scanned it, and with a triumphant snap of her fingers, removed a sticky note. Go ahead, call her, she urged Megan. Beth whipped out her phone before Megan could punched in the number and turned on the speaker. The phone rang once the connection was made, with the distinctive sound of an overseas call. It rang twice and four times before it was answered. Hello? A female voice came over the static in the line. Julie, this is Heidi, Heidi Coat answered before the twins could. Hello? Julie, can you hear me? Hello, who is this? Julie, can you hear me? Bruno came running at hearing the yell and barked loudly. Heidi Coat shushed him and tried again, but it was clear Julie Peltier couldn't hear them. We'll keep trying, Heidi. Thank you for your help. Megan rose, her twin followed, and they headed to the door. Bruno barked once in parting, and then they were back in their escalade, disappointment weighing heavily on them. Beth tried Julie Peltier's number a few more times. 
Peltier didn't pick up. She called Chuck Kaiser and got his voicemail. She left a message and watched Babish disappear and the airport appear. Megan returned the rental vehicle, and it was when they were heading to the Gulf Stream that Beth's phone buzzed. She brought it out quickly and looked at it. It's a text from Chom. She turned the display for Megan to see. Any luck? No. Got some names but not able to speak to them, Beth texted back. Ask him what's happening at his end, Megan prompted. Your end? Beth texted back. The reply came back immediately. Amy Cottrell has collapsed. She's in the hospital. Chapter 17 Five days after Maddie's disappearance, the twins were with Pazaka and Chong at 1 p.p. in New York. Pazaka was leaning against a window, his shades looking out at the city below. Beth had her arms crossed and was watching Pazaka. Chong and Megan were seated opposite each other, across a white-topped desk that was scratched and worn. Chong was narrating the events. The rest of them were listening. We went to interview her again yesterday, to get a handle on this dude, who was identical in looks to Josh Cottrell. Death certificate. Benefit money. No real friends. No employment record. No driver's license. Disappearance of belongings, Pazaka spoke over his partner. To ask her about all that too, Chong said comfortably. He was used to Pazaka's interruptions. We went along with a female officer who works on child abuse cases. You know, to follow up on Maddie's comments. Get to it, Chong, Beth snapped. What happened? He sighed and rubbed his temples. She was shocked, obviously. She didn't believe anything. She said we were treating her like a suspect, instead of finding her daughter. Beth moved suddenly at that, pushed away from the wall she was leaning against and paced. She started yelling, threatened to sue the NYPD, and then she fell. One moment she was standing, shouting. The next, she was on the floor. We called an ambulance. She's now in New York City Hospital. Beth stopped her pacing and came closer to the table. How's she? She is stable. The hospital said she was undernourished, sleep-deprived, and has hypertension. They said she's heading for a heart attack. They have asked us to back off for a while. Do you think she was lying all along? Possibly. No one broke the silence for a long while and then Chong stirred. What happened in Babish? Beth told him while Chong took notes. We'll check property records in that town, see who owns their house, he said when she finished. Nothing will turn up in Babish, Pazaka's shades seemed to glow as they caught the sun when he turned towards Chong and Megan. We managed to speak to two of the dead man's cousins. One is in Chicago, in city politics. Another is in Seattle, working for a tech company. He paused a beat. No one looks like Josh Cottrell. No family member looks like the other. Megan nodded unconsciously. I was expecting something like that. Nothing about this case is straightforward. There are people who look like others. You have folks who make a living out of being doubles. That's our theory, Pazaka agreed. She probably dated men who looked like her former husband. Our computers ran a comparison on the two men, Chong broke in. They weren't conclusive. Facial recognition isn't an exact science. He rose to lead the twins out. Bottom line, John Doe is not her husband. And he's got Maddie. Lord knows why. The man who had lived with Amy Cottrell woke suddenly. He lay still on his bed for a while, listening, and then realized what had woken him. It was the distant wail of a police cruiser rising, falling, as it sped toward an emergency. The man looked at his watch. It was close to midday, on the fifth day since he had run away with the girl. He looked at the other bed and made out her shape under her blanket. A leg stuck out from underneath and twitched occasionally in response to her dreams. They had stayed awake late the previous night watching movies on TV, and when she had fallen asleep he had carried her and laid her on the bed. The man rose and padded to the bathroom silently. 
He washed his face and studied himself. Brown eyes reddened from lack of sleep. Brown hair thinning with age. Wrinkles around his eyes and mouth. He shaved, showered, and finished dressing in a clean tee and a pair of jeans. He sat at the window of their hotel room and watched the city hustle below. This isn't how I wanted it to happen. He knew things were coming to a head, but he had thought he had time. He had started making plans several months before, he had stashed cash and had new credit cards in different names. He wasn't mentally prepared though, he was thinking the time to act was further away. The phone call from a friend had alerted him that things were progressing faster than anticipated. Blind panic had set in. He had rushed to the house and had collected all his belongings. The sanitization of the house took longer, he was experienced however and had done it several times before. He had taken his stuff and stowed it in a locker he had rented a long time back. Insurance for a time such as this. He had then wandered aimlessly, subduing the sudden surges of anger. He had gone to the park and yelled in rage when he was far enough from others. His bouts of anger were periods of insanity. He became a different man when the red mist descended. He walked in the park till his blood stopped pounding, till his breathing normalized, and then he made another call. The reply sent adrenaline surging through him. He started shouting and swearing. He didn't know when he hung up and pocketed the phone. He remembered running, cutting a swift path through the park. He reached the building on Columbus Avenue and slowed to a walk, allowing his perspiration to dry. He wasn't worried about people looking at him, strangely. This was New York City. Home of Strange. He pulled the hoodie over his head, and then realized he would need a getaway vehicle. Luckily, he knew a car rental agency a block away. He ran, slowed down when he neared, and half an hour later he was driving a vehicle. He made another call and was reassured when he got the answer. He had time. He circled the block a few times and slipped into a parking space when another vehicle exited. Then came the waiting. He thought he knew what he was up against, but didn't want to make any more calls to the other person and run the risk of that person getting suspicious. He googled the firm on his phone while he waited. Security consulting. That could be a problem. But I'll wait and see who comes out. The wait became an hour, then two hours. Finally, a woman emerged. He recognized her from the firm's website. An older woman appeared, two girls in tow, and finally another woman came out, holding the hand of the girl. A cab was hailed. He drifted closer. Pulled the hoodie tighter over his head. A cab flashed its lights. He broke into a jog. It slowed and stopped. He ran. He rammed a shoulder in the woman, grabbed the girl, and then he was away to his parked vehicle. Easier than I thought. Chapter 18 The man was still in New York with the girl. He knew there would be alerts for both of them in public places. He didn't dare use the subway or any kind of public transport. He parked his vehicle in a long-term parking lot and switched cabs several times after his escape with the girl. He spoke softly to her and spun a story that it was an elaborate game they were playing on Mommy. It calmed her. He went to Brooklyn and used the identity he had been creating and checked them into a seedy motel. My daughter has always wanted to see the city, he told the uninterested clerk, who was more eager to get back to the porn magazine on his desk. The girl asked many questions. He quieted her each time. Once in their room, she started screaming and demanded she be reunited with mommy. The rage came suddenly and without warning. He smacked her bottom lightly and asked her keep quiet. He would unite her with mommy soon. The girl looked at him in shocked silence, her green eyes wide in fright, tears trickling down her face. She took great gulping sobs, threw herself on the bed, and burrowed under the blanket. He went to the window of the motel, raised its shades and peered out. It was like any other day. People went about, cocooned in their private universes, some rushing to work, many tourists, many street hawkers. 
There were no cruisers outside the motel. He didn't hear footsteps rushing up to pound their door now. Still undetected. He knew it wouldn't last, that the cops would have alerted every hotel, every house and room rental agency in the city. From the newspapers he had read and the news he had followed, the search for the girl had caught the people's imagination. It wasn't because she was a celebrity, however something about her looks and the way she had been kidnapped fueled the city's interest. I should have planned it better, however, I didn't have time. They moved faster than I thought. He looked back at the girl. She was still sleeping. He left a note for her by the bedside table, donned his jacket, pulled a ball cap low over his head and went outside. Their room was on the fourth floor. He took the stairs, avoiding as much contact with people as possible, and went to a Duane Reed and bought a packet of chewing gum. He popped one white stick in his mouth, chewed it, discreetly pulled on a pair of flesh-colored gloves and went to a payphone. He dialed a number he knew by heart. The phone rang several times without being answered. His heart pounded at the implications. Sweat beaded his forehead. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. He paced, bought a burger from a street-side vendor, bought another for the girl and thought furiously. He went to an electronics store and stood outside and watched the news flash on one of the TV screens. There were regular updates on the search. The NYPD was pursuing leads. The helpline number rolled underneath the headlines. A reporter started briefing on a train accident, and that gave him an idea. He walked a couple of blocks till he found a Best Buy and bought the cheapest laptop with cash. He went back to the motel and found the girl was still sleeping. He used a private browser, one of those that didn't share data on the internet, and researched Amtrak routes. He then looked up train schedules. He glanced at his watch. There was time. He went to the bed and shook the girl awake. We have to go. Megan and Beth didn't have any more lines to pursue. Josh Cottrell the lawyer was a dead end. General Klaus said he had impeccable references. There was nothing shady in his private life or his financial affairs. Mayo and Kane wasn't of interest in the investigation. It wasn't a crime to represent defense contractors. Amy Cottrell still wasn't talking. The man who had lived with her was a ghost. Chuck Kaiser and Julie Peltier hadn't made contact. The reporter hadn't bothered to call back. Neither had the sole surviving detective. Amy Cottrell had no social media profile. Werner hadn't detected her on dating sites. Werner had come up with 200 men who looked like the dead Josh Cottrell and was working on tracing their whereabouts. It would take time. Maddie was still missing. They went to the gym two floors below their office in the same building. They had let out that floor to the gym and in return got free access at any time. Megan sparred with a martial arts trainer while Beth took her frustration out on a punching bag. Zeb poked his head through once, watched their hands flying the intense looks on their faces and withdrew. His phone buzzed. A text from Broker. How are they doing? Frustrated. Do you need me? No. Spend time with Burke. Once we get a mission, you'll have less time with her. She's still not sure if she likes you. I know. More texts came. Bear and Chloe said they would be back in a few days. Bawana and Roger were heading back too. He put his phone away just as the twins exited the gym, wiping their faces with towels. They stopped when they saw him in the hallway. There was a look of determination on Beth's face. We're going to talk to Amy Cottrell. Chapter 19 Six days after Maddie was grabbed, Megan drove their SUV to New York City Hospital. Beth called Chong while they were driving and briefed him on their visit. Yeah, we'll let you know if we find anything. He says we might get lucky, she told her sister when the call ended. Fat chance, Megan laughed without humor. Grandma, Liz and Peaches were in Amy Cottrell's room when they entered it. Peaches launched herself with a squeal into Beth's arms, a question in her eyes. Beth smiled at her reassuringly, detached her, 
and greeted Amy Cottrell. She didn't reply, and an awkward silence fell in the room. Beth made eye contact with Grandma, who got the message, and led her wards out of the room. Ma'am, we need your help, Beth pleaded with the mother. Your husband died five years back. Who was the man living with you? Amy Cottrell kept silent. Her face was pale, her body thin beneath the hospital gown. She wasn't twisting her hands, yet the one hand that was visible twitched. They suspect me of arranging her kidnapping. Her voice was whispery when Beth kept looking at her. They the cops. Who was that man, ma'am? Why does he look like your dead husband? My daughter is my life. Why would I have her kidnapped? Beth went closer. Ma'am, who was that man who lived with you? Amy Cottrell turned her head away from them and didn't reply. She didn't speak to them again, even though they spent an hour in the room. Beth looked at her one last time as they were leaving. Amy Cottrell was still turned away, her eyes unseeing. No. She's looking at something. Beth stood on tiptoes and spotted the small picture frame that had been obstructed by Amy Cottrell's shoulder. It had Maddie's smiling face in it. Nothing. She isn't talking to us, she told Chong. She listened for a few minutes. I am not surprised, she replied. When Megan and I moved from Boston, we too didn't have any friends. It took us a long time to make some. They interviewed other parents. All of them knew the man as Josh Cottrell. She answered Megan's raised eyebrow when she had finished with Chong. An idea struck her. She called Chong again and this time turned on the speaker. Careful, Beth. My wife will think we're having an affair, Chang's dry voice came on. What happened to the money, Chong? She ignored his humor. What money? The benefit payment. It was a sizable amount, wasn't it? Keys clicked. It's still there. A large chunk of it. There are small cash withdrawals. Ten, twenty dollars, those kinds of amounts. Some grocery purchases. But most if it is still there. When was the most recent transaction? Last week. At Trader Joe's near her office. How did they fund their home? That must have cost a few million. More keys clicked. You know the first home she sold was a $10 million one. The second one went for 8 mil. Both in her first year of their move to New York. Her commissions funded the down payment? Her salary the mortgage? Beth asked him. That's right. We looked at the finances. Nothing there. No bank account for him? Nun Chong confirmed. He doesn't exist. Beth finger combed her hair when they entered their office. We can always go to every hotel and every motel in the city. Ask them if they saw Maddie and this dude. Her sister looked at her dubiously. Are you serious? What else have we got? The man was no longer in the motel. He had booked a bedroom on the Amtrak service for that afternoon and had checked out early in the day. He dressed her in a voluminous jacket, hid her blonde hair under a cap, and hurried her to Penn Station. It's an adventure. Mommy will be waiting for us at the end of it. That cheered the girl up and she hopped and skipped as she kept pace with him. He entered the busy station and waited next to a photo booth while he looked over the concourse. There were cops. There were a couple of K-9s. None of them seemed to be searching for anything or anyone in particular. He took a deep breath, grabbed the girl's hand, and hurried to their platform without looking left or right. Two passengers hurrying to catch their train. No one gave them a second glance. He greeted the train attendant, helped the girl board the coach, and guided her to their bedroom. He shut the door once they were safely inside and released his breath. The girl was excited. She hopped and bounced on her seat. She explored the bedroom in delight and made to open the door and check the outside. He stopped her. There's enough time for that. Let the train start. The train started and something loosened inside him. The next part is the riskiest. 
They reached their destination early the next morning. He woke the girl up, bundled their luggage and helped her down the portable steps onto the platform. It was deserted, they were the only two passengers in the station. The girl looked up and down, yawned and asked, Where's mommy? She'll be here soon. He waited for the train to leave and then got the girl to do his bidding. Seven days from Maddie's disappearance, the message blinked on the twins' phones, waiting to be seen. The twins were on their early morning run in Central Park, and neither of them carried their phones. Megan got the first inkling that something was wrong when her sister pounded her door and yelled loudly at 7 a.m. For Christ's sakes, she flung open the door, you'll wake the neighborhood. Beth brushed past her, entering her apartment, and hunted for Megan's phone. She spied it in her charging cradle. She grabbed it and tossed it to Megan. Megan caught it, what? She sat heavily on a couch and stared at her cell phone. Madison Cottrell smiled back at her. Chapter 20 You need to get here. Pronto, Beth told Chong. She cut off his protests. Yeah, I know it's 7.30 a.m., and you're gulping your cereal in one pp. However, you and your partner need to get your asses here. Now? She tossed her phone at her desk and looked at her twin. Megan still wore a shell-shocked expression. She was still looking at her phone, not touching it, as if it would explode. Beth groaned in exasperation and snapped her fingers in her sister's face. Wake up. Get over it. Start working. She went to the kitchen, brewed two cups of coffee and when she had returned, Megan was alert. Identical messages, she asked Beth after taking a grateful sip. Yes. She dialed the number, held the phone to her ear and grimaced immediately. It's dead. Probably sent from a burner phone. The SIM card's trashed. She stared at the picture again, as if it could tell a story. How did he or whoever sent that get our numbers? Beth frowned. That's one part of the puzzle. However, have you looked at that picture properly? Megan connected her phone to Werner and transferred the image to her computer. She brought it up on the larger screen and sucked in her breath when she saw it in greater detail. Where the heck is Takoa? Pazaka paced their office. Chong and he had reached the Columbus Avenue office in the shortest time ever taken by the NYPD, according to Chong. They had hurried up, and as soon as they had stepped out of the elevator and taken a step, Beth had hit them with the picture. Maddie was posed on a train station platform with the building behind her. It seemed to be a wooden frame structure, its walls yellow with a red brick skirting at the bottom. Its sloping roof was tiled. Behind Maddie's smiling face beyond her right shoulder, a signboard was visible. It had blue lettering on white and a distinctive logo on the left. It had been defaced by graffiti, however the name was legible. The board read Tekoa, Ga. It's in Georgia, obviously, Chong wore a bemused expression on his face as he watched his partner pace. Chong was relaxed, sprawled on a couch, a coffee mug in his hand. It was the twins' office. They would do the work for a change. A NYPD cop needed to grab his rest wherever he could find it. It's northeast of Atlanta. Ninety miles from it. About 8,000 people. In Stevens County. Beth read from a screen. When was the photograph sent? Pazaka again. Still pacing. Shades glaring at nothing in particular. We got it at 6.45 a.m. We saw it at 7.15. We called you at 7.30. Pazaka glanced involuntarily at Mickey Mouse. 8.30. When was it taken? Who sent it? The who is easy. From a throwaway phone. Werner is working on it. The when is more difficult. Megan this time, curling a tendril of hair behind her ear. She was at another screen, giving instructions to the supercomputer. Werner will try some algorithms. Send it to. Done, Beth interrupted Pazaka. I have forwarded the message to your team. 
Chong wriggled on the couch and settled more comfortably. Maybe we should move here, he directed a hopeful glance at his partner. The shades turned on him. What are you doing? Watching you at work. Very inspiring. Werner came back with an approximate time. It had looked up light readings in Tokoa, compared the light in the photograph and checked out angles, distances, brightness, and presented a time. 6.30 a.m. When? Pazaka stopped pacing for the first time. No clue. Beth curbed her irritation at the cop's staccato questioning. It's the first break we have. All of us are buzzing. Cut him some slack. The SIM card was bought at a Best Buy in New York two days ago. Megan called out and ratcheted the buzz further. Who bought it? Werner's got the where. For the who, it'll have to hack their system. Chong burst into a coughing fit and when he had finished he sat straight, wiped his face and wheezed. No hacking. We're New York's finest. We can get the details. He spoke softly in his cell phone, and when he had finished, Megan had a further update. There's an Amtrak train, the Crescent, that arrives to Koa at 6.15 a.m. Every day service. It originates from Penn Station. New Orleans is last stop. Check. On to it. Chong spoke in his phone again, giving further instructions. A team of cops would check out ticket purchases, would look up CCTV images at Penn. Beth looked up a number, dialed it, and put the phone on speaker. It rang several times and then a voice came on. This is Tacoa Police Department. If you have an emergency. Beth hung up. We do have an emergency. Megan raised her head from her screen. Something in her voice made them look at her. She turned the screen toward them, highlighted a section of the photograph, and enlarged it. It was a newspaper on a bench behind Maddie, a local one. She enlarged the newspaper. Today. The photograph was taken today. No other trains to or from Tacoa, other than the Crescent. Beth was rising even before she had finished. She grabbed her jacket, tossed Megan's to her, and by the time they reached the elevator, the cops were behind them. No other trains meant the chances were high, that Maddie was either in or near Tacoa. Fifteen minutes later they were speeding toward JFK where their Gulfstream was, Chong and Pazaka busy on their phones. Beth waited for the cops to finish and then asked a question which stumped them all. Why send it to us? Chapter 21 It was 11 a.m. on the seventh day of Maddie's kidnapping when their Gulfstream parted company with Earth. Pazaka and Chong had been on their phones constantly on the drive to the airport, talking to their team, calling the Tacoa PD and the sheriff's office in Stevens County. Progress had been made when the aircraft reached cruising height. The Tacoa police chief would put up police tape around the signboard to prevent tampering of any evidence. The name board would be dusted for fingerprints and checked for DNA, as would the immediate surrounding area. We don't have John Does prints on record, Chong objected to Pazaka's report. Pazaka brushed that off by lifting a shoulder. They would cross that bridge when they came to it. Finding prints was the first priority. Chong leaned back in his leather seat took an appreciative sip of the juice Beth had handed out from the onboard kitchen. He took in the luxurious appointment of the aircraft, turned to his partner and tried again. I could get used to this. Why don't we get seconded to Beth and Megan? Pazaka's baleful stare brought him back to business. Good news is that we trace the phone's purchase. Bought at another Best Buy on the same day as the SIM card. He mentioned two stores in Queens. Nowhere near the law firm or Amy Cottrell's house. Who, Megan burst out. Who is unknown? Buyer paid in cash. No store cameras captured him. Three pairs of eyes sharpened when he continued. I have better news. We triangulated the location of the phone when the message was sent. The phone was in the vicinity of Tacoa. He let the suspense build and ducked when Beth threw a cushion at him. This morning. It came online at 6 a.m. Where is it now? 
Chong shook his head regretfully. It's disappeared again. Silence fell, broken by a sound, a sharply drawn breath by Megan. She turned her screen around to her sister and the cops. On it was an image of a man and a girl, their backs to the camera. They were heading to a train, to their left. Werner got this from the cameras in Penn Station. Heights matched those of John Doe and Maddie. The timestamp on the image, 1.45 p.m. on the previous day, prompted the cops to pull their phones and make another round of calls. Megan held up three fingers. Ticket counter staff. Train personnel. Station staff. Chong got what she meant. All those people needed to be interviewed and instructed by his detectives. He nodded without breaking off from the messages he was relaying. More time passed. Sunlight streamed through the Gulfstream's windows and turned Pazaka's shades to gold. His phone rang. He listened, thanked the caller and hung up. His sunglasses turned toward Megan and Beth. No man and daughter on the crescent. A viewliner bedroom is empty. It had a man and a young girl. No one saw the man well enough to describe him. Girl resembles Madison Cottrell. Megan turned back to her screen, electrified. No sighting on the train meant the pair could still be in the town. Or they could have rented a getaway vehicle. She commanded Werner to talk to various databases and check rental vehicles. To her left she heard Chong whisper into his phone. He was relaying near-identical instructions to the Tacoa PD. The Gulf Stream was scything through air, sky, and cloud when she finished typing. Far below, she could see the browns and greens of the planet as it rotated, as it had for billions of years. Hang on, Maddie. We're close. It was 2 p.m. when they landed on the Seoul runway at Tacoa Airport. Bright sunshine and heat fueled their urgency as they taxied, disembarked, and headed out of the small building that made up the terminal. A man with limp hair was lounging against a black Tahoe. He straightened when he spotted Megan and strode swiftly to her. He handed her the Tahoe's keys and walked away without a single word to a waiting Toyota. Megan felt the cop's bemused eyes on her. She didn't explain. She climbed into the driver's seat, fired up the vehicle, and rolled out when the rest of them had been seated. Zeb had similar vehicles in major cities across the country as well as in several international cities. The vehicles were stored and maintained in auto garages that were owned by ex-military men, all of them vetted by Zeb and Broker. Each vehicle was reinforced with Kevlar, had armor glass windows, run flat tires, and had several other defense and offense capabilities. A driver from the nearest auto garage delivered an SUV to the point of use and collected it after a mission. The garage serviced the vehicle, repaired any wear and tear, and kept it ready for the next mission. Megan lit her turn signal and turned right on East Tugalo Street, and seven minutes later drew up in front of Tacoa Station. She hopped out and opened the doors for Pazaka and Chong. No need for them to know there is an arsenal under their feet, beneath the floorboards. A uniformed police officer stepped out from the station and walked towards them. Roy Pickett, his nameplate read Police Chief. He was short, stocky, and sweating. His eyes were sharp as they took in Megan. They lingered for a second on Beth and then glanced over to the cops. Pickett shook their hands and drew a finger across his forehead. It gleamed with sweat. They aren't here. They have disappeared. Chapter 22 Pickett's officers had searched the station and the surroundings thoroughly. There was no trace of John Doe or Maddie. They had interviewed all the car rental agencies in Tacoa. No one matched John Doe's description. They had even spoken to several store owners on Main Street. Madison Cottrell hadn't been seen in town. His officers had finished dusting the signboard and the bench where the newspaper had been lying. They would analyze it for results and inform the NYPD. The newspaper was in his custody, and it too would be dusted. No one had boarded the train that day. His men were still working on who else had disembarked. He waited after he had finished briefing them, the sun beating down on them relentlessly as if mocking their wasted flight. 
The train depot, its yellow and red structure immediately recognizable from the photo, looked empty and forlorn. No other person was visible but for Pickett and a few of his officers. Two police cruisers and the Tahoe were the only vehicles in the lot in front of the station. There's a ticket agent in the station. He didn't see any man or a girl. He wiped his forehead with the palm of a hand and dried it against a trouser leg. The station doesn't get much traffic. It has one service in a day, and it's not as if Tokoa is a large commercial hub, he said with a small smile. They were here. His smile grew larger when the twins looked at him in sudden interest. The station is also home to the Kurahi Military Museum. It's usually closed that time of the morning, however a caretaker had arrived early today. He broke off when Beth ran to the building, Megan close behind her. The caretaker was in his late fifties and had moon-faced spectacles on his face. His eyes were bright behind them and regarded the twins in wonder. You both are genuine twins? Identical, not genuine, Megan corrected him mentally. Yes, sir. Call me Bob, the caretaker flashed a gap-toothed grin, visibly pleased at the attention he was receiving. Yes, he had seen a girl. She was peering through a window when he had approached from the side of the building. I'm waiting for my mommy, she replied when Bob had questioned her, concerned that she seemed to be alone. No, she wasn't alone. Daddy had gone to make a phone call. Bob hung around for a few minutes waiting for Daddy to turn up, however, he had things to do, stuff to be put away. The girl was nowhere to be seen when he returned half an hour later. Neither was anyone who looked like a daddy. The ticket agent hadn't seen her when Bob asked him. Bob shrugged his shoulders and went back to work figuring Mommy had collected Daddy and the little girl and had driven away. Megan looked at the roof of the station, excused herself and ran around the building. No security cameras, she asked when she returned. No cameras, ma'am. She looked over to Pazaka and Chong. The NYPD cops were with Pickett, who was showing them the likely spot where Maddie had been photographed. Chong felt her gaze and shook his head imperceptibly. Nothing more to be seen. She and Beth went inside the cool interior of the station and spoke to the ticket agent. He was as old as Bob, his brown eyes smiling at their approach. It's the most excitement I have had in many years, he greeted them and introduced himself. He kept shaking his head, the smile fading from his face as Megan peppered him with questions. I'm sorry, ma'am. I wish I could help, but I didn't see anything. I told Roy the same. Megan stood in the station's shade and watched her sister join the cops. She forced despair away, breathed deeply, and looked at the blue sky in the distance. Where are you, Maddie? The man and Maddie were still in Tokoa. The man knew his message would trigger a manhunt and the local police would be roped in. He also knew the cops would question car rental agencies and hotels. He had given thought to their escape from the station and had hit upon a plan. It needed a stroke of luck. He got lucky. He had hung around the station when the train had departed, his phone to his ear, when he saw the old lady emerge from a restroom. She made her way slowly to a pickup truck in the station's yard. He approached her, smiled ruefully, and spun a story about his cell phone dying on him. That his wife was waiting for them at the elementary school to check it out for their daughter. They were from Atlanta and would be moving to Tacoa because of his job. His wife had driven a day earlier, and if his phone hadn't died, she would be waiting for them at the station. The old lady was happy to drive them to the school, and it was there that he and the girl spent the day. While the cops search for us everywhere else. He's mocking us. He's taking us on a wild goose chase, Beth said quietly. Megan following Pickett as he reversed and rolled out of the station, didn't reply, though she agreed with her sister. Pazaka or Chong didn't refute Beth's comment. There was no other reason for the message to be sent. Megan cut her eyes to her sister. Beth was stony-faced, her eyes expressionless. We still don't know how he got our numbers, but that's part of his taunt. 
They had traveled less than a hundred yards when Megan slammed the brakes suddenly. Jesus, Beth yelled and braced herself with a hand. What happened? The signboard. The graffiti on it. Chapter 23 Megan reversed her Tahoe and drove back to the station's yard. She looked up once in the mirror and saw Pickett's taillights flare, and simultaneously Beth's phone buzzed. She hopped out, heard her twin say some harebrained idea, and then she was away running to the signboard. She stopped when she was a few feet away and stared at it. The graffiti was still there. A crunch of tires on gravel announced the police chief's arrival. Doors slammed, voices murmured, and the rest of them joined her. You found Maddie? Chong smirked when he followed her gaze and saw nothing but the signboard. What do you see? Megan challenged him. Chong frowned. Nothing. A signboard. We have been looking at it all day. A door opened and closed and more footsteps came their way. The ticket agent. What's up, chief? Megan turned to him. Sir, how old is this graffiti? The clerk squinted at the board, scratched his head and shook his head in disbelief. Who the heck did that? He raised his hands helplessly and turned to them. I never saw that before. It wasn't there yesterday. Megan smiled triumphantly. That's John does work. The graffiti was meaningless. A red squiggle on each corner of the board, on top of the lettering. A red slash next to an O. The board now read to CCOA. That makes no sense, Pickett frowned. Why didn't we notice it before? Pazaka glared at Chong and the twins, as if they were responsible for his not spotting the red markings. We are inured to graffiti, Megan replied. We are so used to seeing it around us that we just turn a blind eye. What made you return? Something that Chief Pickett said. That this is a small town. You don't see much street art or disfiguring in such places. You're right, the chief agreed with her. I still don't know what that marking means though. They all turned to the sign and studied it in silence. No clues came to them. Those squiggles could be anything. That slash? Beth shrugged in resignation. I bet the paint comes from a spray can that you can buy in any hardware or paint store, Chong grumped sourly. How do we know John Doe did that? Pazaka demanded, mopping sweat from his face. Sweat wasn't good. It spoiled his profile. Buddy, we live in New York. A street artist wouldn't stop at a few lines. Our mystery man did that. It must mean something. It does. To him. Megan's right. He's mocking us. They flew back to New York in the evening, after spending more time with Pickett in his office. His officers had spoken to hardware stores in the town. None of them had reported recent sales of spray cans. There were very few people in town who were known troublemakers. All of them had ironclad alibis. None of them had been in the station's vicinity. They didn't disfigure the signboard. Zeb was waiting for them at JFK. His shades clashed with Pazakas. Neither of them greeted the other. Anything? Zeb asked Megan. She pulled out her phone and showed the marking to him. That means something? Not at the moment. He drove them back silently, and when he was nearing 1pp Chang's phone buzzed. His listened, grunting and uh ewing now and then. His lips were tight, his face was pale when he hung up. Amy Cottrell is in critical care. The man left the school with several leaflets, the girl gripping his free hand tightly. She had asked for mommy several times, he had to spin another story, that mommy was selling a big house and had to cancel her trip. The girl asked if they were moving to Tacoa. She liked the school, but didn't want to leave New York. She didn't want to leave Peaches and Lizzie. He took her to a Dairy Queen to stem her questions. That distracted her, and while she was licking a royal blizzard, he pulled out another burner phone and called to get a new rental vehicle, a pickup truck. They will be looking for sedans, family cars or SUVs. The rental agency was 15 minutes away, it posed a problem. 
He wanted to minimize their street time. He told the girl to stay put, he would be back soon. He told the teenager behind the counter to keep an eye on her. The teenager nodded and pocketed the five that the man slipped to him. The girl was on her second royal blizzard when he returned in the white truck. Mike gave it to me, she smiled at him. Mike behind the counter shrugged. She asked man. What was I supposed to do? The man paid for it, grabbed the girl, thanked Mike and hustled her to the truck. Two hours later they were in Atlanta. Four hours later, when it was well past the girl's bedtime, they were back in New York. The ball is in the NYPD's court. Chapter 24 Chuck Kaiser parked his pickup truck in the garage of his house in Highland Park in Birmingham, stepped out and stretched. He had spent the last couple of weeks camping and hiking in the Sipsi Wilderness area. 25,000 acres of forests, woodland and waterfalls, just a few hours away from Birmingham, made it the ideal getaway place for Kaiser. He wiped his boots on the doormat and entered his home through the door in the garage that opened into a storeroom off the kitchen. The house was silent. It would be, Kaiser was single. His wife had died eight years back, his kids, a son and a daughter, were both married and lived in California. He turned on the lights, brushed his sparse gray hair and went upstairs to shower. A light dinner, some mindless TV, and he was ready for bed. He was on the stairs when the blinking red light on his phone in the living room caught his attention. Messages He pressed the button and listened. The first one was from a cold caller. He erased it. So was the next. He erased that one too. The next three messages were from other cold callers or local stores offering the latest and greatest deal in the land. There was a message from Chuck, his neighbor, checking if he was back. The last two messages gave him pause. He listened to the first one and erased it. No other action was needed. The second message was from some lady in New York, asking about someone from his past. Kaiser had a past that very few knew of. He had served in the army, had done stuff that not even his wife had known about. He noted the woman's number, thought for a few minutes, and then punched the numbers. The phone in Megan's hand rang. They were still in the SUV. Zeb was still driving. They had dropped Pazaka and Chong at 1 pp and were heading to the twins' apartments on Columbus Avenue. The phone connected to the SUV's Bluetooth system, and its ringing sounded loudly in the interior. She didn't recognize the number, however, they were expecting several calls. She punched a button and accepted the call. Megan Peterson A pause. Ma'am, my name is Chuck Kaiser. You left a message for me some time back. Kaiser's voice was deep, quiet, and without inflection. Kaiser, Cottrell's boss in Babish. Thank you for calling back, Mr. Kaiser. This is about Josh Cottrell. I believe he worked with you. A long time back, ma'am. He died in an accident. What's your interest in him? Megan hesitated, looked at Zeb and Beth. They both shrugged. Go ahead. Tell him. She told Kaiser about Mystery Man and Maddie. The line fell silent while Kaiser digested her story. Are you there, Mr. Kaiser? Yes, sorry. That's a whammy. I don't know what to tell you, ma'am. Josh died. I saw his body. I attended his funeral. Whoever that man is, he isn't Josh Cottrell. Kaiser hung up after the call had finished and went to his bedroom. He opened his wardrobe, moved clothes on a hanger and pressed a hinge. The small door clicked open to reveal a safe. Kaiser extracted a box from the safe and removed a handgun, a Glock 22. It had one round in the chamber, its magazine had 15 rounds. It was ready to go. It always was. Three days passed with no major developments. The twins investigated any connection Amy Cottrell had with Tacoa. There was none. There was no record of her spending any time there or ever visiting it. Mayo and Kane had no presence there. 
The town was too small for Amy Cottrell's real estate firm to have an office in. Werner came back with addresses for the 200 Josh Cottrell lookalikes, and the twins were tracking them, calling them when contact was made, verifying them and then striking them off the list. They were not even halfway through. It increasingly looked like none of those on the list could have been John Doe. Still they had to try and go through all the names. Chong and Pazaka had tried interviewing Amy Cottrell again. They said they had news on Maddie's disappearance. The mother wasn't interested, whatever the news was. You can meet her when her daughter is along with you, the hospital's receptionist made no attempt to conceal her glee when relaying the snub. The hotline had no Maddie sightings. The cameras at Penn Station didn't show any more images of John Doe or Maddie. No staff on the station or the train recollected them. Picket from Tacoa called. A man resembling John Doe, had rented a pickup truck the day of their visit to the town. He fooled us. He and the girl were right there in the town. You won't believe where they were hiding. Beth gritted her teeth and willed the police chief to continue. He was in the elementary school. He said he was moving to the town and wanted to check out the school. Where's the truck now? It was found in Birmingham. In a car wash's parking lot. Vacuumed, washed, and cleaned. No DNA evidence. The trail died there? Yes, ma'am. He could be anywhere, Beth scowled at her sister when the call ended. With Maddie. She stopped Megan before the inevitable why passed her sister's lips. Has Werner got anything more on to CCOA? No, Megan replied. Beth slapped the computer screen with the flat of her palm. The world's best supercomputer, and it can't find anything. Werner shrugged electronically. Slapping it didn't achieve anything. But humans didn't get that, did they? Chapter 25 Amy Cottrell is my best closer. You know that house on Madison Avenue, the one with the Grecian columns? Megan and Beth shook their heads, struck dumb by the speaker's forcefulness. They were in the Midtown office of Carrie Landsman, where Amy Cottrell worked, on the eleventh day since the kidnapping. The firm was named after its founder who sat opposite the twins, dressed in a pale green outfit that shimmered as she moved. Landsman was in her late fifties, but a strict dietary regime, the best beauticians money could buy, and artful plastic surgeons made her look forty. Her pale blonde hair kept falling over a brow. A practice flick tossed the curl back to top of her head. In an elegantly manicured hand, she held an electronic cigarette and delicately puffed away at it. Red nails painted the air. You don't know where it is. There was no sneer in her voice, just a statement that landsmen moved in rarefied social circles. Amy sold it. In one week. For the asking price. This girl comes out of some town Lord knows where and outsells my ace closers. The cigarette came to within an inch of Megan's face. I want her back. You folks are harassing her. You need to back off. Stand down. Call off your dogs. Pazaka and Chong had interviewed Landsman the day after the kidnapping. They had come back with just one fact. That Amy Cottrell worked there. Chong had rolled his eyes dramatically when describing her. I would rather feed the lions than meet her again. Carrie Landsman was a socialite who had turned to selling luxury homes in the city a decade back. She knew everyone. More importantly, everyone who mattered knew her. She had lost a husband to cancer. A daughter to a traffic accident. She had never married again and was frequently featured in celebrity shows and gossip columns. Talking to Landsman had been way down on the twins' to-do list. However, a flunky had called them the day before. A saccharine voice had whispered over the phone, Ms. Landsman wants you to meet her. Megan and Beth had chuckled at the exec's choice of words. Her assistant didn't get the words wrong. I am surprised we didn't have to bow and kiss her hand. Megan suppressed a smile and put a serious expression on her face. It's not in our hands, ma'am. The case is quite complicated. Landsman leaned forward in irritation, 
picked a tiny bell and rang it. Wow, a real silver bell? The exec rushed in on high heels and a short skirt. Green tea, her boss commanded, and the exec disappeared. Honey, Landsman turned her attention back to Megan. Amy sold more houses for me in the last five years than all my other closers put together. She waited for Megan or Beth to reply. Neither of them did. You know what that means? My business, my reputation is sinking while you and the cops are playing detective. An angry puff of smoke forestalled Beth's retort. Carrie Landsman sells to billionaires. Hollywood stars. A-listers. They want to deal with Amy Cottrell alone. What am I to tell them? That some little investigation is keeping her away? I puff. Want. Puff. Her. Puff. Back. Green tea arrived and with it the torrent of words stopped. The exec poured for Megan and Beth in delicate ceramic cups that the twins held gingerly in their hands and sipped from. No need to ask us what drink we want. What's good for Carrie Landsman is good enough for us. Ma'am, Megan placed her cup down. Cool eyes flicked in her direction. A plume of smoke rose delicately from red lips. Sipping and smoking. The socialite turned luxury realtor could do both at the same time. Was Amy Cottrell happy? A frown marred the smooth porcelain forehead. What's that got to do with selling homes? Megan looked at her steadily. Shall we drop this charade? We don't give a damn about your business. None of this, she let her eyes roam around the exquisitely appointed office, impresses us. Madison Cottrell is out there. We have to find her. That's all that matters, Beth leaned forward, her eyes burning with a fierce intensity. Carrie Landsman didn't move for several seconds. She didn't speak. She watched the twins through narrow eyes, through a haze of smoke that lazily swirled toward the ceiling. She moved when the silence became unbearable. She placed the electronic cigarette on a tray, her expression still unreadable. You aren't from New York, are you? Wyoming, ma'am. Jackson Hole, Megan replied. A smile broke out on the older woman's face. This time it warmed her eyes. I am a Cheyenne girl myself. Married well. That was my lucky break. The rest I earned. She broke off and looked at them appraising L.Y. Peterson's. There was something about a shooting rampage in a college. One sister lost her memory. Their dad. That's us, ma'am. I hope she doesn't shower us with pity. We can do without that. Carrie Landsman didn't do pity. She rose, went to a side table and poured coffees from a silver flask and served them herself. I lost my daughter, my husband. They were my life. I know something about loss. The facade, the larger-than-life persona, disappeared. The real Carrie Landsman was an intelligent woman who spoke about moving to a large city, living a life she had never experienced. She talked about building the high-profile real estate firm on her own. She spoke about Amy Cottrell in glowing terms. Cottrell had applied for a job in her firm when she had arrived in New York. Landsman had been impressed with her grit and saw herself in the younger woman. How bad does it look for her, she asked the twins. She's making it bad, ma'am, Megan broke it down to the realtor. If she only spoke freely. Told us who that man was, we might get somewhere. Landsman stopped them when they were leaving. I met him a couple of times. Partner. That's how she introduced him. She looked searchingly at the twins. She wasn't happy. Chapter 26 The man and the girl were in Queens, in another motel. By now the girl knew something was wrong. She had started questioning the man more often. What they were doing? When would they unite with mommy? When could she go back to school? The day after their return to the city, his patience snapped. The rage bubbled over. He took a half step and checked himself quickly. Too late. The girl saw it. Recognized it for what it was. She didn't question him again. 
she spoke to him less frequently. The man called the hotline a few times and tried to get information on the investigation. He consumed newspapers and media reports. By all accounts, it looked like the investigation had stalled. He allowed himself a brief smile. He would change that. He had to cajole the girl for his next move. He took her to Soho, to the Dominique Ansel Bakery, treated her to cookie shots and bought a bag full of cronuts. That brought back the skip in her step. She started regarding their getaway as one big adventure. She would have stories to tell when she returned to school. He didn't correct her. He logged onto an auction site, tracked down a burner phone and a prepaid SIM card, met the seller in Times Square, and bought the two items off him. Auction sites were made for anonymous purchases. On the tenth day of grabbing her, he made her do the tasks. On the eleventh day, he woke her up early and dressed her in baggy clothing. He wore shades and turned the collars up on his jacket, even though it promised to be a hot day. He took her to Penn Station and bought round-trip tickets to Greenport. He caught the Long Island Railroad service to Rinconcoma, where they transferred, and three hours later were in Greenport. Baldy, whose name was Pike de Young, hadn't forgotten that he had been bested by a woman. His buddies joshed him about it frequently. It came up when they went to a bar, and a few beers went down their throats. Pike was a construction worker, working on a midtown hotel project. He fancied himself as an amateur boxer, and when he finished his work, changed from his helmet and coveralls, and went to a boxing gym on East 26th Street. There, he pounded the punching bag till his rage and humiliation drained away. It started again the next day though, when some co-worker reminded him of the ease with which the woman had floored him. A week after his humiliation, Pike saw her. She was emerging from a building, opposite his project. He was on the same side of the street as she, not more than ten feet from her, biting deep into a burger. It was his lunch break. He was alone, having had enough of his buddies. He did a double take, his mouth half open, yeah, it was her. He wouldn't forget that brown hair and green eyes. Was it really her, though? Or the twin? He observed her for a few moments. Nope. It was her. She had a quiet swagger about her that her sister didn't have. He shielded himself behind a bunch of camera-clicking tourists and watched her. She spoke on her cell, pocketed it, looked at the building she had come from, looked right, then pulled on a pair of shades and the green eyes disappeared behind the dark lenses. She didn't look in his direction, she turned her back on him and walked away. Pike followed. He didn't know why. He just did. The tourists ambled away chattering in a language Pike didn't understand. The sidewalk was empty. There was a line of parked cars, all empty. It felt like they were the only two people on that strip of concrete. Pike took another bite. Looked behind him. No one near him. No one who could recognize him. Ahead of him was the woman. Far ahead were people, but not close enough to intervene. He looked up. No cameras on the buildings. No cameras on top of lamp poles. He didn't think. He broke into a run. He would ram his shoulder into her, cross the street, and disappear. Just a reminder to her that she couldn't mess with him. Megan had spotted the sudden move on her left from the corner of her eye. She looked to her right casually, in the direction Beth had gone. Beth had exited Carrie Landsman's office earlier to meet Mark Feinberg, her boyfriend. Mark was a detective in the NYPD and had recently returned from Miami, where he had been following leads on a case. Megan wore her sunglasses and in the same motion, flicked a switch in a stem. The shades turned into a counter-surveillance device. The stems of the shades were fitted with nano cameras that projected the rear view onto the lenses, in high definition. There he is. The same guy who attacked me. What does he want? Her question was answered when Baldy threw his burger in a trash can, wiped his hands against his coveralls, and followed her. Surely he isn't stupid enough to attack again? To the left of her was an almost unbroken line of vehicles. 
To her right were the fronts of buildings. He's going to assault me in broad daylight? She lengthened her stride by a fraction and got her answer. Baldy ran at her. Chapter 27 She let him approach, without giving any indication that she had spotted him. He came fast, his face intent, his lips pulled back. She pulled out her cell again and pretended to talk. That would fill him with confidence that she was distracted. Ten feet. Seven feet. Three feet. His hands reached out for her. She took a sidestep, the cell flying and smashing on concrete. Her left hand grabbed his right. Her left leg kicked out his right. She pivoted on her right heel, used his momentum against him, and sent him flying towards a gray wall. Baldy crashed into it heavily. He groaned once. However, he recovered swiftly. He turned, his lips bleeding, his eyes small and mean. He bent into a crouch, his hands going up in a boxer's stance, and he shuffled forward. He threw a punch in the air. It didn't reach her. Dummy. He followed with a fast left. Very fast. She swayed back. Float. Don't rush. Zeb had drilled it in them till it became habit. Floating that smooth languid move he had gave one control. Allowed one to think. He had taught them to slow time down, to feel the attack coming, to read it in the opponent's eyes and body, long before the attacker's thought turned to action. Baldy took one more step forward, and his fists shot out in a blur. Left. Right. A hook. She evaded all with ease. A shout came from far behind them. It triggered another flurry of jabs from Baldy. He can't afford to be caught. He has to finish it fast. More yells came, footsteps pounded. Finish it. Baldy crowded her against a vehicle, his eyes wide in triumph, a right hook sailing her away, a left jab preventing any escape. She slid down. She folded her legs and vanished beneath the hook. Ducked her head to let the jab whistle past. Her right hand blurred, her spear finger strike buried deep in Baldy's gut. His breath left him in a whoosh. Her right hand continued moving. It bent. Her elbow gouged Baldy's meaty thigh. She slid out smoothly from underneath him. She rose and before he could turn, grabbed his head and slammed it against the vehicle's window. The vehicle's alarm blared. Footsteps came closer, and suddenly there was a bunch of people surrounding them. Megan stepped back, let another man approach Baldy and turn him. Blood ran down his face. His forehead was cut. His nose seemed to be broken. His eyes were half closed. I saw what happened. A short woman stepped forward, her eyes wide in excitement, her shopping bag swinging in one hand. I shouted at her to warn her, but I was too far away. You all right, honey? She reached into a bag and pulled out a bottle of water. Here, drink it. I never saw anything like it. The way you took him down. She held her phone up. I got it all here, honey. He attacked you with no warning. That'll shut him up. And the cops if they hassle you. The cops came, two cruisers rolled up and from one Beth emerged, followed by a tall lean young man. Mark Feinberg. Beth looked anxiously at Megan. Megan winked back. I'm fine, she mouthed. She took another step back letting the cops do whatever they had to. Onlookers crowded the police, eager to give their statements. The short woman grabbed Mark's arm, spoke at length, her hands gesticulating. He took her phone and gave it to another cop. Another cruiser arrived, more police joined the scene. Witnesses were interviewed. Megan's statement was taken. She told the police about the previous attack. The shopper's phone recording told its own story. Baldy was led away, and the crowd started dispersing. A few cameras clicked. Tourists. They would have stories to tell. It happened in New York. They had ringside seats. All but one cruiser departed. Mark came to Megan and hugged her. When we heard about it, Beth asked me to call an ambulance. 
for him. He grinned when Megan punched him in the arm. Blue something? Beth asked when Megan looked behind her at the pavement. My phone. I tossed it away when I saw him coming. The phone was beyond repair. They collected the pieces, crushed the SIM card and trashed it. You didn't miss much, Beth pulled her cell out. Pazaka and Chong haven't. Her voice stilled. Her face whitened. She turned the screen for Megan and Mark to see better. On it was a video. She played it. A girl, Maddie, was doing math problems in a book, speaking aloud. Subtracting and dividing numbers. Chapter 28 What does it mean? Beth had asked the question several times before. That didn't stop her from asking it again. She ran her fingers through her hair in frustration as she paced their office. Pazaka was staring out of a window, Chong was looking moodily at the video on a screen, Megan sat at Werner's keyboard while Zeb was sprawled on a couch. None of them had any answers for her. She had forwarded the video to the two cops, who had arrived at the twins' offices later in the day. They came bearing news that Pike de Young had acted on his own. Megan barely acknowledged it, she had suspected as much. The twins had set Werner on the video before the cops arrived. Werner didn't come back with much. The message had been sent from Greenport from another burner phone that was now inactive. Werner didn't find any matches for Maddie or John Doe from security cameras in the subway system. From its resolution, the video was taken on a cheap phone. Its number was dead. Werner looked at angles at the room Maddie was in and compared it to millions of other images at its disposal. It didn't return with any Eureka message. Maddie could have been in a hotel. She could just as well be in a suburban home. The book she was writing in was a ruled notebook. Such books were available at any Staples outlet or from any big box store. Werner looked at lighting and shadows in the room. It couldn't detect if there was anyone else in the room. It analyzed Maddie's voice. It seemed to be normal. She seemed to be happy. Pazaka and Chong didn't have any better news. The NYPD's police laboratory was still analyzing the video, their initial findings corroborated Werner's. Detectives were canvassing Greenport and various stations in the Long Island Rail Network. There was no encouraging news to report. Maybe the video is old. From a collection they had at home, a lazy voice called out from the couch. Zebs. They still assumed it was John Doe who had kidnapped Maddie. No one else had stepped forward to claim the kidnapping. No other suspects had emerged, neither had any ransom note been received. How would John Doe have access to videos in their home? Megan balled a sheet of paper and threw it at the sprawled figure in frustration. No idea. You should ask her. Pazaka and Chong have tried. Try harder. They went to ask, Zeb playing driver again in their usual formation. Megan at the front, Beth behind, the two cops in the rear. Chong called ahead and made arrangements with the hospital. The hospital said Amy Cottrell wasn't receiving visitors, and it most certainly did not want to talk to the cops. Chong threatened and pleaded, and finally when he had no choice, he told about the messages. The hospital relented. He met Zeb's eyes in the mirror. When was the last time a NYPD cop had to plead? They were received by a dark-haired man in an immaculate pinstriped suit. He was as tall as Zeb and moved fluidly forward to shake their hands. Darian Kyle from Kyle, Johnson & Craig. A condescending smile flashed briefly. I am Amy Cottrell's lawyer. Why would she need a lawyer? Pazaka gaped. The supercilious smile turned on the cop. That's a question you should ask yourself. Amy Cottrell didn't look any better. Pale, wasted, she lay propped against a pillow and regarded her visitors with an indifferent eye. You found her, she whispered. No ma'am, Chong replied. Darian, why are they here? They said they have some news, ma'am. Maybe you should hear them. 
Chong whipped out his tablet and brought up Maddie's photograph in Tokoa. Amy Cottrell straightened as if electrified. She grabbed the tablet and peered at it close. When did you get this? Who sent it? Chong told her. We tried calling you, he added when he had finished, after our return from Tokoa. The hospital said you weren't taking visitors. Where is Tokoa? In Georgia, ma'am. Her forehead furrowed. Is this genuine? Yes, ma'am. Your daughter was there with the man. Beth opened her mouth and closed it when Megan glared at her across the room and shook her head. Don't ask who the man is, Megan conveyed with her eyes. Beth nodded. We got another message, ma'am. Chong played the video. Maddie's voice was low and musical in the quiet of the room as she did the sums. Her mother gripped the tablet with white fingers, tears rolling down her cheeks. When did you get this? Earlier today, ma'am. The mother turned to a calendar on a side table. Eleven dates were crossed out on it, marking each day of her daughter's disappearance. Ma'am Chong brought her attention back. Is this video familiar? Did you record Maddie doing these sums? No. Was there any message? Did she call? Any clue? Hope bled away from her face when Chong shook his head. Ma'am, both the messages were sent from throwaway phones. We think it was the man who lived with you who sent it. He took a deep breath. Who is he, ma'am? Kyle stepped forward smoothly. That's it, folks. No more questions. Chapter 29 Can't you just question her? Megan asked the cops once they were outside the hospital and away from Kyle's smug face. Pazaka climbed in the rear of their ride and buckled himself before he replied. Her doctors say she still isn't in a stable condition. Questioning her could damage her recovery. We certainly have no grounds to charge her. Chong joined his partner on the bench seat at the back and gave a thumbs up, at which Zeb swung out and joined the line of vehicles going from point A to B. You guys are treating her like a criminal, Beth turned hot eyes on the two cops behind her. You have to admit she is avoiding all our questions, Chong replied with equanimity. Pazaka tidied his hair and adjusted his shades on his face. And now she's got a lawyer. There were cameras usually wherever there were lawyers. Cameras meant Pazaka had to look his best. Beth looked at her sister for support. She didn't find any. Megan had a distant expression on her face, and if she felt Beth's gaze, she didn't acknowledge it. Megan whipped her head suddenly at Zeb. The office? Something in her voice and tone made Zeb floor it. He overtook the school bus they were behind, surged past two more vehicles, cut across lanes, his lights and horns sounding a warning, and performed an illegal U-turn at a red light. Beth closed her eyes when a semi loomed large in her window. There's a reason for going Grand Theft Auto? She screamed. The numbers, her sister yelled back. We didn't pay attention to the math problems she was solving. Megan explained as they hurried inside their office. She grabbed her screen and played the video again. She called out the numbers in the problems to her sister, who entered them in a command to Werner. They waited, after Chong called his team of detectives and gave them a similar task. Pazaka practiced his golf swings on a strip that was laid out in a corner of the office. Chong and Beth threw a ball at each other. Megan watched Werner. Zeb watched Megan. Werner came back with an answer when offices were turning off their lights, people were hitting subways, making their commute to warm homes and dinners. No correlation. Are you sure? Megan asked Werner as if it could hear her. Werner persisted with the answer. Whatever problems Maddie was solving had no link to anything in her life or Amy Cottrell's life or to the dead Josh Cottrell. Shadows etched Chang's face when they had finished discussing the finding. There's only one thing to do. Day 12 dawned like any other day. The Earth had completed its rotation and was a day further in its circular orbit. It didn't care what its inhabitants did. It obeyed the laws of gravity and momentum alone. 
The man had broken many laws and if caught and convicted, would face serious time. His life as he knew it would end. It didn't bother him. He showered, woke the girl, and made breakfast for her. Cheerios that he had bought from a 7-Eleven, milk from the same store. He warmed the milk on the electric heater in the tiny kitchen their room came with, filled a bowl with it, poured the cereal in it and served it to her. She turned on the TV and changed channels till she came to Disney and settled down to watch her favorite show. He warmed a glass of milk for himself, went to the window and drank it slowly, watching the world below go by. An hour later, he washed her bowl and gave her more math problems to do. He turned to a news channel when she was occupied and idly watched various politicians and talking heads come and go. The banner caught his attention first, then the photograph on the screen. He rose suddenly, went to the TV and blocked her view with his body. He turned the volume down so that he alone could hear the presenter. His eyes remained fixed on the photograph while a coldness spread through him. They didn't have to do this. It was a photograph of the girl in Tokoa Station. We don't have a choice, Chong had argued. We have to release the picture and solicit information. The two cops had finally convinced the twins the previous night, and Maddie's picture was beamed by TV stations all across the country into millions of homes and offices. The hotline started ringing, most of them crank calls. There were several sightings from Tokoa. By midday, detectives were tracking down various leads. A couple of calls from Brooklyn looked promising. There was a sighting in Greenport. Though they had leads now, the cops were frustrated at the overall lack of progress. They felt they were being toyed with. They knew they had no choice but to persevere. Cases were cracked in 90 minutes only in Hollywood. Chuck Kaiser saw the photograph that evening when he was back from a run and was having dinner all by himself. He stopped chewing for a moment, breathed deeply, and waited for the skin-crawling feeling to stop. He knew what the photograph meant. There would be more killing. Chapter 30 The man and the girl were holed up in an apartment in downtown Manhattan, on the 13th day. The photograph had changed everything. The moment he had seen it on TV the previous day, he had packed their duffel bag, jammed the ball cap over the girl's head, and had grabbed her by the hand and hustled out. He didn't bother checking out. Leaving was imperative. He had peered cautiously on the street, and when he didn't see anyone yelling or looking in his direction and pointing, he had brought the girl out. He had joined a bunch of tourists and had taken the subway to Central Park. He took the girl into the depths of the park, and when he came to a secluded area, he brought out a pair of scissors. He grabbed her by the shoulder and looked her in the eye. I need to cut your hair. The girl squealed and protested, but settled down when she saw the look in his eyes. He chopped her hair, made it short like a boy's, and collected the loose hair in a baggie. He asked her to hold a mirror for him and when she did so, he cut his hair. He dressed her in a pair of trousers that he had bought for just such contingencies. She looked different when they emerged from Central Park, more like a boy than a girl. He wasn't bothered about his own looks. He knew people would be looking for a young girl with a man. It was the girl that people's eyes would be drawn to. The girl didn't look like one anymore. He walked down Broadway, holding her hand and when he reached Times Square he found a fast food joint. He ordered a burger and fries for her, a milkshake to wash them down with, and saw her eyes light up in delight. He connected to the establishment's Wi-Fi, went to an apartment rental site, and booked one using one of his fake credit cards. The apartment was near Trinity Church and was expensive. It was worth the expense, he figured. Cops would be looking for hotels and motels near train and bus stations. The thirteenth day was gray and overcast, and when he peered out of the window the pavement gleamed, freshly washed from a burst of rain. He padded to the bathroom, showered, and went to the living room where he brought out his laptop and went onto the internet. He brought up maps and train routes and made calculations. This time the trip would take longer. There would be transfers and car rentals, however, with the girl looking like a boy, he was sure he could pull it off. It was time to teach the cops and the Petersons a lesson. 
Chuck Kaiser stayed at home on the 13th day, watching the news, his Glock within easy reach. His phone didn't ring. No one busted his door down. The news went into an endless loop, and he knew the picture would not be broadcast the next day. There were scandals to be covered, and politicians to be torn into. A missing girl was important only for a day. Morning became afternoon. He made a simple meal for lunch. Eggs. Toast. Boiled potatoes. A beer to wash everything down. He had been to the world's most dangerous hotspots and seen and done things that most people couldn't imagine. He hadn't acquired the taste for fancy food. He eyed the phone and wondered if he should make the call and set things in motion. He clicked his teeth in impatience at his indecision. He was a leader. Leaders didn't prevaricate. He dialed a number from memory and spoke briefly. He wasn't worried about his phone being tapped or his calls being monitored. No one would understand what he had said. The man and the girl took the Amtrak Cardinal service early the next day, the 14th day. The service originated from Penn Station and ended in Chicago a full 26 hours later. The man didn't intend to travel 26 hours. The girl bounced in her seat in another viewliner bedroom and chattered excitedly. Her stories were building up, there were lots to tell Lizzie and Peaches. He didn't disillusion her. Twenty hours later, on the fifteenth day, after riding through horse country, rivers, valleys and mountains, the train stopped at a small town. It was still dark, very early in the morning, when the man carried the girl and stepped out on the small platform. There were no benches, no seating area, and he and the girl were the only two people to step out. Once the train departed with a mournful cry, it felt like he and she were the only humans on the planet. He placed his duffel on the pavement and sat with his back against a wall, the girl burrowed in his neck. The message was on Beth and Megan's phones when they returned from their run early morning on the 15th day. No progress had been made in the previous five days. The leads from the hotline had proved to be false. No girl and man were found in any of the locations. It's a city of eight million people, Chan was defensive when Megan had brought up the lack of forward movement. That's a lot of people to search through. She was in the shower when she heard the pounding. Beth. Who else could it be? She drew a towel around her and opened the door. You heard of polite knocking? You checked your phone? No. Obviously. I shouldn't have asked. Beth showed Megan her phone. Maddie was smiling back at her, standing in front of Connorsville train depot. Chapter 31 Connorsville was a small city in Fayette County, Indiana, on the north bank of the Whitewater River. Its population of 14,000 was served by a high school. It derived its name from Connors Post, a trading outpost established by one John Connor, who arrived in the Whitewater Valley in the early 1800s. The city was once known as Little Detroit and had been home to the McFarland Motor Corporation. Megan read aloud at the scant information spat out by Werner as their Gulfstream cut through blue skies yet another time, heading southwest. They had hustled to the airport on studying the message and after relaying it, the NYPD and briefing them. By 10 a.m. on the 15th day, they were wheels up. The twins were unaccompanied by Pazaka and Chong this time, the two cops staying back to liaise with the Connorsville PD. Their detectives would investigate security camera images again, look into train reservations to Connorsville and onward. Werner had already disclosed that the city was served by two Amtrak trains, one heading from New York to Chicago and the other going in the opposite direction. Megan looked at the picture again, trying to read any meaning into it. Maddie kept silent, her eyes mirthful, looking straight into the camera. Beth had tried calling the number back when they had seen the message, it hadn't rung. Yet another burner phone. This isn't typical, Beth brushed her hair back from her face and fell back in the plush leather seat. A ray of sunlight streamed through a window and briefly haloed her face. Nothing about Maddie's kidnapping is typical, Megan thought. The closest major airport to Connorsville was Cincinnati, 
Northern Kentucky International Airport, 60 miles from the city. However, the city had its own airstrip, a smaller one in Mettel Field, that was four miles away from the train depot. Mettel Field was their destination. A call to Zeb, who was in Paris on an agency task, who had then made more calls to other people, had cleared their landing at the small airport. Chong called as their aircraft began its descent. Amtrak had confirmed the sale of two tickets to Chicago, to two people who fit John Doe and Maddie's descriptions. The purchases were in a false name, different from the one used for the Tokoa purchase. No such person existed. Amtrak had no record of any other purchase by that false name or the one used for Tokoa. This time no CCTV cameras had captured the two passengers. No vehicles were rented at Connorsville, though the local PD was still checking. The station's name board was cordoned off and a forensic team was dusting it. It was 1 p.m. when they landed and walked out of the small terminal. A bright blue sky that stretched as far as the eye could see, canopied above them. On the ground, a black SUV was waiting for them. It had been driven over from Cincinnati, 60 miles to the southeast. A huge black man, as large as Bawana, straightened and approached them, his bald head gleaming in the sunlight. His eyes flicked from one sister to the other. Megan Peterson. That's me, Megan shook his hand. Dudley Fields, ma'am, he handed the keys over. I'll be waiting in the terminal. Fifteen minutes later, they were at Connorsville train depot. They were met by Wayne Call, the Connorsville police chief, a burly man whose gut was straining against his uniform. He greeted them and briefed them on what his men had found. They hadn't found much. The name board had prints, these would be analyzed and compared to the ones found in Tokoa. No one had seen a man and a girl at the station. The Cardinal Service from New York arrived at 3.36 a.m. The station didn't see a lot of traffic at that time. They walked around the depot, a gray-bricked red-tiled structure that had a shelter, a small platform, and two tracks that ribboned out into nothingness in the far distance. Call took them to the name board where a couple of officers were working. The cops nodded at the twins and let the twins go closer. Megan felt a frisson of excitement go through her when she saw the red squiggles. They hadn't been very clear in the picture, and while Chong had confirmed their existence, she and Beth had wanted to see for themselves. The name board had the same red markings that the Tokoa one had. Connorsville now read C-O-N-N-E-R-S-V-I-L-L-E. -E. Four hours later they were back in the sky, after thanking the police chief and returning the vehicle back to Fields. They hadn't expected to find much, and hence they weren't disappointed. That's not right, Megan corrected herself. We know Maddie was here. We know he was here. There is a purpose to their traveling. We just have to find what it is, she spoke aloud. Her sister looked at her questioningly. Why they are traveling? To small cities, Megan explained. I've been thinking about that, Beth replied slowly, her phone by her side, Maddie on its screen. What if he isn't mocking us? Megan felt the words sink slowly inside her, and with a sudden certainty, she knew Beth was right. That changes everything. He's trying to tell us something. Beth rose and paced in the cabin. He's deliberately reaching out, traveling, and putting himself at risk. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah, our starting point and assumptions were all wrong. Beth stopped and turned to her sister and smiled when she saw Megan was on the same page. It means John Doe wasn't hitting Amy Cottrell. Chapter 32 they spoke rapidly, completing each other's sentences, thoughts forming quickly, connections being made. Josh Cottrell is dead, isn't he? Beth was nearly vibrating from the rush of a new line of thought. Yes, we can't dispute that. We still have a John Doe. He grabbed Maddie because something happened. Or was about to happen. Yeah. He laid low for a while, maybe to follow what we or the cops would do. Correct. Maybe he thought we were on the wrong track when we interviewed Mayo and Kane, Beth stopped mid-sentence. How would he know? Easy. He could have followed the news, called the NYPD, put two and two together. 
Or maybe he has contacts inside the NYPD. Beth nodded and resumed. Our questioning Amy Cottrell was not helpful either. Yeah, and he could have found that easily enough. So he went to Tekoa and took the picture. Ah, When we still went around in circles, he sent the video. That too didn't work, so he had to go to Connorsville. I'm with you so far but what's in Connorsville? Beth frowned for a long while, looking out of a window, paying no attention to fluffy clouds and a gleaming wing. Maybe it's not what was in those cities, but something in those messages. Werner analyzed those and got nothing. Werner did what we asked it to do. Maybe we asked the wrong questions. Beth pulled out her screen and swiveled it so that Megan could watch too. She brought up the Tokoa photograph and placed it next to the Connorsville one. They stared at the pictures. No answers came. Beth played the video, and they listened to Maddie's musical voice recite the math problems she was solving. Subtraction. Division. Megan's eyes flicked to the pictures that were minimized at the top of the screen. Something tugged at the edge of her memory. She turned away and let Maddie's voice enter her mind and blow away the baggage and the noise. Nope. Not working. It's still elusive. Subtraction. Zero. Division. Subtraction. Division. Zero. Her eyes flew back. Got it, she yelled. Beth winced and turned off the video. Got what? Megan knew she was grinning goofily, but she couldn't help it. All those subtraction problems she's doing, what did they end in? Zero. It might be quicker if you tell me. Nope. We'll do it my way. And the division ones? Not one answered there. Megan enlarged the pictures and sat back waiting for Beth to connect the dots. A sudden widening of the eyes and gasp was Beth's reaction. To CCOA. C-O-N-N-E-R-S-V-I-L-L-E. Subtraction. Division. Zero. He was pointing us to those two O's and that slash. Dividing zero. Beth exclaimed, completing Megan's sentence. She high-fived Megan, grabbed her screen and instructed Werner to dig into the term. They waited. Megan cracked her knuckles. Beth opened a bag of nuts and crunched through them. Werner hadn't returned any answers by the time they landed in New York at 8 p.m. on the 15th day. They flagged a cab, discussed the two words and their possible meanings. Let's ask him, Megan said finally when they got nowhere. He might be sleeping. It's past midnight in Paris. Zeb? Megan laughed. He'll be awake. Beth texted Zeb. Have you heard of dividing zero? Her phone buzzed the next moment, an incoming call. Zeb. She put it on speaker and briefed him. Rings no bells, he said when she had finished. It sounds like a term the military would use. You know who to ask. Will he know? It was Zeb's turn to laugh. If he doesn't, he'll know who to ask. When are you back? Tomorrow. Bawana, Raj, Chloe and Bear are returning tomorrow too. General Klaus answered promptly, his voice alert, as if he had been expecting their call. He probably was. Zeb must have messaged him, Megan thought and listened while Beth outlined their direction of thought and their finding. The National Security Advisor kept quiet for several moments. Above the hum of tires and the honking of the city's traffic, they heard a clink, as if a cube of ice had dropped into a glass. Scotch. He loves fine whiskey. Can't say I remember any such name. The general's voice came back. Leave it with me, though. There are folks I can ask. Discreetly, sir. Of course. They hopped out of their cab outside their office, paid the fare, and disappeared inside without a backward glance. If they had, they would have spotted the tail. Chapter 33 The National Security Advisor called them at 10 p.m. as Megan was readying for bed. Would you ladies be up for a short flight? Now? 
Megan glanced at the clock and at her inviting bed. What the heck? We can sleep just as well in D.C. We'll be there, sir. It might be midnight. I'll be awake. She called Beth and told her to haul ass, and in half an hour they were heading back to the airport, back to the Gulfstream where the pilots were waiting. Beth stifled a yawn and leaned back in the cab, he has something hasn't he? Otherwise, he wouldn't have us fly to D.C. Only one way to know. Where are we staying? You booked any hotel? You ever stayed with a national security advisor? Beth's eyes widened. You mean? Stick with me kiddo, Megan smiled smugly. You'll have life experiences of the kind you've never had. Beth snorted and jabbed her with an elbow, however she couldn't contain her excited grin. Washington, D.C. was half asleep when they landed at Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport two hours later. A voluble cabbie pointed out the sights to them as he drove them to Georgetown where General Klaus had his residence. They made good time since the streets were empty, politicians needed their beauty sleep and had retired to their comfortable mansions long since. General Klaus lived in a whitewashed brick Georgian-style house, separated from its nearest neighbors by a leafy garden surrounding the house. It was fenced and had an obvious security detail. The guards checked the twins' credentials, and one of them escorted them to a black door. The door opened before he could knock, General Klaus filling it. I'll take it from here Brad, he thanked the guard. The general was in his sixties, had iron-gray hair that was cut short, eyes that matched his hair and was fit. He had a barely discernible limp on his left leg, the only sign that the general had seen active duty. He starts his day with a five-mile run at 5 a.m. Ends it with half an hour of crossfit. Megan started when Beth nudged her. The general was addressing them. Dinner? A drink? We are good, sir. The gray eyes pierced her as if seeing through her, and then the craggy face relaxed. It's good to see you, ladies. Zeb keeps you away from me, he probably thinks I will want you on my staff. He led them up a flight of stairs and showed them to two rooms. He wouldn't be wrong. It was over breakfast, the next day, the 16th, that the general brought up dividing zero. You have heard of WITSEC, the Witness Security Program, operated by the U.S. Marshals? Megan swallowed a bite and washed it down with water before she replied. Yes, sir. Witnesses are provided with new identities, trained for jobs, and are relocated. The marshals haven't lost a single witness who entered their program. Megan nodded, wondering where General Klaus was going. From the corners of her eyes, she saw Beth was similarly puzzled. The National Security Advisor didn't keep them hanging for long. Dividing Zero came into existence more than two decades back. His sentences were short, sharp, staccato bursts. When PMCs, private military contractors, were increasingly used. A smart guy thought up the program for those PMCs who were deployed in black op missions. He smiled thinly when he sensed the impatience in the twins. Dividing Zero was the opposite of Witsec. Megan stopped chewing. Beth followed suit. In dividing zero, people ceased to exist. She laid her cutlery down, wiped her mouth with a towel and listened. The general took a long pull from a glass of juice. The PMC's identities were not changed in this program. They were erased. He snapped his fingers. It's as if they had never existed. Total deniability took on a new meaning. Megan sat stunned as she took it in. That, she searched for words, sounds right out of Hollywood. General Klaus acknowledged her point with a nod. Yes, and that was a big part of its appeal. What about the legal stuff? I can't even imagine the various rights and civil liberties this program trampled on. The military machine distanced itself. The smart guy, one Russell Stoll, ran a defense contractor firm, Brown Spear Corporation. Brown Spear ran the program. Brown Spear was a public company, General Klaus elaborated. Very high profile, the then favorite of the defense establishment. It was a software company, wrote Intelligent Algos. For facial recognition, thermal imaging, 
that kind of stuff. The smart guy, Russell Stoll, was the CEO of that company. He was its chief programmer too. He got the military to sign off for a pilot. Brownspear did the rest. He sighed. The military didn't question any contractors too much. There was none of the oversight and checks that we have today. The program was sexy, he continued, the military gave Stoll the operatives. Single men or those who didn't have large families. Stoll washed their pass. Out came operatives who didn't exist. The operatives weren't its own? Megan couldn't hide her incredulity. No. Brown Spear provided the washing program and did the dirty deeds of eliminating their identities in various databases. The military provided the operatives. Who were they? I am trying to find out. You can imagine, not a lot of folks are talking. I reckon they were private contractors. He spotted the impatience in Beth's eyes and smiled thinly. You have spotted the defense contractor connection, but it isn't valid. The program is inactive. He let them digest that bombshell for a moment. The military didn't use it for long. Dividing zero trampled on too many freedoms and rights. It would be political suicide for any government, Beth gestured with a hand. In the direction of the Capitol. General Klaus nodded. And for any chief of staff, too. The program was criminal in the first place. A phone buzzed softly in the vastness of his home. He ignored it. Things didn't work out well for Stoll. He got embroiled in legal battles almost as soon as the pilot got approved. He went to prison ten years back. For embezzlement. He's still there, in Hazleton, West Virginia. He's got another ten years to serve. He rose and they followed him to the living room where he poured coffees for them. How did this program get off the ground in the first place? Beth shook her head in disbelief and anger at the revelation. The same way the intelligence establishment started snooping on us? A fleeting expression of regret crossed the general's face. What happened to Brown Spear? It's still around, however it's a failing company. It had a hundred staff at its peak. Now it's down to ten. There must be employees who worked with Stoll. Who know all the details? The general shook his head. Stoll worked alone on dividing zero. He wrote the software. He did whatever he had to. No one else got their hands dirty. His eyes peered keenly at them through tendrils of steam from his cup. Mayo and Kane didn't represent them, if that's what you are thinking. None of the firm's clients were involved with dividing zero. The twins returned to New York in the afternoon, after the general had finished briefing them. They were silent on the flight back, their minds whirling, trying to fit the new information with their latest assumption. Megan pulled out her screen when they were in the air, tasked Werner to look into Brown Spear. She reflected for a moment, and then expanded the search to include all those associated with the program. The general had given them some names, those went into the search command too. A yellow cab brought them back to their office. The sisters stepped out quickly, the hunt had a scent to follow. They had to move fast. John Doe could be one of these contractors, Beth queried her sister while paying off the cab. Her sister didn't get to reply. An SUV screeched to a halt behind the cab. Three dark-suited men sprang from it, grabbed the twins and bundled them into the vehicle. The SUV disappeared into the traffic. Chapter 34 Two SUVs were parked in front of their Columbus Avenue office when Zeb stepped out from his cab. Their engines were growling softly. There was no one inside them. Four people were huddled around one person. His body tightened involuntarily, sensing something wrong as he took in the bunched crowd. Bawana, Roger, Chloe, and Bear. Surrounding someone. Chloe looked up on hearing his approach. The twins have been grabbed. The beast roused itself within Zeb. Surged from repose to action in less than the blink of an eye. Wait. Hear things out. His step didn't falter. 
He didn't swear or curse. Listened as Bawana explained rapidly. The fifth man was the cabbie. He had dropped the twins when a black SUV came from behind, three men emerged and kidnapped the twins. It happened so swiftly, he hadn't time to take the number. The security guard from inside hadn't heard anything. Ten minutes later the four of them arrived. Zeb came two minutes later. Twelve-minute lead, Chloe confirmed when Zeb looked at her. She had a screen in her hand read out from it. Their GPS is dead. Cell 2. All their clothing had GPS tags, tracked by Werner. Attackers made them remove it. Dispose their phones. Zeb was moving before she had finished. Hauled himself in one SUV, Chloe and Bear crowding behind him. Bawana and Roger went to the other. They slapped on near-invisible headsets. He joined the slipstream of vehicles, uncaring of furious honking and swearing. Faster the beast urged. Not yet. Where to? Roger drawled in his ear. The Texan's voice was relaxed. Zeb knew he wasn't. Go to Lojack. Find which vehicles were here. Track them. Get camera footage. Chloe nodded. Grasped what he had said. From the Lojacks, they would know which vehicles were present at the time of the grab. Security cameras at their building would show the images. In urban traffic, a bunch of vehicles usually stayed together for a time, before peeling off to their destinations. Werner would dip into the traffic camera feed and track the vehicles and home in on the black SUV. It wasn't perfect. The slim lead the attackers had worked to their advantage. A 12-minute lead was too small for a getaway vehicle switch. There were five men in the large seven-seater SUV. They were silent. They had worked as a team before. They didn't need to speak. No wisecracks, no casual conversation. They were all dressed in dark suits. Looked quite similar. Hard bodies. Dark hair cut short. Tanned faces. Searching eyes. The grab had been executed at short notice. Not enough time to get the right equipment, however, it had gone down well. They now needed to put time and distance behind to transfer vehicles. The women hadn't put up a fight. Not much of one. They had been cuffed and gagged. Their cell phones crushed. One man had torn their outer wear off. One woman, the one called Beth, had lashed out. The man had buried a blade in her left shoulder. No words spoken. One knife. One shoulder. One scream. Total control. The driver looked in the rear mirror. The injured twin was leaning against her sister. Her eyes closed, her face pale, blood streaming down her naked belly. Her twin was glaring at them, her face red in anger. No vehicles were pursuing them. The police scanner lay quiet. He veered off and joined Amsterdam Avenue and notched up his speed. A second vehicle was waiting in a warehouse near Harlem River. The women needed to be interrogated. The drive to the warehouse was uneventful. Traffic thinned as they neared the warehouse and turned onto the asphalt road that branched into the deserted warehouse. It was abandoned. It was perfect for their purpose. The driver slowed as he entered the warehouse entrance and stopped. He exited the vehicle and heard doors open behind him as the rest of the men started clambering out. He lifted his head sharply. Something? A vehicle's throaty roar? The SUV came from around a wall of the warehouse so fast that none of the men had time to react. It rammed into the larger SUV. A couple of the black-suited men stumbled. Zeb leapt out. Didn't bother to turn off the engine. Didn't bother to turn to track Bawana's arrival. A dark suit was in his vision. The man turned to Zeb. Light glinted off a barrel. Now? The beast surged. Zeb dived under the straightening arm. Caught hold of the wrist. Crushed it. His elbow flew out. Punched the suit in his throat. Suit went down. Zeb turned. His Glock appeared in his hand. 
pointed at another suit. He lowered it. Roger shot the suit from behind. Zeb ran to the large SUV and flung open the rear door. Took in the twins. In their underwear. Beth bleeding. Another attacker appeared from the back of the vehicle. His gun pointed. Stop. The man yelled. Bawana rose from behind the man. Tall. Black. His face an iron mask. Bawana had seen the twins. Had seen their condition. His ham-like fist swung casually backhanding the shooter. The gunman's head bounced off the roof of the vehicle. He slid down out of Zeb's sight. Zeb's eyes were fixed on Bear, visible through the opposite door of the vehicle. Bear was grappling with another suit. A shooter was running toward Bear, his gun raised. Zeb's left hand grabbed the roof railing. The beast inside him snarled silently as he powered himself up and flew. Up and over the roof. His body was tight and narrow, his glock rising again. One second when time stood still. When the earth stopped rotating. His glock spoke and the attacker fell. Zeb landed on the other side of the vehicle and relaxed when Bear clubbed his opponent. Footsteps came pounding. His gun rose. Lowered when he saw Bawana. All clear, bro. They went to the captor's vehicle and peered inside. Beth looked at them and managed a smile. Took you long enough. Chapter 35 The warehouse was soon flooded by cruisers and police officers. Red and white flashing lights bathed the desolate structure and brought it to life. Beth's shoulder was stitched and bandaged by paramedics. The blade had pierced the fleshy part of her shoulder and hadn't severed any ligaments or tendons. She would be okay in a few days. Painkillers were given. A hospital visit was urged. Rest was recommended. She took the pills and snorted inelegantly at the recommendations. She joined her sister who was briefing Pazaka and Chong, the former looking like he was on a Hollywood set. Three dead, two alive, one of them barely, the one Bawana hit. Pazaka summed it for her, his shades reflecting red and blue flashing lights. She looked at Bawana, who shrugged unapologetically. He must have a thick head. He wasn't meant to live. She waited for Chong to finish talking to other cops, and when he was free, she turned to her sister. Did you tell them about dividing zero? Nope. As the sun disappeared below the horizon and evening turned to night, Beth told her friends and the two cops about dividing zero. Day 17 was spent in investigating the kidnappers. The one man who could talk wasn't speaking. He stonewalled the cops and sat silently in his cell with an impassive face. The grab vehicle was rented using false IDs. None of the suits carried any identification. Their prints weren't on record. Their faces weren't in any facial recog database. No attorney came forward to represent the surviving men. It's as if whoever employed them has disowned them, Chong finger combed his hair yet again in exasperation. The two cops were in the Columbus Avenue office. Zeb's involvement in the rescue was covered up. The NYPD took the credit. Witnesses had alerted them to the kidnapping. A smart cop had spotted the getaway vehicle and the cops had arrived just in time. The story suited Zeb. Limelight wasn't his thing. Their deep black operatives? Megan looked at Zeb for confirmation on hearing Chang's comment. He sensed her thought and nodded imperceptibly. Employed by whom? Someone doesn't want John Doe to be found. John Doe wants us to find him, however. She didn't find any answers. Neither did anyone else. Werner came back with more details on dividing zero after going through the most covert databases in the country. It confirmed what the general had said. None of Mayo and Kane's clients had been involved with dividing zero. Werner couldn't find whose records the program had erased. That was the point, wasn't it? Beth winced as she moved gingerly in her seat. You should be resting. We should be hunting, Beth flared at her sister. General Klaus get back with any names? 
the general had promised to dig out who dividing zero's operatives had been. Nope. I wouldn't hold my breath, Zeb called out from his couch. The military has a habit of closing ranks. Even the general may not get far. Beth swore softly. Where does that leave us? A hand shot up. Roger. I know y'all have more brains than me, he ducked the paper ball that came his way. But maybe we should talk to Stoll? They were in Hazleton in the federal prison, in the afternoon, in an interview room with Russell Stoll. Claire had made calls, turned on the juice and had arranged the interview. The visitors wanted to know about dividing zero, the prisoner was told. Stoll agreed readily. No one mentioned the program to me. Not once in all these years. Not a single person. Stahl's gray prison wear hung loosely around him. His face was pale, he was short, and he was contemptuous. They got me for embezzlement. They showed some discrepancy in my company's accounts, which I explained. No one listened, though. They wanted me put away. For dividing zero. He warmed up, knowing he had a captive audience in the twins and Zeb. The military was scared. So were the politicians. They were interested in their own asses. I devised a brilliant program for them. Ran a pilot. And what did they do? They canned it. And imprisoned me. All these terrorists who capture our soldiers, if my program had been alive, those captives would have no identity. The terrorists would lose their advantage. He slammed his hand on the table separating them. Spittle flew from his mouth. Did anyone listen to me? No one. He laughed. A short bark that echoed in the small room. Who were the program's operatives? Megan rushed in when Stoll fell silent for a moment. He didn't answer her. The pilot was for five operatives. Only five. We erased their identities. Two went to Afghanistan. One to Africa. One in Europe. One was right here. Megan bit back a sigh. Who were they? Where are they now? They did their jobs. Returned. Mission successful. And then the military pulled the plug. Who were they, sir? Maybe some politeness will help. It didn't. She pushed John Does' photograph across the table, towards him. Is this one of the operatives? Stoll looked at it and frowned. Could be. The guys looked similar. Average. These dudes look the same. Surely you can do better than that. His lips curled. Try living in this place for ten years and then tell me. He flicked the picture back and dismissed it from his mind. He leaned forward and whispered conspiratorially. You know the real reason the military shut the program down? No, sir. This time Megan didn't hold back her sigh. They saw other uses for the program. Like what, sir? Wouldn't you like to know? Stoll sneered and leaned back. His expression changed when Zeb moved fractionally. The hostility drained out when he saw something in Zeb's eyes. The anger left him. His voice became soft. Civilian uses. His voice became fearful. Dividing zero could be used in civilian life. Chapter 36 The Gulfstream scoffed at the distance between Hazleton and New York and delivered its passengers back to the city of bustle and fumes in short time. The twins hadn't been idle on the return leg. Stoll had smirked when he had given them the names of the five operatives. Good luck with finding them. The operatives were given code names once they entered the program. They carried false papers when they were deployed. Those legends were erased when they returned to the U.S. Stoll hadn't contacted them on their return, court cases had consumed his life and then Hazleton had become his home. They could be anywhere. They could be dead, he taunted. You know that the program was used on civilians? Zeb asked him quietly. His bravado left him instantly. No. It could be misused, though. 
that's why the military got cold feet. You don't have much, do you? You know more now, don't you? Stoll sneered as he was led away. Beth had set Werner loose on Stoll and Brown Spear as soon as they boarded the aircraft. His story checked out. Dividing Zero wasn't mentioned in any of the lurid headlines that followed his downfall, but the timelines fit. The rise and fall of a hotshot defense millionaire, read one article by a reputed financial journal. Beth read it, made notes and sprawled back when she had finished. He's right? Megan quirked an eyebrow at her. Yeah. You found anything? Megan grimaced. Nope. The general says he hasn't gotten far. Military bureaucracy. And cover your ass. Chong says the suit is still not talking. Zeb wasn't surprised at General Klaus's lack of progress. The defense establishment doesn't like him. He plays it too straight. On top of that, his role is a purely advisory one. So we just leave it at that? Beth glared at him as he lounged in his seat. John Doe could be one of those five operatives. I'm working on it, Zeb replied languidly. Doesn't look like it, Beth snorted. Bawana was waiting for them at JFK, leaning against his ride, oblivious of the wide berth other travelers gave him. This dude could be anywhere? He gave incredulous looks when Beth broke down their findings for him. Yeah. He glanced out and stared at the vehicle in the next lane. That guy over here, he could be one of them? Don't start. They were skirting Central Park when Zeb called out from the rear. Stop. Bawana braked hard, amidst a chorus of angry honking. Zeb slipped out of the vehicle and walked away without a backward look. Where are you going? Megan yelled when they had stopped gaping. To work, came the reply. Has he always been this insufferable? She rolled her eyes at Bawana. He has been nothing else. Zeb had exchanged several texts with Claire while on the flight. I need to meet someone who knew about dividing zero, had been his first message to her. Anyone? Preferably a general. Someone who would know everything. She had made calls, had wielded her influence, and had arranged for the meeting. There had been conditions. The general would be unnamed, in any development. The general would meet in the dark, so that Zeb couldn't identify him. The meet would happen late at night. To give the general time to fly out from Washington, D.C., Zeb would come alone to the rendezvous. Claire didn't tell him who the general was. Zeb didn't ask. He agreed to all the conditions. He caught a cab to the United Nations headquarters, stopped it when it was on East 34th Street, and exited. He walked down FDR Drive, ignoring curious looks from passing motorists, went to the riverfront, and headed to a pier. It was gated and chained. He leapt over it and made his way over a narrow wooden bridge to a shelter at its end. Barges berthed at the bridge in daylight. At nighttime, it was deserted and lonely in the busiest city in the world. A flashlight pointed at him when he neared and shone on his face. To blind me. That's far enough, a voice called out. He stopped. Raise your hands. He raised them. Two men approached him, large muscled, carrying handguns. He sensed more men at the shelter. The men frisked him expertly, removed his Glock, his knife, his mags. They removed his spare gun and the headpiece. A walking arsenal, aren't you? Zeb kept quiet. One of the men nodded in the direction of the shelter. A shadow emerged from behind it. The shadow didn't approach him. The flashlight remained on his face. You wanted to meet me? Zeb recognized the tone in the voice. It was one used to giving commands, accustomed to having them obeyed. You know why, Zeb replied. The voice remained silent for a moment, and then it became reflective. Normally, I wouldn't have met you. However, these aren't normal times. I owe someone a favor. A big one. A cruiser wailed in the distance. One of the heavies behind Zeb tensed. He relaxed when the sound grew fainter and disappeared. 
What's your interest in the program? Zeb told him. You might expose the program. How can I trust you? Zeb lowered his hands without permission. There are a handful of people who know me. Know what I do. I suspect you know a couple of them. The voice didn't reply. You can ask them. They'll tell you what I am capable of. If I wanted to expose you, we wouldn't be meeting like this. The voice was resigned when it spoke again. Someone had to hear about it one day, I guess. Dividing zero isn't something I'm proud of. It hardened. You'll disappear if this ever comes to light. Just like that. No one will know you exist. Zeb couldn't help laughing. Can we cut out the threats? Lots of people have tried to make me disappear. The voice considered him in silence. It was clipped and short when it spoke. It reeled out five names and addresses. Chapter 37 Megan was logged onto Werner early on day 18, giving it new instructions. We never checked if any notable incidents went down in Tacoa and Connorsville. She brewed herself coffee while Werner searched, and when she emerged from the kitchen, her sister was in the office. Beth had her bag slung across her shoulder, a jacket over her t-shirt, and was looking at Megan impatiently. Don't make yourself comfortable. We are going. Megan took a sip. Where? Beth's eyes sparkled. Toronto. Zeb got five names. Beth explained on the way down. I got them from him when you were lazing on your bed. Megan didn't tell her sister about the search string. It might come to nothing. I got Werner to check them out, Beth continued, oblivious of her twin's silence. Two of them don't look like John Doe. So what's in Toronto? Jerry Cusack, one of the operatives. That's his new name? Obviously, Beth rolled her eyes and muttered under her breath. Looks like I have to do all the thinking here. Zeb was waiting in a vehicle when they emerged and swung out without a word after the sisters climbed inside. Calling him will be easier, won't it? Megan yelled above a passing car's honk. And spook him? Beth retorted. This dude has been living a new life. No one knows who he is. How would he react to a call out of the blue? None of these guys could be John Doe. Beth looked heavenward, as if seeking forgiveness for her sister's stupidity. Yeah, I know. However, do you want to find out what the heck is going on? That silenced Megan till they boarded the Gulf Stream. You know what he looks like, she asked once they were airborne. Beth brought up three photographs on her screen. I got them from their driver's licenses. The men looked similar to John Doe. No wonder Stoll wasn't sure. Megan swiped through them swiftly and then turned to the brown-haired man with them. Who did you meet yesterday? Zeb filled her in while the aircraft defied gravity and made short work of the 350 miles that separated the cities and landed at 11 a.m. Zeb rented a vehicle at Toronto Airport and drove downtown to the distillery district, a commercial neighborhood in the Canadian city. He parked in a public parking lot, crossed the street, and waved in the direction of a glass-fronted building. He's in there. He works as an insurance broker. He mentioned a well-known firm. You aren't coming in? Megan asked as she eyed the building and its surroundings. Nope. It might spook him. Of course it would. Stupid question. Zeb has the look. Cusack was an operative. He might wonder at Zeb's presence. Cusack hid his surprise and put on a neutral expression when he approached the twins in the enormous lobby of his office. Ms. Peterson, he inquired, looking from one sister to the other. We both are, as you can see, Beth smiled disarmingly and introduced themselves. How can I help you? My office didn't give me any details. She showed him John Doe's photograph. Do you know him? Was he a dividing, zero operative? Color drained from Cusack's face. They were back in the aircraft three hours later, leaving behind a shaken man. 
Cusack had cooperated fully once he had heard about Maddie. He had been thin on details. I am still bound by various oaths of confidentiality, he explained. There was no bitterness in his voice. No anger that his previous life had been washed away. We knew how it would be. He mentioned a few details in passing, didn't elaborate on any of them. No, he responded to a final question from Beth. He hadn't met the other operatives at all. They were deliberately isolated from one another. All each one of them knew was there were five of them. The Gulf Stream didn't return to New York. It winged to Atlanta, where Randy Wienerger, another of the operatives, owned an upscale bar. The twins visited the establishment on the evening of the 18th day, jostled through stockbrokers, TV anchors, minor celebrities, and asked for Wienerger. A smartly dressed waiter nodded his head in the direction of a discreet office. Beth knocked once and opened the door without waiting for a response, and stopped suddenly. Wienerger looked exactly like John Doe. He wasn't. Wienerger reacted in the same way Cusack had. He closed down immediately on hearing the program's name, and thought only when Maddie was mentioned. He didn't have any more leads than Cusack had. You could have called, he said, as he was escorting the twins out an hour later. Would you have taken it? Beth challenged him. No, ma'am. They flew to Seattle the next day, the 19th. Beth was disappointed at their lack of progress and was silent on the flight. Megan wasn't disappointed. The wisp of a thought floating in her mind was taking shape. It was helped by Werner's search results. Still too many blanks to be filled in, she decided, and didn't enlighten her sister. Gary Dubranovic had done well for himself. He owned a palatial home in the Madrona neighborhood with views of Lake Washington. He was a restorer of old homes and his business was doing well, going by the activity in his home office. Dubranovic's reaction was different from Cusack's and Wienerger's. He denied any knowledge of dividing zero and threatened to call the police. I'm a builder. I know nothing of the world you describe. He waved away Maddie's story. I have never been to Tacoa or Connorsville. Don't even know where they are. He hadn't left Seattle in a year. He had alibis. Beth was silent on their flight back. Chong and Pazaka hadn't made any progress in the two days either. There were no more videos or pictures from John Doe. We get leads. They disappear, she said once, sheen of tears in her eyes. There's one more lead. Megan bit her tongue and held the words back. No point in raising her hopes. Let me dig into it first. How is it that these operatives are doing so well? She queried aloud, in an attempt to distract her sister. Beth shrugged. She didn't know. Zeb looked up when he felt two pairs of eyes on him. Their silence has been bought. The military made a settlement with them. Money and new identities in return for silence. They reached New York in the afternoon, and instead of heading back to their office, they headed to Amy Cottrell's home. She had been discharged. She still wasn't talking to the cops. Darian Kyle, her lawyer, was still running interference. However, he had allowed one brief meeting for the twins. Megan was shocked at the mother's appearance. The lively woman in the photographs was missing. In her place was a listless, worn-out woman who rarely spoke, whose hands trembled constantly. A flicker of hope lit her eyes when the twins entered her home. That light disappeared when she saw they were alone. We are close, ma'am. We will get her back soon, Megan said in sudden certainty, her gut telling her she was finally chasing the right lead. We have just one question for you. Amy Cottrell looked at her in askance. Your husband never hit you, did he? Maddie interpreted all that wrongly. The mother looked at Megan dumbly for a moment, and then her eyes filled and tears rolled down her cheeks. She nodded and began sobbing quietly. Chuck Kaiser had made his plans. All the loose ends would be taken care of. Just one kidnapper is in a position to speak. And he won't. 
There will be another attempt. This time it will succeed. He dialed a number and waited for it to ring. Megan's phone rang and echoed inside the SUV. Zeb was driving them back to their Columbus Avenue office. He raised an eyebrow at Megan and accepted the call at her nod. Megan Peterson, a male voice asked. Yes. Her eyes narrowed as she tried to place the voice. It's Chuck Kaiser, ma'am. We spoke a while back. We did, Mr. Kaiser. Excitement flooded her voice. You have something for us, sir? Kaiser paused for a moment. Yes, ma'am. I know where your man will be. Chapter 38 Day 20 saw the twins winging it in their gleaming white aircraft, an early start to their day, before the sun warmed the earth and made heat rise from the asphalt and concrete highways of the country. What's in Courtville? You know it's somewhere in Illinois, don't you? Another small city. Why would John Doe be there? Beth was in rapid-fire mode as she seated herself opposite her sister. You have joined the dots, haven't you? Kaiser had asked them to meet him in Courtville, a request that had led them to jetting across the country again. The twins had decided to go to the meet alone. There was something in Kaiser's voice, something that hinted he would be spooked by a large group. I'm waiting, Beth prompted when Megan didn't respond immediately. I know some of it. I think Kaiser will fill in the blanks, Megan replied reluctantly. Beth studied her sister. It wasn't like looking in a mirror since the two knew where they differed. Megan's eyebrows were closer on her forehead than Beth's. Their noses had the minutest difference. They were different in personality, too. Megan was analytical. Beth was more emotional and impulsive. I knew she would crack it. I knew she was working on something the last few days. She had that distracted look on her face, Beth thought. They had different social habits, too. I have Mark and spend as much time I can with him. She hardly dates says most of the men she meets are uninteresting. Beth made a gimme gesture with her hand. Spill, she ordered her sister. It was Stahl's mention of civilian usage that got me thinking, Megan began slowly. He didn't say the program was used on civilians. I know. You want to listen? Beth zipped her mouth, settled back and listened. Stahl's comment reminded me of a Mayo and Kane case, Megan continued. You remember, the one where they settled on behalf of some firm's employees. Beth jerked forward, as if a live current had passed through her. Dividing zero was involved in that? How? She pursed her lips when Megan raised a warning hand and leaned back again. No, the program had no connection. However, Stahl's remark and the case got me wondering. What if dividing zero had been used by civilians? Megan smiled when Beth's mouth rounded in an O. Oh. I got Werner to look at incidents in Tacoa and Connorsville. Any incident, going back ten years. Deaths. Disappearances. Anything. Werner came back with two events. A man disappearing mysteriously, in Tacoa. Another one who was never seen again, in Connorsville. Both occurrences in the same year, seven years back. Both worked for defense contractors in California. Here's the funny thing. Both were whistleblowers. Both had complained to friends about malpractices at their places of employment. They were planning to report to the Department of Defense's whistleblower program. Same employers? Beth asked. No. Megan mentioned two well-known names. Whistleblowers disappearing. That would open a can of worms, wouldn't it? The local PDs investigated. They're still open cases. The defense contractors were investigated. They came out clean. The stories died out. What kind of malpractices? No details on that. Beth pondered for a moment and then shook her head. I don't get it. So what if they disappeared? Dividing zero didn't make them disappear. The program rubbed out their existence. Megan's smile eclipsed the sunshine. 
both men had told friends they weren't alone. There were a bunch of folks. They were planning to write a joint letter to the Pentagon. Her smile grew broader when Beth continued to look puzzled. There's an image on the internet. Someone took a photograph of a news article that mentioned the two missing men. There's a reference to a group of whistleblowers. One name is mentioned in that news report. Billy Bob Fights. From Courtville. She showed the image to Beth, who studied it in silence. Megan took a breath. Billy Bob Fights doesn't exist. She broke it down for her sister. Someone came to know of dividing zero. That someone thought, wouldn't it be great if these pesky whistleblowers disappeared? Tacoa and Connorsville didn't go perfectly for them. They were just disappearances, not erasures. Courtville was smooth. John Doe found out about the cleanups. Maybe he arranged them and was blackmailing Mr. Mastermind. Mr. M didn't like that. He arranged for John Doe to disappear, Beth chimed in excitedly. Yeah, and possibly John Doe got wind of it, grabbed Maddie and disappeared himself. They fell silent, each one of them worrying at it, trying to find holes in Megan's theory, trying to find other explanations. Why would John Doe contact us? Beth chewed her lip, a frown marring her face. He wants us to look into the program. Why wouldn't he go to the cops? He was threatened. Amy Cottrell and Maddie's lives were at risk. The cops didn't get anywhere in Tacoa and Connorsville. Is Cottrell the mastermind? I can't see how he could be. He is too visible. He would be the first one suspected if the program was discovered. Beth pondered for a moment and brought up another name. What about Chuck Kaiser? Nope, Megan replied. I looked up his profile. He doesn't have the smarts. He could be involved. Possible, Megan conceded. Are we in danger? No, Megan was definitive. This is fact-finding for him. He'll want to know how much we know. Is Mayo and Kane involved? Beth didn't give up on her line of inquiry. She was emotional and impulsive. She was also relentless when she got hold of a lead. Nope. Werner ran probability algos. Came with very a low possibility. You know who Mr. M is? I hope Kaiser does, Megan confessed. What about John Doe? Sis, I thought you would have figured that out by now. He's. The pilot announced they were landing, and Megan took the opportunity to stay silent and let Beth figure out John Doe's identity for herself. Courtville Station was a flat, single-story structure when they drove up from Southern Illinois Airport. The station had a large parking yard at the front, a ticket office, waiting area, and not much else. In front of the station was a road that went into the city. Beyond it were thick woods, and behind the station were the tracks. The yard had three other vehicles when they rode in, no people were present. The twins waited for a moment. No person stepped out from the vehicles or from the station to meet them. They went inside the station to the waiting area. It was empty. The agent in the ticket office looked up hopefully when they approached him and mouthed something they couldn't hear. Beth shook her head at him. They weren't there to travel. Kaiser was waiting for them when they emerged from the station. Chuck Kaiser's hair was cut close and his face was deeply creased. His body, however, could have passed for a much younger man's. There wasn't an ounce of fat on him as he waited in the parking lot, his feet spread, a brown coat flapping against his legs. A gray shirt tucked into faded blue jeans and a wide leather belt completed his outfit. He removed his shades when they got closer. He looked at one and then the other twin. Megan Peterson. That's me. She shook his hand and introduced Beth. Why Courtville, sir? Beth asked him. If Kaiser was startled by her abrupt question, he didn't show it. His flat black eyes studied her before he replied. Josh Cottrell, the dead man, will show up here, he replied in a gravelly voice, if you stay long enough. Megan closed her eyes briefly and clamped down on the surge of triumph deep inside. I was right. 
that was the only explanation for the goings-on. She glanced at her sister and smiled at the expression on her face. She's figured it out too. You don't look surprised, Kaiser continued. How much have you put together? Megan told him while studying the man in front of her. How's he involved? Did you have those men killed? Make fights disappear? A muscle twitched on Kaiser's face. He didn't become angry. His black eyes remained flat. No ma'am. But what Josh and I did led to their deaths. And to Fights's cleanup. What did you do? We looked the other way ma'am. Kaiser headed the liaison unit when Josh Cottrell joined his team in Babish. After a few years, their role soon turned to managing potential whistleblowers in the defense industry. Negotiating with them. Threatening them sometimes. Kaiser broke off and looked around the yard. Nothing moved other than his coat which slapped his legs. Josh and he were asked to go hard on the Tokoa man. They did. The man didn't budge from his position. He was determined to spill. He would go public with the insider information he had. He had evidence of bribes to senior politicians made by his employer. Weapons trials in countries where innocents had died. Cover-ups of those incidents. Kaiser and Cottrell were asked to back off when the Tokoa man remained resolute. Matters would be dealt with differently. He disappeared. We knew he had been killed, though his body was never found. The Connorsville man suffered a similar fate. Fights was different. The words flowed out of Kaiser as if a dam had burst. He was a loner. One of those people who don't get along with others. We were told about dividing zero. He was a natural for it. We were given a software program and access to federal and state databases. Asked to execute the program. We refused. A man came out of the station and looked at them. The ticket agent. He watched them for a moment and disappeared inside. We were threatened. Our families were threatened. We were told we would disappear like the three men. I retired. His smile had no humor. I am sorta of attached to this life. My kids deserve to live theirs fully. They let me live. I guess it was easier to control me when alive. Cottrell kept his head down and continued working, though no longer on such cases. He got transferred to New York and I lost track of him. Until I got a call. I was to say he was dead. To whoever inquired about him. What happened with him? Megan prompted him when he fell silent. Cottrell was hot-tempered. Had outbursts of rage. Couldn't control them. I think he threatened the unit during one of those red mist moments. They probably retaliated. You know the rest. What about his identity? Beth asked, fascinated by the emotionless recital. Dividing zero happened, Kaiser replied baldly. So all along Mayo and Kane have been involved, Megan removed her shades, wiped a speck of dust from the lenses, polished them and donned them again. The sun was hot, beating down on them mercilessly, as if it too wanted to hush up the program. Mayo and Kane. Kaiser looked at her in surprise. Nope. They knew nothing. We worked there, but we were in effect a rogue unit. We took orders from. His head exploded in a spray of blood and tissue. Chapter 39 Megan flung herself at Beth without conscious thought. She rose, pulled her sister upright and they ran. Toward the concrete road. Beyond which woods beckoned. Thick and inviting. Sanctuary. She turned her head once and saw men. Four or five of them. In suits. Carrying weapons. Rounds flew in the air. Thudded in the ground as they ran. Threw up dirt and gravel. No danger you said, Beth screamed. I was wrong, Megan yelled back. Do you have a plan? No. I'm going to die here? Beth shouted, anger overcoming her fear. I'll die with you. You'd better, Beth swore hotly. 
Megan upped her pace, ducked and weaved, ignored the angry whining of bullets in the air. She heard Beth panting behind her, matching her stride for stride. Across the road. Down a small incline which gave them some cover. She took a second to stop and peer back. Five men. Running as hard, giving them chase. One of them spotted the sisters and pointed. The ticket agent. He was one of them. Or warned them. Whoever they are. Megan turned around and ran to the woods, Beth following. Thoughts whirled in her mind. One stood out. If Kaiser was killed, who stood to gain? Gravel turned to grass. The first plants appeared. They became man-sized vegetation. Trees. Thick and close, blocking sunlight. Turning day to dimness. Branches swatted their faces, slowed their response. A stout one slapped her face, and when she pushed it away, all the pieces fell in place. Who else could it be? She turned and twisted, finding trails to go deeper, away from the pursuers. She knew who and why now. Not all the details. They could wait if she and Beth survived. Escape came first. She slowed her breathing. Tried to hear above the beating of her heart. She heard shouting. Pounding in the distance. She paused under the cover of a tree, thicker than the two of them put together. Glanced back. Saw her sister's white face. Scared eyes. Cursed herself. I was overconfident. I should have known it was a trap. Beth straightened when the voices came closer. Took the lead and headed off. There was no particular direction in which they were heading. Away from the gunmen. Deeper. That was all that mattered. Megan followed her. We didn't even bring our handguns. The GPS tags on us probably won't work. Poor signal. She cleared her mind. Zeb had taught them to focus on the now and the immediate in times of combat. Negativity was to be discarded. Beth picked up speed when the woods thinned out, the trees spaced out. Megan followed. Trying to breathe lightly. Trying to keep their jackets from brushing against foliage. Beth stopped suddenly. Megan rammed into her. The two stumbled. She bit back an oath and recovered. Looked angrily at Beth. Why did you stop? The words died in her throat when she saw why. Four men were ranged in front of them. Fifteen feet away. Holding guns. Assault rifles. Confidently, the way experienced shooters did. Their eyes and faces were expressionless. Some of them were in suits, while others were in combat fatigues. She looked behind as the sounds of running came closer. The five pursuers crashed through the woods and halted behind them. Gunmen at the front. Shooters behind. It ends here. Maddie will never be found. You're right, a voice read her mind. Her eyes widened. She didn't expect him to be here. Beth made a small sound. They knew that voice. She schooled her face and marshaled her thoughts. A man stepped forward from the four men. He was dressed in camouflage trousers and a black t-shirt. The handgun in his hand was held loosely. Confidently. He looked at ease and in command. He had looked at ease and in command when they had met him first. Josh Cottrell, the lawyer, smiled at the shock on Beth's face. I am sorry, Ms. Peterson. It does end here. His voice wasn't regretful. His eyes rested on Megan. You don't look surprised. I figured it out. The lawyer looked at two men. They stepped forward and frisked the twins thoroughly. They grabbed their jackets and ripped them from their bodies. Remove your shoes, Cottrell ordered. We know you have sensors in them. Like hell we will, Beth shouted. Another man stepped forward. A knife appeared in his hand. He thrust it at her left shoulder. Where another blade had pierced, previously. Do it, Megan urged, and slipped off her sneakers and threw them at a gunman. He caught them easily, pierced a blade in the heels and removed the GPS tags. 
He crushed them and destroyed the ones in Beth's shoes. We aren't alone, Beth spat. But you are, Cottrell laughed. We have been watching you since New York. We have friends. They will be coming soon. No they won't. His voice was bored. They will come at some point. They will find your bodies. The lawyer's eyes remained on Megan's face. How did you figure it out? Tell him. Anything to buy time. Anything to delay the inevitable. She told him about the interview with Stoll. Ignored his, we should have killed him long back comment and mentioned the disappearances. She took her time, scanning discreetly for any escape routes. There were none. Shooters surrounded them. They were alert, vigilant, not paying attention to Megan's recital. Cottrell's brow creased when she brought up the news article. We should have gone after that server. He shook his head. I thought removing it would be too noticeable. That picture was taken by some whistleblower. He's no trouble now, he concluded in satisfaction. Why? Beth burst out, unable to contain herself any longer. She had her arms crossed across her body protectively, yet her eyes blazed, her face was fierce. Cottrell looked genuinely surprised. Money. Lots of it. Why else? I got the idea when a contractor approached me. They had a problem, employee. They knew I was a good negotiator. I solved that problem. He spoke without prompting, relishing the captive audience he had. The client was happy. Mayo and Kane got a bonus, they were happy. I wasn't. That bonus should have been mine. A four-star general had mentioned dividing zero when he was drunk. I was entertaining him. I did some very discreet digging. Understood the program. Realized I could use it for myself. You stole Stahl's program? Beth asked incredulously. Nope. The software wasn't important. I got other folks to write it. The genius of the program lay in its concept. He grinned expansively. I went freelance. I got access to all the databases. You'll be surprised at how many doors the right sums of money will open. I had access to defense contractors. To generals. I could make their problems go away. Initially, it was just negotiation. Then I amped the pressure. Made one dude disappear. Killed him, really? Word spread around. I got more work. I recruited Kaiser and Cottrell. Cottrell was like heaven's gift to me. A man with the same name as mine? He laughed in amusement, relaxed yet alert. No one else shared his humor. As soon as Kaiser and Cottrell got on board, I made plans for Cottrell. He would be the red herring if anything went wrong. The two of them didn't suspect a thing. They followed my orders and executed them without a question. They thought this was Mayo and Kane work. Cottrell did the background checks on any problem person. Kaiser did the threats. Not physical. Verbal. He has this look. Had. The deep laugh came again. He could have been in a corporate boardroom. Or out on the golf course, schmoozing with clients. I had these guys, he looked at the gunmen, for wet work. I knew enough of them from my black ops days. We had a sweet operation that the law firm didn't know of. No one would suspect me. I was too obvious. People would reckon I couldn't be that stupid. He slapped a palm against his thigh and laughed louder at Megan's expression. You didn't think I was involved, did you? The laughter died out and his face darkened. Then Kaiser and Cottrell grew a conscience. Tokoa man came up. He had to be eliminated. Those two didn't want to go that far. They realized this wasn't law firm work. I could have had them killed, he ran a finger along the barrel of his handgun. It would have been messy though. I put watchers on their families. They got the message. Kaiser retired, but I still had eyes and ears on him. He turned his head in the direction of the station. He gave us the slip today. 
brought his death on himself. He smiled smugly at his justification and carried on. Cottrell followed me to New York and behaved. He didn't have a choice. His home was bugged. His phones were tapped. He and his family had men on them constantly. Then he heard about fights. He hadn't been involved in it, however he felt guilty. Disbelief spread across his handsome face. Guilt didn't belong in his world. He delivered a service, got paid handsomely, that's all that mattered. I tried reasoning with him. He didn't listen. He wanted to go to the cops. I told him his family would die. He sighed. People. If only they would be reasonable. I didn't expect him to kidnap his daughter. That was a curveball. I did the next best thing. I deployed the program on him. He chuckled, a rich warm sound that had soothed and comforted his clients. I almost laughed and gave it away when you folks visited me. That would have been something. You two didn't give up. His tone was almost admiring. Josh Cottrell was erased, several red herrings were in place, and yet you two didn't stop looking. We were searching for his daughter, Beth spoke through gritted teeth. Cottrell shrugged. The daughter didn't matter. His barrel pointed at Megan. You were attacked. That was my doing too. I created that social media storm, hoping someone would act on it. That punk did. That too didn't deter you. You two survived that grab. You got lucky that the cops arrived on time. Something crossed his face and he stepped back. No more hunting for you, ladies, he repeated. He looked up at the green canopy above them. It's a good place to die. Your friends will be taken care of too. He glanced at his watch and made a gesture to his men. A shooter came forward. The gunman at the rear moved to the sides. Beth threw a panic-stricken look at Megan. Megan tried to reassure her with her eyes. What can I say? It'll be painless, Cottrell promised from behind his men. The shooter's gun rose. Megan closed her eyes involuntarily, her body tightened. A shot rang out. Chapter 40 Megan flinched and waited for darkness to carry her. I haven't died before. Don't know how it feels. Wait. I'm Allie. A body crashed into her just as more shots sounded around them. She landed, someone rolled on top of her and rolled off. She was in a thicket, several feet to the side of the clearing. Something moved in her vision. She turned slowly and saw her sister glaring at her. She was ten feet away, taking cover in another bush, her face streaked with soil, leaves stuck in her hair. Is it Zeb? Beth mouthed. Maybe. Don't know. Did you see anyone? No. When this is over. The shadow loomed over Beth without warning. A shooter, his gun lowering, his eyes fixed on the woman beneath. Megan moved without conscious thought. Her hand swept on the ground. Grabbed what little gravel it could. Flung it at the shooter. The shooter spotted the motion. Raised his head. Flinched and ducked. Megan rose. One foot to steady herself. Another to power herself. She flew and came under the rising gun. Slapped it away in a move Zeb had made them practice thousands of times. Her elbow slammed in the shooter's throat. Beth kicked his legs from underneath. The shooter fell. Beth grabbed his gun and the sisters fled. Searching fire came their way. They ducked and moved apart. Megan hid behind a tree trunk while Beth burrowed in another dense shelter. Silence returned to the wood. Megan dropped to the ground and peered around the trunk cautiously. She was farther away from the clearing. Still with a good view of it. She slowed her breathing, let time slow, and took everything in. The shooter who was to execute her lay sprawled on the ground. Another gunman lay behind where they had been standing. No one else was visible. Shot by snipers from the front and the back? She remembered a flurry of shots when Beth had dove into her. 
she didn't see any more bodies. Cottrell's men returning fire at the snipers? She counted the bodies. Ten including Cottrell, now down to seven. She strained her ears. Didn't hear anything. No footsteps. No shots. No bodies moving in brush. She sought out Beth and found her a distance away. Beth sensed her glance. Can't see anything, her lips moved. A bird call sounded in the distance. A shot rang out. Another bird called out. Got an acknowledgement. Beth's pale face broke into a smile. She fist pumped silently. Megan felt a flame of hope surge inside her. Bird calls. Bawana. Roger. She studied the woods, trying to locate the shooters and her friends. A wind blew lazily and branches swayed. A brush rustled and her heart leapt in her throat. It was nothing. She felt the man's presence before he grabbed her by her hair. He dragged her up, his barrel jammed against her back and turned her around. I got one, he murmured in a headset. There was no gloating in his voice or face. He removed a wicked-looking blade and thrust it at her eyes. Where's the other one? Megan couldn't answer. Words stuck in her throat. Her breath came fast. The blade came closer to her right eye. She stared at it, fascinated. I won't ask again. You won't have to, an amused voice whispered. The earth seemed to part, and from it rose a tall, dark figure. The gunman whirled. The figure moved fast, so fast that Megan couldn't comprehend. The gunman's breath seemed to leave him. He slumped against the figure for a second. Fell to the ground. The dark man looked down, his face iron and granite, his eyes cold and merciless. They were smiling when he raised his head and looked at Megan. Bawana. Cottrell turned and ran the moment his gunman was shot. Straight into the depths of the woods, following a dim trail that only he knew. How whirled through his mind several times. He discarded it and quickened his run when he heard shooting behind him. At the end of the dim trail was a getaway vehicle that only he knew of. The rest of his men had concealed their rides near the station. A private aircraft was waiting for him at the airport. He had stashes of cash all over the world. Apartments. He would use dividing zero on himself. He had planned for every outcome. For this one too. He lengthened his stride, confidence filling him. His step faltered. Was there someone behind that brush ahead? No. Just the wind. He passed it and a shadow moved. There was someone. A brown-haired man stepped into view. Lean. Dressed in black. Standing casually. Dark eyes watching him. Cottrell didn't stop his motion. He changed direction. Headed to the man who was less than ten feet away. Always attack. His Sig Sauer rose to shoulder level. His finger rested on the trigger. It started depressing. The man reacted instantaneously, he leapt at Cottrell, coming under the gun hand and slapped it away. The shot went wide. His gun went flying. The man's fingers tried to grasp Cottrell's hand. Before he could apply a hold, Cottrell's left arm flashed, and his Glauca blade pierced towards the man's middle. Always deceive. The man seemed to roll backwards. The knife cut air an inch away from his body. The man caught Cottrell's knife hand in an iron grip. His other hand descended to the lawyer's shoulder. He pivoted and threw the lawyer away. Cottrell flew through the air. He twisted his body, absorbed the impact and rose to his feet easily. His gun lay a few feet away. His Glauca was still in his hand. The man stood in front of him, breathing easily, regarding him curiously. He's faster than I thought he would be. Cottrell attacked, coming low like a cobra strike, the blade ready for offense or defense. The man waited till the last moment, leaned back in a deceptively lazy move and let the knife go past him. The man evaded Cottrell's upthrust knee 
and for a fraction of a second the lawyer was off balance. An elbow slammed into Cottrell's ribs and his breath whooshed out. The man applied a hold and threw Cottrell again, this time over his shoulder. Cottrell landed, rolled, and got up smoothly. His knife lay at his feet. Before he could retrieve it, the man went on the attack. A blow went to Cottrell's throat. He ducked and counterpunched. The man rolled with it. Cottrell followed up with an eye gouge. His fingers slipped on the man's face. Shots sounded in the distance. The man faltered for a moment. Cottrell head butted him. Hard. Split the man's forehead and smiled in triumph when blood flowed down the man's face. The smile disappeared when his neck was grabbed and a hammer blow struck his ribs. Broke one. Another blow. Broke another rib. He groaned deep and punched furiously and broke away. The man let him go. Cottrell fell gasping. A deep rage flooded him. He was a type A, an alpha male. Some random dude wasn't going to beat him. The gun caught his attention. He dove at it. Got a hand on it. Its grip filled his palm. He turned. The man was nearly on him. He curled his finger. Started raising the gun. No need to aim. He's close. The man closed in, moving so fast he seemed to blur. Too close to fire. Another hammer struck him in the ribs. The blow spread fire through him, sucking away his oxygen. Something happened to his wrists. They became liquid. He heard a scream. It was his. The dark eyes bore down on him. The six barrel turned sideways. Not sideways. Pointing at me. His breath caught. He tried to engage his mind. A thought came foremost to his mind. Who are you? Words were an effort. Pain seared his body with white heat. He knew his wrists were broken. As were his elbows. Time stood still. Life stood still. The wood strained to hear. The man whose friends you harmed, came the reply. Cottrell thought he saw flame lance through the boar and shoot towards him. Then he saw nothing felt nothing. Chapter 41 The cleanup took an hour and when it was finished, four shooters remained alive. Bawana and Roger cuffed and gagged them. The twins collected their weapons and dumped them in the clearing. Megan knew Beth was smoldering and kept her distance. Her sister's face was red, her eyes narrow in rage. When the last of the men had been secured, Beth raised her head. You didn't think of telling me? She took a long stride and confronted her, anger and the remains of fear exploding out of her in a burst. A snicker. Beth whirled round and saw Bawana and Roger's studiously neutral expressions. You too. You didn't think of warning me, either? Her eyes flashed and looked in the depths of the woods. Where's Bear? Chloe? There was a thud in the distance and shadows moved. One of them resolved into a tall man, a thick beard covering his face. He raised his hands defensively when Beth charged at him. Not my idea. I was just following orders. Me too, a petite woman stepped into view. Chloe. Whose orders? Beth snarled. Yours, I am sure, she whirled back on her sister. Babe? Sis. Beth. Megan raised her voice above Beth's tirade. Beth stopped. You wear your heart on your sleeve. Your face would have revealed we had backup. We knew a lot, but we needed a confession from someone. This was the only way. The red mist left Beth. Cool air cleared her mind. She started figuring things out. You planned all this? Geez no. Coming close to dying wasn't in the plan. I figured Kaiser would confess or reveal Mr. M, she shrugged and waved her hands. I didn't expect all this. Beth started trembling as shock set in. She blinked back tears and donned her jacket. She zipped it up, taking her time to get herself under control. If Cottrell knew what a pain in the neck you are, he would have shot you outright, she wiped her eyes and looked at her friends. 
Where's Zeb? Zeb came through from the depths of the woods, moving languidly toward them. Catrell. Won't trouble us. You cut it fine, didn't you? Beth smiled to take the sting out of her words. Zeb didn't reply. He exchanged a glance with Bawana. They had given the watchers in New York the slip. Had chartered a flight and come to Courtville before the rendezvous. They had taken positions and had watched the twins meet Kaiser. If we had arrived earlier, we would have spotted Kaiser and his crew. We would have checked out the surroundings. We lost time following them in the woods. Any longer, and... He tossed a miniature recorder to Beth. Everything's in there. Cottrell's voice is loud and clear. Sirens wailed in the distance, signaling the arrival of the law enforcement machinery. The local police scratched their heads and looked bemusedly at the bodies. The sheriff drove up along with his deputies. An hour later the state police turned up. Statements were given. The ticket agent was interviewed. He said he was to call a number when a pair of women turned up. The caller had said the women were his nieces and wanted to make sure they had arrived at the station safely. It was thin, but the ticket agent was, at best, guilty of stupidity. Calls were made to the NYPD. Chong verified the twins' identity. The sheriff probed Zeb and his friends. They were carrying an arsenal and had waged a war. Defending ourselves, Zeb protested mildly. He knew how this would play. The call came two hours later. First to the sheriff, then to the police chief, and finally to the senior most state police officer. Chong and Pazaka had pulled a few strings. Claire had yanked a rope. The cop straightened, listened, looked a few times at Zeb and hung up. The state police disappeared, as did the sheriff. The police chief hung around till the bodies were taken away. The system would kick in, but no identities would be revealed. The cover story was that a meth gang had been busted in a violent showdown. You look like a gangbanger in any case, Roger drawled at Bawana. Three hours later, Megan looked at her watch in surprise. It was just 4 p.m. They had met Kaiser at 11. It felt like they had been in the woods for the entire day. They shook hands with the police chief who was glad to see them leave and didn't hide it. They climbed into their rides in their usual formation. Megan with Zeb at the front of one vehicle. Beth in the rear with Bear and Chloe. Bawana and Roger in another set of wheels. Southern Illinois Airport initially, and then New York. Home. Maddie is still out there. So is Josh Cottrell, Beth spoke softly above the hum of tires. Megan turned to face her. I was wondering when you would mention that. I know how to contact them. 7 p.m. New York. Still on the 20th day. The city was unchanged. Snarls of fumes. Traffic like thick fat snakes. People in a hurry. High rises lit up, reflecting the approaching sunset. It was their city. Bear stretch. Chloe snuggled into him. Zeb was impassive as his eyes flicked between the front and the rear mirror. Bawana and Roger were following. It took 40 minutes to reach Amy Cottrell's home. 40 minutes, during which Megan didn't disclose how she would make contact. Beth rushed out before they came to a stop and rang the bell. Darian Kyle opened the door as immaculate as ever, the same smug expression on his face. He opened his mouth. Beth darted around him and went to the lounge. Amy Cottrell looked at her face, saw something in it, and rose. Megan arrived. Her face was shining too. Ma'am, it's over. Megan saw the dawning light in her eyes and nodded vigorously. The lawyer is dead. The cops know what went down, she spoke loudly in the room even though it was quiet. Maddie and your husband are safe. They can return. The mom collapsed back, her eyes bright with tears that spilled and rolled down her face. She moved her lips. No sound came out of her mouth. Beth went to her and clasped her hands. It's true. Your nightmare is finished. 
Something the lawyer said stuck with me, Megan explained when they were back in their ride, heading to Columbus Avenue. He had Cottrell and Kaiser's phones tapped. Get to it, Beth cut in impatiently. You remember, we never figured out how the father got our cell details to send us those messages, Megan reminded her. Beth snapped her fingers when she made the connection. He bugged his own home. He heard us when we gave Amy Cottrell our numbers. Aren't you good? A bit slow on the uptake though, Megan sniggered. Beth's phone rang as she was preparing for bed. An excited yell came through and brought a smile to her face. Maddie Cottrell had returned. Chapter 42 Two weeks later The watchers in New York were arrested and interrogated. They didn't have much to reveal. They were local thugs, paid to follow the twins and the men, and to relay reports to a cell phone. The job had been arranged by a middleman. The dead lawyer's gloating confession was listened to in one PP and in Washington, D.C. His movements, his backstory, his entire life was examined minutely by the cops. A set of offshore accounts was finally discovered, buried deep under a maze of shell companies. In a deposit box in the Bahamas, a ledger was found. The ledger was the lawyer's insurance policy. It would bring down everyone who had used his services. Events moved swiftly. Discreetly. Several senior officers, in some of the largest defense contractors in the country, were quietly arrested. A raft of charges was filed against each one of them. Prosecutors were rubbing their hands in glee over a slam dunk case. Defense lawyers were dreaming of the fat fees they would charge their clients. Dividing zero was never mentioned. Claire said there were heated discussions in the White House about its disclosure. The program had come into existence several administrations back. However, trust in government was at an all-time low. That little trust couldn't be risked by another shocking revelation of government misdeeds. The program would never be mentioned. There was fallout, however. General Klaus was tasked with coming up with a set of recommendations to make the defense industry more accountable. A four-star general in the Pentagon took his own life. His death received widespread coverage and on hearing some of his past interviews, Zeb stilled. I know that voice. I met him. The families of the Tacoa and Connorsville men were given generous compensation. Billy Bob Fights was never found. He didn't have a family to compensate. Several other names in Cottrell's ledger were identified and their families received settlements. Federal and state databases were quietly cleaned up. Several backdoor entry programs were discovered. It wasn't just dividing zero or Cottrell's software that had access to them. Those discoveries spawned a new set of investigations that would ultimately bring down several criminal gangs. Several Pentagon generals appeared on TV and exhorted whistleblowers to come forward. Mayo and Kane collapsed. Spectacularly. The law firm was investigated, and, even though all signs pointed to Cottrell being a rogue operator, its clients deserted it. Other law firms expressed shock and outrage in public. In private, their partners fist pumped in joy and courted Mayo and Kane's deserting clients. Josh Cottrell, the husband, cooperated fully. Pazaka and Chong and a couple of other cops interviewed him at his home the day after he returned. Beth and Megan were in attendance. Cottrell threatened me. With Amy and Maddie's life. He said we were watched continually. If we made any attempt to contact the police or anyone else, he shuddered and hugged Maddie tighter. Every word we spoke was listened to. Every so often, the lawyer mentioned something we had discussed at the dinner table. He knew which dress Amy wore. The color of Maddie's socks. Making Maddie believe I was hitting Amy, hoping she would tell someone. Maybe her teachers, or anyone else. That was the only plan we came up with. He laughed shortly, with no humor in it. It was a long shot, but then I didn't have a lot of options. We couldn't reach out to anyone. He paused when one cop returned from the depths of the house. He opened his palm. 
In it were several listening devices. Miniature cameras, too. The husband had cached bundles of cash and fake identity documents in different locations in the city. As a just-in-case. I didn't have a plan. He had heard about fights two days before grabbing Maddie. A furious exchange with the lawyer had resulted in more threats. This time directed at Maddie. The day of the grab, he had gone in early to the office and heard a voice. The lawyers. He was relaying instructions on his phone, unaware that he wasn't alone. Get the girl today. Then the wife. Grab the man when he leaves the office. I didn't know Maddie had reached out to you that very day. I didn't have any other choice, Cottrell ran his fingers through Maddie's short hair. I couldn't tell Amy anything. I hoped she would understand. I didn't, the mother cut in with a shiver. I wasn't expecting him to disappear. Then you folks said he wasn't who he was. My world crumbled. I couldn't tell you anything, she apologized to Beth. I didn't know what was going on. No way to contact him. If I revealed something, it could endanger him and Maddie. She took the paper towel Beth handed and wiped her eyes. I haven't stopped crying. At least this time they are happy tears, she smiled wryly. Cottrell deployed the program on me, the husband continued. I didn't expect that. The only choice I had was to contact you. Send you clues. Hope that you picked up on them. Pazaka's jaw jutted forward. Ishades glared at the husband. You could have contacted us. No sir, I couldn't. My wife would have been next. Her collapsing and going to hospital probably saved her life. In the two weeks that followed, Amy Cottrell made a speedy recovery and resumed her work with Carrie Landsman. Her husband was still at home, still piecing together his identity. Darian Kyle offered to file a lawsuit on behalf of the family against anyone and everyone. Lawyers didn't discriminate besides, there was ample cause. Amy Cottrell brushed his offer away. Maddie was a star in her school. She had stories to tell. Adventures to share. The school gave her an award for bravery. She went with Peaches and Lizzie, grammar in tow, to Beth and Megan's office one day. She showed them the certificate. Gulped down the cookies Beth brought out. Played for hours. She crooked her little finger as they were leaving and planted a kiss on Megan's cheek and then Beth's. Thank you. A wondrous smile followed and set the world right. Megan stretched and sipped her second cup of coffee. Beth and she were in their favorite hangout, the coffee shop, a block away from their office. General Klaus had asked them to make a report of their investigation. That report was now mandatory reading material for several generals. A copy of it was with the NYPD. There was a lull in agency missions. A downtime that Beth made full use of by spending her evenings with Mark. Beth was haranguing Megan, urging her to date, when Megan's phone rang. She picked it up, looked at the number and frowned. It was an international one. She accepted the call just as the ringing stopped. She shrugged. You recognize the number? Beth didn't. Megan rose, went to the counter and got a couple of pastries for them. She quickened her steps when Beth waved at her. Her phone was ringing again. Hello, she answered breathlessly and turned on the speaker. The line crackled. A female voice came on. Hello, Peltier. Words got swallowed in static. Beth's eyes widened. Julie Peltier, she whispered. The neighbor from Babish. Megan nodded and shushed her. Your message couldn't earlier hear me? Yes, ma'am. The line is bad. Poor signal, deep country, Peltier cut Megan off. Amy in New York, no contact. Beth started to interject. Julie Peltier's call was unnecessary. Megan stopped her again. Sad poor woman. Maddie Hope he improved deserves happy. Could you repeat that, ma'am? Beth couldn't hold back any longer. There was no reply. The call had ended. 
She dialed the number back. The call didn't connect. An automated voice said the cell was out of range. She sent a text message, knowing it was futile. Julie Peltier hadn't replied to their previous messages. She didn't seem to believe in SMS messaging. That was weird. Made no sense. She didn't get a reply. She looked up at her sister. Megan had a distant expression on her face. Beth knew that expression well. What is it? Megan rose as if dazed. Follow me. Chapter 43 Megan moved without conscious thought, she snatched her bag from their table, the car keys and walked out, nearly bumping into several customers. She heard hisses of annoyance and ignored them. She heard Beth's insistent questions, she ignored those too. She drove without conscious thought, traffic miraculously bending and twisting around their ride. As she neared their destination, she made one call. Beth gasped when the caller acknowledged Megan's question. Megan hung up, ignored her sister's shocked expression, and dialed another number. This call took longer, it too confirmed her query. She reached their destination, parked and walked up the small drive, Beth close behind her. She took a couple of deep breaths to clear the fog from her mind. Sound returned. The city returned. Life resumed. She looked at Beth, her face was pale, her eyes wide. Megan knew she herself wore a similar expression. We were so wrong. She composed herself and rang the bell. Amy Cottrell opened the door and smiled widely when she saw them. She ushered them in and led them to the cozy dining room. Maddie's pictures were on the wall, as were a few family portraits. You are right in time for coffee, the mother gestured at a couple of chairs and called out for her daughter. She poured with her left hand, pushed forward the cup to Beth and poured another one to Megan. What happened to your right hand? She bit her tongue the moment the words escaped her. Way to go, Megan. You couldn't sound any more accusatory, could you? Softball, Josh Cottrell answered as he entered the room, placed a baseball bat on the table, kissed his wife and seated himself. They heard scampering feet and Maddie burst in, uttering a yell of delight. She hugged Beth, then Megan grabbed a cookie and disappeared. I didn't know you played, Megan looked at the mother. She didn't, Cottrell laughed before his wife could reply. She does now. Maddie threw a wicked one, and it struck her right shoulder. She has a strong arm, the mother said lightly. She nearly knocked my head off once. You never defended him, Megan said suddenly, when the small talk had dried out. You did when Maddie was present, but not when you were alone. Amy Cottrell's eyes flashed to Megan's face and fell away in the silence that followed. Josh Cottrell looked puzzled, switching his gaze from Megan to his wife. What? What are you talking about? Honey, you know what she's saying? Your wife didn't defend you, Mr. Cottrell, when we asked her about your beating. Megan answered him and watched a dull flush appear on his face. Where are you going with this? Megan didn't respond to him. She half turned to have the mother fully in her vision. In all the explanations, a couple of points bothered me. The mother looked up and waited expectantly. Josh Cottrell leaned forward. Your husband made plans. He stashed money, identities. He grabbed Maddie as soon as she left our building. Why didn't he take you? The mother's face whitened as she sucked in her breath sharply. Her hands started trembling. She hid them under the table when she felt the twins' eyes on them. Megan turned her head at a sound, a chair scraping. Josh Cottrell stood, his face tight in anger. You should leave. You two have helped us, for which we are grateful. But you should go now. Beth didn't rise, taking her cue from her sister. Megan leaned back in her chair, utterly relaxed. Utterly ready. Why didn't you take your wife? She challenged him. Sure, your phones were bugged. You had followers. However, you gave them the slip that day. You could have called your wife from a payphone. Arranged an escape. A muscle started to tick on the husband's temple. The red flush on his face became darker. Why didn't Cottrell make a move against your wife? 
He could have grabbed her and forced you into surrendering. We all thought your wife was surrounded by cops. Surrounded by people. That's why he got no opportunity. But that's not the reason, is it? What are you accusing me of? The husband shouted, his eyes dark and narrow. Maddie came running when she heard his raised voice and looked inquisitively at them. She turned away slowly and disappeared, an uncertain look on her face when her mom smiled at her and gestured, It's okay, honey. Did you check out Darian Kyle, the lawyer? Megan ignored the husband's outburst. He specializes in divorce. Especially divorce that arises from domestic abuse. Your wife was readying for a separation. Josh Cottrell's head whipped round to look at his wife accusingly. Her head remained bowed. You remember Julie Peltier, Mr. Cottrell? Megan didn't let up. Your neighbor from Babish? We tried contacting her, she returned our call, finally today. Cottrell's nostrils flared and he breathed angrily. His finger pointed at Megan. You? She hoped you had improved. Megan talked over him. She said your wife deserved to be happy. That's enough. Get out of my. Megan didn't heed him. She looked at him directly and continued remorselessly. Your plan was brilliant. Making Maddie believe you were hitting your wife. Explaining it away to the cops in the aftermath. She leaned forward, aiming her words at him, as if she could see their impact on his body. You fooled us. The truth is, you were hitting your wife. All along. You were abusing her. She waited for him to respond. He didn't. He stood there, a picture of rage, his harsh breathing filling the room. The lawyer didn't move on your wife because he knew you didn't care for her. He had bugged the house, he knew you were hitting your wife. The husband made an inarticulate sound, Megan cut it off with an imperious hand. Don't bother denying it. Julie Peltier is a witness. The NYPD can find recordings from the bugs if they look hard enough. They will. Megan looked once in Amy's direction, who still hadn't raised her head. You controlled her. She didn't leave you because of Maddie. Maybe she feared for her life. For Maddie's life, too. She paused and when she spoke her voice was low and soft, but her words were diamond hard. You are a wife-beater, Mr. Cottrell. Josh Cottrell exploded with a roar of rage. He grabbed the bat and pushed his chair back. It toppled. Bitch. He yelled at his wife. I shouldn't have returned. He took a step towards her and swung the bat in a wide arc. Maddie ran in on hearing the commotion. Maddie. Amy Cottrell shrieked. No, Beth yelled in dove. She grabbed Maddie and took her out of the room. The bat descended. Amy Cottrell flinched. Megan hurled herself over the table across it and came between the bat and the mother. The bat landed on her right shoulder like a sledgehammer. She screamed in agony and crashed back into Amy. They fell to the floor, Megan on top of her. Cottrell advanced, the bat rising over his head. Evade, thought Megan dimly, trying to think over the burning in her shoulder. The bat started falling. No room. She curled tight and braced herself for the blow. It never came. Beth attacked Cottrell from behind with a feral cry. She pounced on his back and grabbed his bat. Cottrell stumbled. Lost the weapon. He whirled and yanked Beth by her hair and backhanded her. She crashed into a wall. That's my sister. Megan saw Beth's head slam against the wall as she slid down to the floor. Rage flooded her. Brought her to her feet. She grabbed Cottrell by a shoulder and swung him around. Later, much later, Beth would say she was snarling. Megan wasn't conscious of that. She had eyes only for Cottrell's red face. Her right fist sank into his belly. A cry escaped her when fire radiated from her shoulder and spread through her body. Ignore. Compartmentalize. Her left fist curled and its fleshy base hammered the husband's chin. More effective than Knuckles, Zeb had coached them. 
Cottrell flailed out wildly. She ducked under his arms and brought her knee up. He doubled over with a grunt of pain. She floored him with an elbow to his back, twisted his right hand behind him, and held him immobile with a knee on top of him. Josh Cottrell, she panted. This is a citizen's arrest. Eight months later. It was a glorious autumn day in New York when Beth came into the office and found Megan standing against the picture windows, staring out from their private bubble. Leaves littered the sidewalk and turned burnished copper and gold as they caught rays of sunshine. She joined her sister and studied her profile. Her green eyes were unblinking and were lost in thought. Beth knew what her Megan was thinking. The Cottrell case was behind them. In the months that followed, a couple of agency missions had cropped up. Both of them had been successfully concluded, and yet Megan hadn't stopped thinking of Amy and Josh Cottrell. Josh Cottrell had confessed to domestic abuse and was serving a two-year sentence, a term that Darian Kyle had skillfully negotiated. Maddie had taken the breakup surprisingly well, perhaps she knew it was coming. She spent a lot of time at Grandma's home with her besties, and their love helped her tide the separation. Amy Cottrell took longer to bounce back. Her self-esteem, her confidence had taken a battering, but they returned. The whirlwind that was Carrie Landsman stepped in, took charge, and helped Amy get her bearings back. Megan likes everything to be neat and tidy. She sees the world in black and white, Beth thought. Cottrell brought down dividing zero, despite the personal danger to himself and his family. He was also a wife-beater. She can't reconcile the two sides of him. People aren't black and white. They're all shades in between. Megan finds that hard to accept sometimes. Hey, she called out. Megan didn't respond. Sis. Megan. The green eyes, so similar to her own, turned to regard her. A small smile appeared on Megan's face. Maddie is happy, remember? Beth told her softly. It all started because of her. Her mom is in a much better place now. Megan nodded after a long while, and her smile became a sunburst. It was afternoon when Maddie marched into their office, Lizzie, Peaches, and Grandma in tow. She was holding another girl's hand, a dark-haired, doe-eyed, slim girl who seemed to be the same age as Lizzie. She dragged the girl past a couch on which a brown-haired man was lounging. He rose at their approach and kept an impassive face when Maddie's loud whisper filled the office. He's their driver. Ignore him. Maddie introduced the girl to the twins. Percy, my bestie, she declared, and then looked at Lizzie and Peaches and giggled. One of my besties. Percy? Beth arched an eyebrow. Persephone Minter, ma'am, the girl replied shyly. Maddie nudged her in the ribs when Percy fell silent. Tell them. The doe eyes turned dark when she looked at the twins. My sister is missing. The end. Bonus chapter from Defending Kane, the next book in the series. The blade slipped between Kane's third and fourth rib. Effortlessly, like a knife cutting through butter. It punctured his heart and slid out again. The piercing took just a few seconds. So smooth so fast that Kane didn't know he had been knifed. By the time his body told him, the assailant was gone. All Kane saw was a departing back that got swallowed in the crowd. He knew calling out was futile. He knew he was dying. Kane looked down at himself. Blood was turning his black shirt wet and sticky. They got me, finally. His breath was coming short. His knees were starting to buckle. His pulse was racing. No. I can't die like this. I have to meet her. She was standing at the other end of the crosswalk, waiting for the signal to change. She was blissfully oblivious of Kane dying. She didn't even know he was there. No one knew. No one had yet spotted the blood on his clothing, his faltering steps. He took a step forward. His knees collapsed. Blood emerged from his mouth. Noise started to fade. Just as his vision started to blur, the signal changed and she started forward. Towards him. He reached out with his arms. 
He had set out from his hideout early in the morning. He knew they would be looking for him. Everyone would be, not just them. He was lucky he had one of those unrecognizable faces. You saw it, you didn't remember it. Dark eyes. Dark hair. Healthy tan. No conspicuous hair styling. Ordinary body. He dressed in black. His usual uniform when he was at his job. The job that he loved. He emerged from the depths of Building 26. Made his way through the ruins, skirted discarded furniture and pigeon droppings, and blinked in the sudden sunlight. He turned back and looked at the building when he was away from it. Maybe it would be his last glance. Building 26 was part of an abandoned asylum in Queens Village, New York City. It had once, almost a hundred years back, treated the mentally ill. The asylum had been deeded to the city by a descendant of one of the country's robber barons. In its heyday, it had witnessed hundreds of patients being treated. Changes occurred during the 20th century. Medicines improved. Attitudes toward asylums changed. Budgets were slashed. The descendants of the descendant mounted a legal challenge to claim back the land. A legal battle that moved very slowly. The result was ruins. In the busiest city in the world, amidst the bustle of the fastest-moving metropolis, stood the abandoned asylum. No human lived in it. No person ventured in it. Pigeons nested in it. Rats ruled it. Kane discovered it when he was searching for a home for his hobby. He had stumbled on the building quite accidentally. One moment he was in the Queen's village, exploring the next, it was as if he was in a war zone. Building 26 became his abode. It was there that he practiced his hobby. No one saw him. No one heard him. The pigeons swallowed any sounds from the building. It was perfect. It was during one of his experiments that he came to know of the conspiracy. She babbled initially, like the others. Cain paid no attention. It was when he saw the desperation in her eyes that he paid attention and listened. What he heard turned him cold. Cain didn't know fear. It wasn't an emotion he had ever experienced. However, what he felt on hearing her came close to it. He questioned her. She was incoherent. Dying did that to a person. He leaned over her and shouted. With her last breath, she answered him. Cain left the asylum early the next day, when dark hadn't turned to dawn. He went to Manhattan and lounged in doorways till the city stirred. He kept his face lowered always, knowing he was hunted. He went to an internet cafe, paid in cash, and researched briefly. He left when he got a name and an address. He went to Columbus Avenue, and there he waited at the crosswalk. For her. The revolving door on the glass-fronted building turned at 11 a.m., and she emerged. Kane hesitated for a moment. He knew there were two of them. Yes, it was her. He stepped forward, joined the crossing throng. It was then that the knife slid into him. Megan Peterson saw the man falling on the other side of the crosswalk. She heard screaming. She hurried over, pushed through the crowd and knelt beside the man. She had paramedical training. She could help. His shirt was wet with blood. His breath was labored. Blood pooled in the corners of his mouth. She took in everything in a swift glance. Carefully eased open his shirt. He's dying. Too late to be saved. I've called 911, someone shouted. The man's eyes seemed to recognize her. A scrabbling hand caught her wrist. I didn't, the man squeezed out the words. Megan's breath caught when she saw his hand held a photograph. The planet stopped rotating when she recognized the face on it. It was Percy Minter's sister. The End about the author. Ty has lived on a couple of continents and has been a trench digger, loose tea vendor, leather goods salesman, marine lubricant salesman, diesel engine mechanic, and is now an action thriller author. 
Ty is privileged that readers of crime suspense and action thrillers have loved his books. Intense, riveting, and gripping have been commonly used in reviews. Ty lives with his wife and son, who humor his ridiculous belief that he's in charge. www.typatterson.com Facebook Twitter